kindly switch off your mobile phones or keep it in silent mode. Kindly ask, take your seats. If anybody is on your way, your friends or your colleagues, kindly inform them that the session is beginning. So good morning all to you all present here today. On behalf of the Loyola College management and organizers, I warmly welcome you all to the second day of the International Conference on Emerging Trends in Insect Science 2022. So let's begin this session with a silent prayer. Thank you. Please be seated. So in this session today, there will be four talks by invited speakers. And the first talk for this day is by Dr. N. Geeta, Principal Scientist, ICAR Sugarcane Breeding Institute, Coimbatore, India. I now invite Reverend Dr. S. Maria Pakyam to invite the speaker, introduce the speaker. Respected Dr. Janathanan, the organizer, and Dr. Geeta, the invited persons, and the emeritus scientist, scientists, and dear participants. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. So we have a, a participants in offline as well as online. There is also live telecast is going on. So I hope all these sessions are very much being benefited by all of us. If all of us are inspired to take care of the insect world, it will be very good. So here I'm here to introduce Dr. N. Gida, the principal scientist, and she's going to present a paper on a road map, a map of a pest management in sugarcane with a special reference to trigogramma. And she's here, she has published uh, 33 research papers in various national and international journals and 24 uh, conference proceedings and authorized five books and book chapters. So we are very happy when I went through her bio data. She has received awards from the UG undergraduate as well as postgraduate and PhD programs, various awards and recognitions and outstanding performances. For example, uh, Javarugla Nehru Award for Outstanding Best, Outstanding Postgraduate and Agriculture Research in Agriculture Entomology from Indian Council of Agriculture Research. And she has also received several other memorial medal for best thesis in agriculture entomology, as well as a national merit scholarship from government of Tamil Nadu and a junior research fellowship from uh, ASPEE Research Foundation and ICR, senior research fellowship from CSCR, young scientist fellowship from Tamil Nadu State Council for Science and Technology, and postdoctoral fellowship from the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. There are several other awards and rewards for her outstanding. Let's give her thunder of applause. And we have a right person with us. So on behalf of the organizer, Dr. S. Siddhanandam, the director of Sun Agro Biotech, as well as Dr. S. Janathanan, the head and professor, Advanced Zoology and Biotechnology, and the Entomology Academy of India, and the Entomology Research Institute, Loyola College. I welcome you, ma'am, for your presentation. Welcome. Good morning, all. Thank you the, the sweetest words to begin a day, begin a talk. I'm a biocontrol worker. How many of you know what biocontrol is? Everyone knows or no one knows? Okay. A cat eating a rat is biocontrol. If it does it on its own, it's natural control. And if we get a cat to control the rat, it is biological control. That's all. So I would like to talk about biological control in sugarcane. 
of course, I don't have to ask how many of you know about sugarcane. But how many of you know about the pests occurring on sugarcane? While eating a piece of uh, sugarcane, have you encountered any pests? Some of you might have seen something orangish, brownish, reddish. But usually you don't find a pest. That is because it is an ecologically self-engineered crop. It balances on its own. And there are certain qualities of the sugarcane ecosystem that maintains a very good balance of pests, which does not require much of man's intervention. But man is a monkey. He doesn't let anything be. So what happens? The manipulation begins. It started with all uh, crops and uh, it has not ended with sugarcane. Because of continuous manipulation, we are in an ecological paradox now, where even sugarcane needs to be managed. So, trichogramma is the crux of the topic, uh, topic that I am going to deliver today. Trichogramma is a parasitoid. What is a parasitoid? What I talked about is the cat eating rat is a predator. So, what is a parasitoid? It, oh, a predator also kills. Even at the end of the talk, I might kill you. Ah, that is one thing. Very good. Whole life cycle not partial, whole life cycle, then, yes, it doesn't let the host die before it completes its life cycle. On the contrary, for a predator, it will immediately kill the prey and it might feed on many preys before it completes its life cycle. So, parasitoid is just your head loss. It eats your uh, blood and other uh, sebum, but it doesn't immediately kill you. But if you have a full-blown infestation, you will end up dying. So, trichogramma is a parasitoid on sugarcane borers. What are the borers? They are the pests or the insects that bore the stem of the plant. The next one. How many insects are there on sugarcane? 1500 and it keeps growing because the host range gets expanded naturally. This is the record by Box in 1953 and several decades have passed after that. At least 2, 220 species have been recorded on sugarcane in India, though all of them are not pests. The insects which occur have to cross a certain level to become pests. And uh, in uh, the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent, there are regular pests of around only 50 species. And borers are the major pests because they have high impact on two important economic qualities. One, the cane yield. That means how much, how many kgs of cane is produced per acre. The second is the quality, how much of sugar that can be produced. Both are impacted directly by the borers. And uh, about the biological control, we have vast array of biocontrol agents, at least uh, rel relatively a very large uh, bi biocontrol agents are found in sugarcane then on the other uh, cross because of the perennial ecosystem closer to 1000 are found the next slide please so these are the i have called out at least 25 species. we can rush through this it is only for information or for future recording there are at least 25 popular sugarcane brewers across the world and uh, they uh, the extent the various names they are known by and the region they occur and who had recorded it and whether they are uh, having sugarcane as a main host or are there some alternative hosts. Very strangely, most of the pests or the borers that occur on sugarcane are either oligophagus or monophagus of which sugarcane is the major uh, host. The next one. There are three or four slides. The next one. The next one, the next one. Okay, uh, you can find that there is a very narrow group of borers found on sugarcane, mainly chylo species or the dietaria species. Very few pyralids are also found. Majorly, it is belonging to crambits and noctobits. So, whatever is controlling one pest in the area, the biocontrol agents will definitely attack the same pest in another area though will be hugely affected by the ecological zoning. That is a major factor that we have to remember. 
Why biocontrol is very important in sugarcane? There are three elements just like in any other crop. There is an interaction between pest, plant and the grower in which sugarcane largely differs from other crops. In case of the pests, they are, and they will have a um, detailed uh, slide next. In this, I would like to talk about only the grower. Unlike any other farmer, the sugarcane farmer is a laid back person. You, yes, I don't know how many of you would have been born during the era of uh, an advertisement, hero bike. You fill it, forget it. Regarding the capacity of the hero bike, the tank capacity, they would say, fill the bike and then go on. The bike economy, by, and the petrol economy is such that it will go on. Similarly, sugarcane is a crop. How many ever pests are there, still you will get some kind of yield at the end of it. The long duration of the crop and the wide dense canopy does not allow the farmer to become agitated. What you don't know, you are never worried or afraid of. So he is a very laid back person and uh, it's called as an insurance crop because at the end of 11 or 12 months, the being supported by the factory, you will get some money. You don't have to continuously care for the crop, especially in the area like in northern zones like UP and Bihar, all they do is just plant and forget it and come back only for the harvesting. Slowly, but the situation is uh, changing because of the changing varietal menu and the cane pricing. At last, uh, in 2022 budget, we could find that the FRP is uh, 2,900 uh, per uh, ton and uh, Tamil Nadu government gives another supporting price of 195 per ton. That is way more than 3,000. So the grower is a kind of a laid back lackadaisical person who does not immediately get agitated about a and goes for a convenient for a pest manager. The next one, the plant. How many of you have seen sugarcane plantation? Fair number. Would you like to enter a crop readily? Say about six months old crop. Why not? It is so dense and uh, the leaves are laden with silica and then the spines would hurt your skin the moment you enter. And that also gives a kind of a haven for the pest to breed inside. The, the important pests are the borers which are internal, not visible to the eye. And then the damage is also further hidden because of the dense growth. And the manager cannot enter into, manager is a farmer here. He cannot enter and then see how much is the impact. And by the time the impact is done, the crop compensates itself by putting another internode. And there is at least about 36 to 38 internodes in the crop out of which one or two internodes are being affected or uh, yes, a little bit of root being affected is not going to be a big thing. When an E. coli, when the temperature, water condition, nutrition changes, the whole scenario is different. So here we can see the tall crop, the dense canopy and the persistent dry leaf and the spines and an absence of fruiting body. In other crops, there is a fruiting body, the grains. So if the uh, vegetative growth is affected, it will immediately reflect on the fruiting body and then the farmer is pushed for a control. Here it doesn't happen that way. And the third uh, aspect is that because of the long duration, the crop is able to repair itself. And then by nature, it is tolerant to pests. The third one is there are two produce. One is the yield and another is the quality. The farmer is bothered only about the yield. So even if the quality is not, uh, even if the quality is affected, he isn't bothered. The next one. So regarding the pests, there are only, though 220 pests are recorded, only few pests are uh, available in a particular zone. The chylo infuscatalis, the shoot borer, which comes during the early stage of the crop, occurs throughout the country, but then it is predominantly highly influential in a very hot, arid climate. So in other areas where you have plenty of water, the compensatory tillering is there, the pest will damage will not be seen. Similarly, among the stock borers, you have the internode borer, uh, popular in southern India or the tropical India, whereas the stock borer Kylo Aurucelius is popular in the northern India. And the top borer 
and uh, plasti borer gurudaspur borer are popular in northern india whereas we haven't even heard of them in south india and then they are regionalized the habit is concealed overlapping generation so you cannot target at a particular generation the third one it is only next to diseases we can see the breeding for disease resistance in sugarcane but not for pest resistance because nobody is bothered the next one but then the times are changing so this is the shoot borer we can go a quick quickly we can go this is the shoot borer you can see the dead heart this is the in the degraded material you will find the saprophytes also the next one an affected field will look patchy like that if there is not sufficient irrigation the next one another field this is internode borer the between two borers borer the stripes differ there are five stripes in the shoot borer four in internode borer other than that the head is black in that orange in this case the next one the damage you can see in a multifarious way i told you there is a disturbance in the pest management strategy mainly because of imb what had been a simple borer now causes dead heart that means the growing point is getting affected and the whole plant dies leading into aerial tillery the next one the devastation by the imb and another complexity is that because of the inb the wilt increases the inb infestation predisposes the crop for further wilt and similarly whenever there is mealybug infestation mealybug infestation are pretty common these days because of the changing climate under such situations that a combined damage by the inb and the sucking pest predisposes the crop for wilting the next one this is top borer because it comes in the top region the next one the next one this is inb again this is root borer it doesn't occur on roots it occurs on the underground stem portion so what is actually the management the farmer simply waters the uh, uh, plant uh, drowning it literally increasing the humidity that is the control measure for shoot borer if it is excessive he just sprays chlorpyrifos or chlorantrinicrol that's all and uh, for inb there are two things one is the pheromone trap the second one is insecticide both have limited uh, control because the component and the release uh, strategy are not yet standardized for the inb pheromone and for insecticide most of the time the insect is not insecticide is not able to reach the coverage is not proper with uh, aerial spraying i think the situation might change i don't know whether it is for better or worse the next one so these are the borers which are targeted uh, for control with trigogramma many are there you can see it at leisure later the next one okay this is the uh, this is a much magnified uh, parasitoid otherwise it will look like a pinhead size only this is the corsera egg pasted on a paper which is used for rearing the parasitoid and it is released on a wild crop like this it is actually not a wild system it is a natural the cultivated sugarcane which looks like a mini forest the next one so why is trichogramma being talked about there are multitudes of parasitoids that two egg parasitoids leave alone the larval pupal parasitoids among the egg parasitoids trichogramma is very popular it is a star parasitoid the first reason is that it is found throughout the year any place in the world wherever you grow sugarcane at any season you will recover trichogramma if you lay a sentinel card and it is oligophagous it can survive on even non preferred hosts increasing in population during its target host the most preferred host in this case we can we have records that it on kylo species it prominently attacks such kind of uh, system is very useful to us because if it is very specific like telenomus the system the, the parasitoid is not amenable for us for laboratory culture nor will it survive in the field at a very high level it would also survive but then it will not bring the effective control so necessarily we need an oligoparasitoid so trichogramma is such an oligoparasitoid the next but not the second one is that it is easy to multiply carcera on any grain mark you can easily fact it is called as a factitious host it is not the original host but a 
duplicate host which is easily multiplied in the laboratory where you can control the production you can find a very effective biological control agent but then if it is not amenable for laboratory culture there is no use trying to control the pest with that it can be only used for natural control it comes at its own means and fancy it exerts some amount of control and then it leaves the system there is not the productive contribution by the most effective natural biological control agent so the first and foremost quality is that it should be amenable for the biologic um, laboratory culture so that you can control the amount of the parasitoid that you need at the time you need to be released at the place you need to release so that way hands down trichogramma wins over all the egg parasitoids so far in the sugarcane ecosystem and the second thing world over it has been used and had had many successes there are several failures equally reported raising dubious uh, uh, duplicity about the results obtained by the pioneers or the contemporaries but then a success is success the uh, the proof of the pudding is in eating it so those who have had successes continue to release it with the government's help and there are some ngos who do it no other parasitoid had enjoyed has enjoyed such successes such minimal amount of successes in sugarcane second it can be released against several species of kylo in sugarcane which are all important in different zones and the questions are that because it has been continuously raised in on the factitious host in the laboratory it would have lost its genetic vigor we have conducted 15 year long studies at icr sbi and we have found that the moment it is exposed to inb it uh, gives the same amount of parasitism if not slightly higher it means it has not forgotten the host volatile or it, the, the genetic host searching ability or attraction to the original host or the para, uh, parasitization ability so the, the loss of vigor is a hoax the second thing is the dispersal ability trichogramma is known to be foratic it doesn't fly on its own it is so tiny it is wing carried and uh, the dispersal is poor supposedly but then it is not done in a day a parasitoid which emerges is easily alive up to 4 days in the laboratory in the field it might be still better when in a natural ecosystem so every day it might travel particular distance to reach the target we had uh, conducted the dispersal studies on the dispersal studies in empty field as well as in sugarcane of different ages and we had come to a conclusion per acre if you have 10 release pots the trichogramma will be able to disperse and establish a, a, a reasonable amount of control then lack of environment adaptability higher the temperature lower will be the parasitoid adaptation that is true for any parasitoid and there are some temperature tolerance strains specifically developed for this purpose we should meet the use of the parasitoid for uh, shoot borer which occurs only in summer the finally the release parameters influence the field activity definitely we have had closer to 40 field trials and uh, the later during the later trials after uh, culling out several phenomena we could have consistent results so it is not the efficacy but the consistency of the efficacy which is affected by the release parameters if you want the repeatability we have a protocol which i'll be telling at the end i'll make you wait uh, everything matters the age of the parasitoid uh, dosage release frequency releasing spots all of this matters then finally the fate of the trichocarts you just go and tie the carts no one knows what happens to it and see it up the next day finally the combination with other strategies the most viable and uh, economical and productive one will be only pheromones but then the uh, the status of the combination with the pheromones a decade back i had given here but currently there are a lot of uh, advancements that have come that might improve the performance next one so the talk is actually around this field trials you would see that all those things which are in oranges are non significant what is non significant 
the incidence or intensity or the yield is non significant from what from between the control and treatment we could see that there are several oranges almost uh, only 60% of them were significant and in the pre treatment trials are in blue and we could see that we had made six releases after each release we would take five um, totally there will be five observations there were several non significant uh, results that you can find out here that means the incidence between the released plot and the non released plot that is the control plot had been insignificant it had happened both between both in case of incident incidence and intensity incidence means out of 100 canes how many canes are bored intensity means within a cane how many internodes are bored out of the total internodes so sometimes when the severity of in, uh, the occurrence is very high even at the same incident you will find a lot of damage and the loss of quality and this we can see that in these field trials there was arbitrary releases infrequent releases the dosages for, from literature which was very few and uh, whether it is four months crop or six months crop or seven months crop we had made only six releases and the result is for you to see the next one and in hotspot those were conducted in and around Coimbatore where the incidence only reached around 60 to 70 percent at harvest whereas at uh, hot spots you will easily find 90 to 95 percent sometimes even 100 percent incidence that means every cane would have been attacked by the internode borer at least once i have taken inb as a case study but there are different case studies for stock borer top borer top borer a different species japanicum and then here uh, for even for root borer there are some trials but not with many positive results and uh, in sakti sugar we had conducted trial against the uh, internode borer we could find that the intensity was not significant whereas in case of incidence one was significant the other one was non-significant which says that it was happenstance the next one or we can say it was successful but it couldn't be reproduced and here we then we try to see what if we release it from five, fifth month onwards or seventh month onwards or ninth month onwards we could see that the first uh, first one is when you start releasing from fifth month the second one is if you start releasing it from seventh month the third one is ninth month after ninth month the damage becomes cumulative and the damage between ninth to 12 months is very high compared to the damage from fifth to ninth month even then if you release it by ninth month you will not find it this is only one set that is presented here elsewhere also we have found if you start the releases by seventh month you will definitely get for the want of uh, money or for the sake of economy if you have to restrict it has to be at least by seventh month but not by ninth month even though most of the damage happens from ninth to twelfth month next one what happens when you release uh, the parasitoid weekly only six releases then we find that in three of the trials we have two trials successful in case of incidence and in case of intensity they were not the one which was uh, non-significant with the incidence showed significance in the intensity in the other case in the last case you can find that at harvest we found the incidence to be significant in one of the trials but the intensity was non-significant so it also differs from the field to field where the yield consistently showed to be very significant the next one when we try to integrate it with uh, non uh, pesticidal method the first one the easy one practical one is the pheromone in this we could find that the trichogramma itself could have uh, higher uh, performance than the pheromone and uh, pheromone alone or pheromone and trichogramma put together maybe things could have changed now because this has happened at least about 15 years back now there are a lot of advancements with the pheromone technology pheromone release technology pheromone trap designs have come up now which might have improved the uh, the pheromone status now so now the combination could be better but we, we can see that in these you know, four trials which had been conducted consistent results were obtained only in case of 
trichogramma. In other things, it was variable. And control was worse than all in most of the trials. The next one. In, again, in hotspot, by the improved method where weak releases were made from fifth month to one month before harvest at the rate of 2 cc per acre at 10 spot, we could have good results. Whereas the dead heart was reduced, it was only in, uh, in both fifth releases and control, we could find the dead heart being higher than the continuous release and the incidence was lesser. Whereas in case of uh, incidence, the six releases was better than control, but still lower than the continuous release. And in case of intensity, again, the continuous release fared better. And the yield definitely better than both the, the, both the methods. The next one. So there was one more thought, wherein we thought of increasing the dosage because it is not practical or expensive at that time of a experiment conduct now with the with the prices being higher more than 3000 it shouldn't be a case 5 cc per acre was tried it showed a definite uh, significance between the control and treatment the next one so what is the process we started from the literature random releases infrequent releases of 1 cc per acre either three releases or five releases depending on the age of the crop we never bothered about the age of the crop if there was incidence we released it then naturally we had uh, inconsistent results the next one we went for fortnightly releases of uh, at starting at the fifth month age of the crop but again only six releases and then we, we changed it into weekly releases thinking that we are going to contain the population by successively attacking the host egg no, at the rate of 1 cc. Then we released it as uh, two releases uh, as 10 cards distributed based on the studies of the disposability. Then we went for week re weekly releases starting from four and a half months or 10 months damage, whichever is possible, uh, at the rate of 2 cc per acre, 10 spot. And then what had, uh, what was the idea that has enabled us to evolve this module release the parasitoid weekly at the beginning of 10 percent of incident till one month before the harvest at the rate of 2 cc per acre at 10 places and the cards should have the parasitoids of at least five percent emerging from the card after that only it has to be released what has made we made the dispersal studies as i had previously explained either in the empty field or in the crop of different uh, ages. Then the host volatiles, whether the trichogramma is good enough to recognize the original host targeted that we had confirmed. Whenever we had inconsistent performance, we thought we, since we read it on I mean, Carsera, it probably had forgotten its original host. So we had conducted some basic studies on host volatiles, host preferences, host plant architecture. Like in other crops where the crop um, architecture is very, not very complex, it is unlike the sugarcane, when it was easy for the parasitoid to access, is it the reason? That was also the word disproved in the pot culture studies where we have caged the parasitoid and also released them free without uh, having them the obligation of staying on the plant. And uh, staggered emergences in the same card, you can retain the parasitoids of different ages, stick it there, stick it and then release it so that there is continuous parasitoid. That didn't work out because of the heavy predation by the parasit um, by the ants, which were attracted to the protein leakage from the cut eggs. Then uh, covered in the mosquito net bags. This gave 100% protection, but then not at all practical. The third one, the quality control. The biggest drawback was that. If you store it for more than 40 days in the refrigerator at 10 degrees, the parasitoids are equal to nothing. If you want field competent parasitoid, restrict it to within one and a half month, uh, one month. 40 days is the maximum period you can have some amount of emergence. Then the temperature tolerance. Yes, you have to develop a temperature tolerance range if you want to release it in a very hot climate for shoot borer. For INB, you don't have to bother because the microclimate is very less. We had also developed a temperature uh, tolerance strain and we evaluated it against uh, shoot borer in three trials of which two trials gave us positive results. And then finally, the age of the eggs. 
trichogramma does not bother about the age of the eggs. It can develop until the black pit stage is developed. The next one. So the case for continuous releases. People fuss a lot about the cost of biological control, that it defeats its purpose. Gone are the days of uh, such logic because you know, anyone who would have bought the pesticide would know the cost of chlorantriptonor or uh, imidacloprid or a combination of piperonil and imidacloprid, less than time. These are They are all more impractical than the trichogramma per se. So once a learned man who was a commercial produ um, producer, I went and asked him, how many parasitoids do I need to produce to, um, do I need to release to get uh, continuous success, consistent uh, success? He told, as many as you can. It is as simple as that. With 3,000 and odd rupees for per cane, if uh, a, cane, a cane borer has to be controlled, expose the cane to as many parasitoids as possible. A decent level of uh, parasitation can be expected when you release it at the 10% uh, incident level regularly from a quality laboratory, not the one run of the mill stuff. You will definitely have success, repeatable success. Then observe the change in the pest damage pattern. If you have lot of dead heart, that means your ecosystem is stressed. Your variety is more prone for the, in 90, if I remember in 1990s, INB started attacking the meristem more often than it would in a normal crop. So the pest had changed its pattern of feeding once CO86032 was introduced. Now we find more of the meristem damage in 11015. The higher uh, the uh, sophisticated variety, the early maturing crop, high sugar content, early vigor, we find that the pattern of feeding is varying. In that case, increase the dosage mercilessly. Don't hesitate or shy away from combining it with any other method, even a prophylactic control of the pesticide in the initial stage before you start releasing it. Or uh, combine it with uh, pheromones, whichever brand you like very much. So biological control does not mean Puritan biological control. Make it viable method by integrating with whatever methods that is available to you because the final requirement is to have more money in your pocket. The next one is the varietal milieu. Keep watch for the change in the varieties. That is a key point that one has to watch for. And pesticide usage. With the aerial spraying, I don't see any scope of... Uh, ecological balance nor uh, the survival of biological control at all just because it is available people spray now even when we say you don't have to spray for mealybug they go for it they say the mealybug induces pokaboying pokaboying is a very weak pathogen it is a weak pathogen it's a fusarium pathogen it can uh, it can just go away the moment you nourish the crop well or irrigate the crop well but then they say no 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 the climate is very hot it is because everyone fancies an aerial spray Remember the saga of Pyrilla, which was induced by the aerial spraying way back in 1970s and 80s in northern India. And the Pyrilla had to be brought down only by the Ekpri the savior of the biological control. The same situation is rising now. The third one is, as I had already talked, disease and pest relationship. INB predisposes a crop for red rot, wilt. And if there is a wild grub problem combined with that, the INB problem enhances the damage by the wild grub. I mean, the crop is not able to tolerate it anymore because the crop is a chosen variety. It is not the usually uh, acclimatized variety. A variety takes at least 10 years to settle down in the ecosystem. Till then, in the first three or four years, it is always a roller coaster for the variety regarding the piston diseases. Then the organic farming. If you want the organic label, then stay with trichogramma. The next one. So what can you do? Design more strains. And a lot of plant architectural studies are required, especially with reference to intercropping. We did some preliminary studies, but then we need field level studies. And then host searching ability. What if there are multiple kylo species? How much the Chylo saccharifagus indicus is attacked. Deeper understanding is required. 
then finally host plant preference if at all there are some honeyed plants wherever you have the because sugarcane does not produce honey it doesn't mean that the trichomagrama doesn't parasitize then we will not be able to have recovery from the field all the time we do get it it's probably the weeds which have flowers and the nectar uh, weeds that support the uh, sugarcane ecosystem what if there is a crop which abundantly produces lot of nectar which is in the surrounding vicinity of the sugarcane what is the exact impact of the natural parasitism and whatever you release does it stay there or goes away those studies will have to be done at a deeper level then we will still be able to use uh, trigogramma in a more efficient manner thank you for the patient listening any queries i'll be happy to answer Atsali is in Maharashtra. Ex Exali and Atsali. So uh, many of the farmers think that uh, these biocontrol practices won't work to the field. So as the researchers, can we make it possible so that uh, without any pesticide application, so can we achieve total success of INB infestation in the field by researchers? Mm -hmm. So farmers may not do that, but they, uh, they are uh, because of uh, the. sugar content or yield aspects so can researchers can do well for inb uh, infestation reducing around uh, 90 to 95% no method can do that that's a mirage 90 to 95% you'll be happy if a biological control agent is able to bring down 30% of your pests down that is more than sufficient 100% control is imagination the much glorified first line of defense insecticide will not be able to do that can we can we take at least up to 65% you can't you can't you need combination of two or more technologies yeah ma'am agronomic practices can be added and along with agronomic this... practices changing the time of planting changing the varieties intercropping watering keeping the microclimate better not stressing the crop not delaying the nutrition and choosing the right variety which is good for your uh, climate see the variety that grows very well here will not grow well in maharashtra and if the crop is already stressed the damage by the inb is going to be very high and if the crop is been damaged already by the mealy bugs and other sucking pests the internode borer will become a meristem killer in Ma that case you will definitely have to go for a combination with other uh, technologies like pheromone and the spray you have to take spray Yes, ma'am. When we get thirty percent of success, so what is the yield that we are going to get? See, when we had made only six releases, we could have ten tons per acre. Even those times, it was uh, higher than the amount that we had uh, spent on the trichogramma release. What is the success? You pay one rupee, get ten rupees. That is success. You are asking me hundred rupees. I have only one rupee. Bio control has the limitation of having a limited control. It cannot become the only method of control when the system is manipulated by all the factors. There are some natural bio control agents. The case of Epicanea melnonina. It comes on its own. It multiplies faster than its own prey, and then it uh, extinguishes the host, and it also disappears. if at all a parasitoid or a predator is occurring throughout the year continuously on its pest it maintains a homeostasis it will live and let live until unless your pest is reducing your money i mean the profit from you too much just ignore it the moment you can manipulate and then get more profit use whatever technology you can bio control is not a panacea it is one of the control methods i only ask you for to give it uh, due respect and not more don't disregard bio control it has got its own merits just as it has gone its own limitations it has got its own merits it can do it can contribute to a, at least in trichogramma it can contribute up to 30% 
in case of metarrhizium encephalia in white grub, I was able to get up to 75% only for white grub. I'm not able to get the same thing with uh, shoot borer or uh, internode borer, even under pot culture conditions where it is my product, my plant, the whole thing is under my control. Even then I'm not able to do it. I, we had checked out even the pillow plane uh, survival. For more than 21 days, it survives. And every larva that enters into the plant has to scratch the leaf and goes. And I have uh, drenched the plant with the pathogen. We do not know the various mechanisms by which the nature works. So biocontrol agent, a part we have mastered. And the day we master the entire uh, ecology of the agent as well as the target and the plant, probably that 100% uh, will become possible. Otherwise, I, I, I do not know much about the Adhali by control because it's too much, 18 months. There should have been a better balance of uh, pest plant uh, system, but Magarashians all the time pour a lot of nitrogen into the plant for the sake of weight. So that is why probably it is uh, disturbed. Otherwise, in the Exali system, it is similar to the other states of South India. There you will have a trichogram. Do not expect trichogram or any other parasitoid which are cultivated, I mean, mass cultured in the laboratory to give you 100% of control. And uh, as a, a soothing thing, I would say even your insecticide cannot give that. It's paying much more. So what you have to look for is you paid 100 rupees for trichogram. <coughs> Did you get more than 100 rupees? Be happy and do it. Do it as long as you can. And if you, if someone proves you that by adding 500 rupees worth of parasitoid, you are able to have 5,000 rupees, go ahead and do it. That is the only logic. The only idea of pest control system is that you get more money than you had invested in. If you study, you get a job, isn't it? Same thing. Anything else? Yeah, thank you. I'd like to learn from you. Uh, you have done an excellent uh, report about this. How much of climate change affects the pest management? Actually, I belong to the skeptical lot who thought climate is the climate change is a hogwash. Mm -hmm. I thought people want to wear fine silks and uh, talk. Uh, Lip, uh, lip twisting English and uh, promote themselves. But uh, no, I have to agree. Like if you really don't have arguments against them, you have to join them. So in my experience, I find sucking pests have become horrendously exploitative now. The, the one I have not yet published, but I would like to reveal here. There is a mini book called Phenococcus, Saccharifoli which was recorded in 1950s in Bihar, just as an insect, not as a pest. But then last year during the Corona season, during April, May, I found it in the pot culture. And I was thinking mealybug in well-maintained pot cultures are babies. So we give them utmost care. How did it come in that? Then I plucked, it kept on coming. The only way to get rid of mealybugs is just to pluck them away. You don't spray them because anyway we need them for other experiments. It kept coming. It ruined the entire pot culture. Then within 20 days, we had calls from the sugar factories that there is a mysterious pest which is killing our crops. The mealybugs had devastated the emerging seedlings, grown up crops, promoted for cowboying, and then the entire crop was Decimated to a stub. Fortunately, there were underground uh, nodes which germinated when the spraying was given. At that time, we couldn't say we you control with the biocontrol or something or watering or anything. We just told them uh, spray because it's a new pest, it is going to succumb to any insecticide that you are uh, spraying. But uh, it lasted for a period of eight months. It ravaged everywhere. At least uh, six factories had reported the huge amount of occurrence. Similarly, white flies used to be a rare occurrence and they are babies of poor uh, crop husbandry. If the farmer is lazy, you can see it in the crop. If there is white fly, 
the farmer is a lazy fellow he has not attended to his crop well or he had been a victim of uh, the resources like if you don't have water at all and then there is a lot of uh, the heat is high the temperature is high relative humidity is low the even if the farmer goes and prays near the crop nothing can happen so when there is a high climate change the sucking pests from and mites new species are occurring they have jumped across a crop so i would say with the sucking pest scenario we find lot of differences due to the climate change it has become simply hotter lesser rainy days the rainy falls uh, rainfall has been lower so more of drought we find lot of uh, sucking pest with in case of uh, inb in shoot borer we don't find much uh, changes um, but uh, in inb we find more of dead hearts now more of dead hearts nobody noticed that inb was there even when the crop was affected to the tune of 90 to 100% but the moment one heart the dead heart comes they become alarmed because over the towering crop you find one straw colored dead heart now in an inb affected plot you can find 30% dead heart which means 30% of the canes are lost the yield is gone so that way and uh, some varieties very high yielding varieties i don't want to name them which has been recently introduced in north india it has made a huge uh, turnover of the sugarcane factories because of the excessive yield and the, there is no dearth of canes and the sugar recovery has improved by 2% but then it's a heaven for uh, all pests there is no pest that cannot be cultured on it and it is specifically so susceptible to top borer and despite the top borer uh, they dump tons of chemicals in that but still they don't want to leave the variety because the profit is so high so we don't know whether this particular variety is highly susceptible to top borer or because of the same changing climate but the borer has become um, more empowered to attack lot of things we don't know i have not made any ecological studies it is in up so i have i only follow or i this is a second hand information and whatever is being published on it i read so i just uh, don't know whether it is a varietal milieu that has brought the pest attack more or uh, it is a kind of resurgence like they put dump lot of chemicals and that is why it has been such a rise so one thing i can clearly say is that climate change is there at last and the pest scenario is changing in thank sugar you, thank you you have my email id there any time you have any doubt not necessarily not necessarily in sugar cane on any pest if i know i would tell if i don't know i learn and let you know so don't hesitate to write to my email this is my email id the the it is a yahoo id mvsbi@yahoo.com don't write any other email id because i can't even open it thank you very much ma'am for the detailed insights of pest management in sugar cane i now invite dr s sitandam director sbirc chennai to present dr n geeta with a memento Thank you, ma'am. And the next talk will be by Dr. Abraham Vergis, former director, ICAR, NBAR, Bangalore, India, and it will be through the online mode. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Varghi, sir, are you able to see the slides, sir? Yes, sir, I'm able to see the slides, sir. When I say next, okay. you can change. Yes, sir. That is a team is waiting for you. Uh, okay. 
uh, we'll wait for time. Minutes. Yes, kindly wait for, uh, wait for a few seconds. Absolutely, no issue. Hello, sir. Hello, hello. Uh, kindly Father. wait for a few minutes. Uh, kindly wait for a few minutes. That's a uh, technical yes, error. It's getting I'm ready waiting. now. I'm uh, waiting. You can see the hall. You can see the hall also. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, seeing. So. Yes, beautiful. Yes, very good. I remember speaking that two years ago. Yes. Yes. Are you able to see the slide, sir? I'm able to see. I'm able to see. Yes. Go to the next please. Yeah. Next slide, please. It's moving, sir. It's okay. moving. It's moving. Come back to the first yeah. or, or the second also. Yeah. So, 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 so. When I have to Sir, begin, you tell me, Father. Dr. Abraham Balkis, now we are going to begin the session. Yes. On behalf of Loyola College Management, the staff and research scholars and scientists, and Sun Agro Biotech, Dr. S. Siddhanandam, the director, and Dr. S. Janathan, the head and professor of Advanced Zoology and Biotechnology, and the Entomology Academy of India, and on behalf of all the participants, I welcome you, sir, to this international seminar on emerging trends in insect science. Uh, dear participants, we have an eminent scientist, Dr. A. Vargesh, is the former director of ICR, NBA, IIR, Bangalore, and former principal scientist and head, Division of Entomology and Nematology, ICR, IAHR, and former national project coordinator, India and UK Integrated Management of Fruit Flies in India and former project coordinator, ICR and All India Biological Control Project. And currently, he is the editor in chief, Insect Environment. And every month, you receive the recent advanced development in the field of insect science. And the Asian representatives of the International Steering Committee on Fruit Fly. So, dear participants, we have an eminent person with a character of scientific capacity as well as uh, integrated personality. A person who is very much uh, rooted in science and technology and the society. And he has formed many youngsters as scientists today. And Dr. Asogan is one of the another 
top entomologist, molecular entomologist is with us. And uh, there are many other entomologists. It is because of uh, the hard work and service of Dr. A. Abraham Vargis. Our Loyola College is proud of welcoming you, sir. Having you virtually, your presence is felt, even though physically you are absent, but you are felt. We are feeling your presence. And a hearty welcome to present your topic today with us. There are many participants in offline as well as online. So hearty welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Father, for uh, that wonderful introduction. At the outset, I'm extremely grateful to uh, Father Maria Pakiam for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity. I'm grateful to uh, Dr. Ashokan for giving me his uh, short slot uh, so liberally, which I've accepted. Thank you so much. I've seen uh, Dr. Sitanandam in the audience there. Uh, presenting that momentum. Hello, Dr. Sitanandam and Dr. Janardhanan um, of the Chennai Madras University. Uh, all the um, scientists uh, who have gathered there, all the students, um, uh, a wonderful good morning. And I'm really missing your uh, Loyola beautiful campus and that lovely hall. I was there two years ago uh, to give a talk. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I I think uh, I'll try to do amends for not being there physically uh, present. And uh, I also would uh, uh, like to share uh, a feedback which I received yesterday from Dr. Subaharan. He told me that uh, the whole meeting uh, is so well organized. And he said, you missed it, sir. And I said, I also equally missed it, uh, you know. So congratulations to the entire team of the uh, Entomological Research Institute and all the affiliated associations. This time, remembering Dr. Anatha Krishnan, who founded the Entomological Research Institute. Now, my tributes and uh, uh, tributes to Father Ignasi Muthu, um, a great uh, friend. And let me now move on. And I see um, something else on the screen. Uh, so back to my PowerPoint, please, the organizers. Back to my PowerPoint uh, so that I can begin. I see the uh, base screen coming in. Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, sir, the, uh, kindly share the screen. The screen uh, now it is coming. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. Sir. okay. Now, um, okay. Now I'm I'm going to talk on a topic um, biopesty. Uh, sites industrialization you know i'm uh, we, we have to think big of biopesticides biopesticides next slide biopesticides what i mean by biopesticides is it's a whole gamut of uh, 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 bio products you know i've included all of them i'm meaning all of them from entomatogenic bacteria fungi you know you have the um, um, micronutrients you have the epns you have the pheromones so you have uh, uh, ev everything that is uh, emanating, into, including Dr. Ashokan, who will be talking about uh, s sterile insects and all that, except the synthetic insecticides, all come under uh, uh, biopesticides in my definition. Next. Now, uh, the demand for biopesticides is fairly moderate because the awareness is still going on. We talk a lot, and many of you, even the Entomological Research Institute at Chennai, uh, even you all have been talking about it. So. Uh, awareness is building up and uh, but uh, one thing which is uh, dismally low is the supply now and this supply is something which i need to address today now in this supply if you have to manage insects uh, through biopesticides industrialization of biopesticides has to take place in a big way see when the supply is not on the dealer shelf see the input dealer shelf is a very crucial segment in Indian agriculture, okay, and that is why the government is insisting that all the dealers should have a license, an agri-based license. It should be a diploma holder in agriculture, or should have completed a, a diploma with the manage if he's uh, uh, not one, or a, um, or from the agriculture university, or from a science background. Now, when the supply is not on that dealer shelf, you know, and then. No extension agent is going to recommend biopesticides. Take it from me. This is from my grassroots experience. Next. 
Now, now bio products are manufactured by nearly approximately 900 and odd. Let's say 1,000 bio products are manufactured by uh, bioproduct industries, small industries, of which nearly 30 to 40 percent are government agencies like KVK, ICR institutes, or um, the university institutes, and such of the uh, kind. Now, the reach of biopesticides, if you see, it's only to 3 percent of the farmers. The, I mean, it is so low, isn't it? Now, the volume of reach should be at least more than 90 percent, which means we need at least 1 lakh biopesticide manufacturers in the country. Now, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, take uh, that uh, we need, uh, we, we want to reach at least 50 percent. There are only 50 percent of the farmers who really use insecticides or fertilizers across the country, across the crops in the in this uh, in this uh, country of us now now if you have to uh, reach to the 50 percent we have to at least have about 45000 bio pesticide industries like the like sunagro for example who's part of the uh, uh, one of the organizers uh, of this uh, event next now how do we do that how do we get to this uh, target of uh, industrializing bio pesticides now, one of the best ways is to encourage startups. And I tell you, in India today, this is the best environment for startup. We started a startup called the International Phytosanitary Research Institute, under which we are publishing Insect Environment, um, you know, about a year ago. And uh, within the matter of six or eight months, we got the recognition from the Ministry of Commerce. And uh, now we are, uh, uh, you know, moving our arms for. Uh, funding and in a small way started manufacture and uh, farmer contact. So this is the best time to start startups. We must encourage every unemployed youth, every employed youth, every possible uh, youngsters to start startups because there are liberal fundings coming from NABAD, then from many banks, uh, then there are many schemes and programs, uh, you know, which uh, under manage uh, state governments, several incubation centers. I myself am a, a member of several incubation centers uh, um, across uh, South India and also BIRAC programs, which are very strong uh, once you register. And the, the government is also uh, giving uh, tax holidays um, and uh, for a particular sum for a particular year for such startups. So this is the best environment. We need to have startup. Next, startups. Now, there is from our side, from the public side, we need to ease regulations a little. Now, toxicology test is limiting many a good uh, microbials from entering into the uh, manufacturing or commercial sector. Now, toxicology can be done by the ICR institutes alone and then given to the commercial uh, people. So it is, uh, it is in some respects, it is happening. But, you know, it's a very long process. It's a very costly process. And, uh, you know, we have, what we suggest is that the funding should come from the uh, government and uh, the ICR or the scientists developing should also be able to do the toxicology test. And then about the registration. And um, registration should not take two years, three years, four years. It should be a matter of two months, three months. It uh, should be as simple as going and getting a driving license after a six month, six weeks per training. You know, to that extent, we need to bring it down. Patenting. Patenting is, uh, again, a very long process. I don't know how to make it uh, short. I applied for a fruit fly patent in 2009, got it in 2019, 10 years. And in that 10 years, the technology itself has got several fold over refined. Now, the patent should come immediately, maybe one month, two months, three months. So we need to have a um, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, event should give a recommendation to the state government as well as to the central government for a faster patenting, fast track patenting. Then the licensing fee charged by some institutes are pretty high uh, for the small scale uh, uh, sectors. And uh, so what they, they, it's good to bring down the technology fee or have a, a different arrangement of royalty payment, uh, things of that should happen. And so far, we were talking about public-private partnership. Now, public-private part partnership also is not fully owned by the uh, public, uh, un unless the inventor is also made part of the um, partnership. 
So inventor also becomes part of the business, you know, some arrangement. I understand that in CSIR, there is a program like that. Now, one only when that is made, the biopesticide uh, uh, sector would move forwards. Next. Now, uh, another important thing is the public labs, the government labs uh, should invariably concentrate on multiplying the parasitoids and predators because this is not viable for a commercial segment at all. Commercial people shy away from this because it doesn't have a seasonal demand uh, or when they, the demand is there, the parasitoids are not ready. There is a wastage. But government labs, uh, what, you know, they can handhold farmers by producing these uh, simply uh, because uh, it's not viable for uh, private uh, sectors and all other biopesticides should be given to the commercial segments. Next. Now, for example, uh, some public like you know, say Krishi Vignana Kendra, for example, say they manufacture uh, um, uh, nutrition specials, they manufacture thermone traps, they manufacture trichodermas, you know, which are, and even EPNs, and they give it uh, to free to the farmers or even distribute it at a low rate. But what happens, we are also telling the private sector, you also take our trichogramma, you know, you have trichogramma strains, we have EPNs, you multiply and sell. But when they go, the farmers say, no, we get it free in this lab or we get it only for 20 rupees a kg in this lab. So what are we doing? We are competing, uh, you know, by default. By default, we are competing with the uh, private people and, uh, you know, small players, people who do 2 lakh, two, 20 lakh business a year, you know, they get discouraged. Now, uh, what uh, therefore uh, uh, we need to do is to, for the small segments to come together. See, for example, BIPA, you know, it's a very good uh, example, you know, bioagri input producers association of 50, 60 of them have come together and they support each other. And when they all come together, they are as big as a multinational, you know, but uh, so that that is another thing which needs to be uh, looked into to co-join with BIPA. Next. Now, uh, the uh, important uh, thing here is, unlike uh, bio industries products, uh, and unlike big uh, industries products, you know, bio industries products are far cheaper. For example, uh, our own startup sells Pongamia oil liquid soap only for 300 rupees a liter, which is a good uh, sticker, good spreader, and a good repellent. Then our fruit fly traps, called the Rashvi fruit fly traps, uh, you know, we sell it only for uh, 20, 28 rupees a trap with in disposable containers. Uh, so what happens is we, we uh, it is possible for small segments to give a cheaper rate to uh, farmers than big. For example, we have Spinosad, uh, which is a bio origin and organic friendly, but it's very costly. Uh, 100 ml is about 1200 rupees, uh, but very effective. But uh, farmers, when they see that label and that the MRP, they shy away. So we need to, we need to have a, a, a realistic economical balance uh, and perspective when we look at farmers. Next. Now, in a place, now this is one example I'm taking from uh, Bangalore, where uh, four startups have uh, joined together. And we have a natural crop care, you know, which uh, takes, uh, buys all the products um, from uh, all the ICRs and the SA, SAUs, uh, state agriculture universities, or anybody who's willing to give, they buy the product. All of us won't buy. But then we co-join with uh, natural crop, uh, crop care. So there are at least three. Uh, uh, startups, you know, um, and all, all belong to my students only, IPRS, then uh, Neeti and Krishi, and in three different, one in Tumkur, in a uh, Tumkur district in Karnataka, another in, in uh, Shumoga, and the, another in Bangalore, and, and the products which are manufactured by uh, Natura Crop Care, you know, is further, uh, uh, you know, extended through these uh, smaller startups to other uh, um, farmers and uh, the care is taken that uh, geographically this is delimited. Geographically this is delimited. Nobody competes with uh, each other, and the farming uh, clients, the farm clients, are different for all the four. Um, what happens in the process? There is a grade. There is a um, assemblage. There is an assemblage of uh, these industries, and together it makes a, a bigger industry and a better reach. 
Now, this model has to be followed in almost all the districts uh, of the country. So, for biopesticides to take a um, airlifting, you know, it has to it has to take uh, uh, off. Next. Now, there are several uh, biopesticide uh, uh, available now, but most of these are not on the input dealer's shelves. That is one number one that has to come through. So that there is a licensing mechanism for that. All the startups should get government approved licensing mechanisms to sell it to dealers. That is one important thing that the startups from their side should do. Unless it gets into with the dealers, it, it cannot move into the field through extension agents. And another thing is there is a intra integration of biopesticides possible. That is, you can integrate pheromones with, say, verticillium. Uh, Bavaria uh, with uh, metarhizium and Bt, etc. These can be integrated. Some of them are compatible, uh, can be mixed. In fact, for Thrips parvis spinus, when it became a big problem, what we said was integrating with verticillium and with Bavaria metarhizium and EPN along with blue sticky traps. Uh, and otherwise, you know, otherwise they were not, they were difficult to be controlled. And this is something which uh, I be, I've told the plant protection advisor also. Um, and this uh, talk is available on the YouTube for Thrips Parvi Spinus. And uh, we are planning it right away before the sowing season for um, chilies, Thrips. So, integration within the biopesticides itself uh, is, is, is a very great stimulus and a possibility for managing several insects. Next. Now, product diversification can also be excellent. One, one group buys one uh, license, another group another license, all need not buy all the license, but they all have a consortium of understanding. And uh, when many products can uh, come out of the market. So in, in the in this example I said in Bangalore, they have more than 80 products available for the, pra, pra, uh, for the farmers by integrating. And we are now, try, now trying to get it onto the dealer's uh, shelf, which is, has to be done. Many byproducts are not available on the dealer's shelf, shelf except a few, but it has to change. It has to uh, change. Uh, for example, many of the my own fruit fly traps don't come on the fruit fly uh, shelf. It has to be given to the marketing uh, uh, mango Ma board or uh, uh, no, horticulture department, things of that. That is a struggle. That won't help the biopesticides to take uh, uh, forward movement. Now, the take home conclusion which I want to tell in the context of the emerging trends of new uh, paradigm in uh, integrated pest management is only if byproducts are found on the shelves of input dealers, only can we expect a revolution in biopesticide pest management. Otherwise, no extension agent. Exten extension agents look first. A gram panchayat leader looks into the uh, dealer shop. Dealers give them advice. That is what it transmits to the farmers most of the uh, time. Uh, blissfully, many of us may be unaware of this ground level happenings, you know, but we've been sensing this in a very deep. And this is one concern that we should industrialize and star have startups. And the environment in the country is now very, very favorable. Next. I must thank all of you for giving me this uh, uh, opportunity. And I told Father I won't take more than 20 minutes. And I would like to uh, thank Insect Environment, which is supporting me. And I would like all of you to contribute short notes, news, uh, interesting features about uh, insects, which you can't publish anywhere. You know, otherwise I would also certainly, and I myself also do current science, nature, plus, and all is open. But small details which you would like to share to students and uh, co colleagues. You know, we are there to give. And if you want a copy, please send us your email. The subscription is absolutely uh, free. This is our 25th uh, uh, year of existence, and we want all your goodwill. Thank you, everybody, for this nice opportunity. Thank you. Thank you once again. If you have anything to clarify, please. Uh, any uh, question answers, sir? It was a wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, any questions from the participants?
So, Dr. Valkis, I think it's very clear for the participants. And, uh, no more questions. Yeah, so I hope they all for... have startups. I hope they start yes, startups. <laughs> no questions, sir. No questions from the uh, hall. I received a message. So, thank you so yes. much for being available and share your insights and oh, information with us. Pleasure. So, pleasure. on behalf of Loyola College and uh, Sun Agro Biotech, as well as the University of Madras and the Entomology Academy of India, I express my sincere thanks to you, sir, for being available with us and sharing you a so wonderful much. session. So, thank, thank you. So God much. bless you. Thank, thank you. you sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, may I invite Dr. Aslogan, uh, Principal Scientist, ICR. Indian Institute of Horticulture, Bangalore, India. And uh, here is another expert in a molecular entomologist. And he's well known figure, not only national level and international level. Uh, so Loyola College is uh, proud of welcoming you, sir. Loyola College is proud of welcoming you. So on behalf of the organizers, uh, I welcome Dr. R. Asogan, who has specialized in genome editing, RNA interference in insect pest management, uh, DNA barcoding and molecular phylogeny, phylogeny. And for more than 25 years, he has worked in this field. So on behalf of the organizers and the participants, I welcome Dr. R. Asogan to present on application of genome editing in insect pest management, which is a need of the hour today, the molecular technology. So welcome you, sir. Uh, thank you, much, uh, Dr. Maria Pakyan. Uh, I have my slide. Can I, if you allow me to share, I will do that. Uh, yeah, please, sir. You are most welcome to share your slide. I'm not seeing this. Okay. Here, our uh, technician will go. From here, also, we can share. If possible, you can try. There will be a three dots. You can click. You can see the present screen and you can share your slides. If there is any difficulty, our people will present yeah. from here. So are you able to see the screen? I am not able to see that too. Okay. Stop something. We are trying from our end. Yeah, just a moment. I will call my. Yes, yes. <laughs> Hey, the bar. Can you share? How it is going in thousands? It is watching. Yeah. Yes, sir. 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 Hello, sir. Are, are you able to share? Are you able to see the PPT? No, sir. I have not seen. I am unable to see your slide. I have seen you in two devices. You have opened it. So, uh, can I start, uh, Dr. Maria Pakyan? Uh, yes, sir. Please proceed. Okay. Your slide yes. is very clear. Your, your audio is very clear. Kindly proceed. So, very good morning to everybody. I'm uh, sorry that I'm not able to come in person and uh, present uh, my lecture. I'm, firstly, I'm very thankful to Dr. Siddhanandam 
and uh, Dr. Maripa came to have invited me uh, to present here uh, my work on application of genome editing in insect pest management. Um, I'm a principal scientist working in the Indian Institute of Articulture Research. Uh, I've been working on uh, uh, application of uh, molecular techniques for pest management. As uh, Dr. Maripa came uh, said, uh, we have been uh, working for the pest management through the molecular approaches, uh, starting from DNA barcoding, then some RNAi way back in 2008. Then we moved on to artificial microRNAs, which we have shown in the management of uh, Spodoptera litura, and also quite a few other pests. Then <clears throat> three years back, uh, so when genome editing um, became uh, very talk of the town, and it's one of the you know, frontier research in different aspects of uh, uh, science, uh, more so in uh, medical science. So it has really become a panacea to cure uh, many of the uh, diseases, genetic diseases, which otherwise was not possible uh, to correct it. Uh, so this is unlike the previous uh, approaches or uh, previous uh, uh, trying. Uh, to correct the genetic disease using many adenoviral vectors, which we are not really successful. But the genome editing offers a lot of uh, scope in different spheres of science, including agriculture. So um, I'm not going to talk uh, much on to uh, other areas of agriculture, like a crop improvement. I am going to talk only on insect pest management, which currently we are doing in my lab. Okay. So as you know, this uh, genome editing is not only with the Cas9 that we are always uh, talking about. So that which relies on making a double standard break. So um, that which was uh, shown to be very useful in eukaryotes uh, in 2013 by the publication from Feng Zhang from MIT Boston uh, to have shown that the genome editing uh, could be successfully used uh, on the, in mammalian uh, cells. So that from that time onwards, it has caught up attention of uh, scientists from different arena, uh, different sphere of uh, research, and many people are using very successfully. And uh, that <clears throat> that being said, and uh, there are many uh, good, very in-depth advancements, very far-reaching advancements in uh, genome editing. So genome editing, again, it is a very generic name. So it can be brought about by different nucleases. Uh, like a Cas9, and also there are varieties of uh, Cas enzymes. It's not only Cas9. The varieties of Cas enzymes like Cas3, Cas13, Cas12a, uh, Cas10. So there are many, many having different applications. And very recently, uh, the contribution came from David Lou's lab, again from MIT Broad Institute, uh, to have invented these base editors, which may, we can correct many of the genetic diseases. Uh, for example, sickle cell anemia, which can be easily corrected, which uh, they have shown it already um, by just replacing one uh, amino acid. So that is that has become very possible. And also, the same group also extended. Uh, there is another technology called prime editors, so which relies on uh, like we can dictate the mutations using RNA. So we can have a, a predetermined mutations which can be introduced at any locus of the genome. Then again in 2021, again the, from the same group, we have another advancement in uh, uh, prime editor that's called twin prime editor. Then the very the latest one um, uh, from MIT is uh, paste. So so we are today's lecture we are not going to talk anything about this uh, base editors, the prime editors, and uh, twin prime editor and paste. So we'll be confining more towards uh, Cas9 um, for our. Uh, for our uh, discussion. So just the genome editing, it is not that it has simply started in 2013. It has a very long history. Uh, so actually, this all the, uh, the genesis of this genome editing started from the very curious observation of a PhD student. You may not believe it. It is 19, way back in 1987, uh, which here the PhD student observed a repeat elements uh, just uh, in the bacterial genome. So the from 2018, we are seeing the application of genome, genome editing or genome engineering, or some they call it as a gene editing. So it depends on what you edit. Okay. So I will tell you it is only a jargon. There is nothing great in it. If you understand properly, this is there is a very, very, very simple uh, 
uh, technique. So this has uh, 20 years of history of uh, genome editing. It's uh, genome editing, the term coined, uh, came to be used uh, from 2013. Before that, it was only a, a CRISPR-Cas9 based defense mechanism. So which was more prevalent in a bacterial system or RTL system. So this, I, as, I'm, uh, as I told you, this is in 1987. Um, there are two observations, one in Japan and other ones in Spain, to have seen these uh, repeat elements in the bacterial genome. So it was more confined to microbiology until 2013. So people were working. What are the what what could be the reason that these repeat elements are found in the bacterial genome? As you know, the bacterial genomes are only 10 to uh, 5 to 10 kb. So it is easy to do the whole genome sequencing now to find out the functions of repeat elements. So initially it was uh, really perplexing for the scientists to know why they why at all they have to occur. So many have contributed uh, to understand to have for the understanding of you know, different components of the CRISPR uh, Cas9 based defense in the bacterial system. So it is nothing but <clears throat> if we look at the uh, long form, it is a clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeats. So that is seen in the one locus of a bacterial chromosome. Okay. So this is a, this is seen in more than 45% of the U bacteria and 85% of the RK. So if you want to define uh, this uh, genome uh, or defense, so we can uh, we can uh, say it it's a naturally occurring adaptive immunity in bacteria based on the nucleotide memory of the previously invaded phages. Okay, so then how we will just see. So I'm not going to take much into the depth of how this is uh, the genome editing occurs in the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, mediated uh, breakage in the bacteria, but I am just going to tell super like on a surface that this is uh, the concept of genome editing. We'll dwell more on entomology, the application of this genome editing in entomology. In if you look at the natural natural native bacterial immunity, uh, so usually the bacterial cells are <clears throat> attacked by bacterial phages. These are the parasites which take the uh, nutrients from the bacteria. So in like uh, any predator prey, so the bacteria has developed a um, strategy to memorize what whichever the bacteria with phage which has attacked the its own uh, cell so what it does is it pinches a portion of the incoming nucleotide in nucleic acid from the phages and then incorporate in the, into a locus called crispr locus okay so this uh, different colors what you call as a different colors uh, represents different phages uh, which has attacked with this bacteria so this is a uh, repository or the bank, the information bank, genetic information bank of this bacteria to know that this, um, uh, what, what were the phages which has attacked them, okay. So they have devised, the, the bacterial cells, they have uh, came up with a different strategy by memorizing the bacterial uh, phages which have attacked them. And then they use these uh, genes which are in the upstream, that they call the upstream of this uh, locus, the CRISPR locus known as the cast genes. So these cast genes, they pinch a portion, as I told you, and which has a two structural component, one or two structural component, one is known as a PAM, that is a protospacer adjacent motif. So this is very, very unique, and also the protospacer. This is about 20 nucleotides in length. Okay, so the next one is, when the, uh, you know, the equally can divide every 20 minutes, and uh, whereas the other uh, bacilli, they can divide every one hour. So during the, their uh, replication and uh, their, um, uh, what do you call that, uh, further generations, if the daughter cells also encountering any of this uh, phage uh, infection, so they induct this innate this um, bacterial immunity based on the nucleotide. Then what, the, uh, what ends, uh, ends up is getting the biogenesis of the CRISPR RNA based on the nucleated memory, which we already stored in the this CRISPR locus. So at the interference of the phase, the CRISPR RNA, which is uh, developed, gets associated with another kind of RNA called the tracer RNA. So this uh, tracer RNA uh, binds to the Cas9 and gives a physical support. 
and the uh, mature CRISPR RNA, since it has a similarity, the sequence has been developed, derived from the phages. So it has uh, the similarity to the incoming phages to the attacking the doctors, daughter cells. So they form a complex called RNP, that is RNA and protein complex. So this CRISPR RNA sense it has complementarity to the incoming phages. So simply it is going to bind to the complementary sequence of the phage. So the moment it is uh, binding, so the moment it is binding, so the uh, Cas9 is a non-specific endonucleases. So which is the uh, cutting is going to be decided by the binding of the CRISPR RNA to the uh, protospacer or the incoming phages. So what it does simply does is it make a double standard break. The CRISPR Cas9 may, uh, induces a double standard break. So here we can see like uh, this is a repeat element which is common uh, factor and also we can see S1, S2, S3. So these are the spaces which represent the different phages. Okay. So the uh, editing bubble is looks like some something like, looks like this. So this is a protospacer which derived which is uh, derived from the phage which is infecting and also this is a CRISPR RNA which has a complementarity. So what it does is uh, the initially the Cas recognizes this PAM sequence, the three nucleotide that is NGG. So it can vary with the different Cas9 as we understand now because it's not the, this was the one which was identified initially from the stuff like, uh, uh, from the pyogens uh, bacteria. Once this binding, first initial PAM site recognition, then followed by the CRISPR RNA binding, then the Cas9. So we can see the two uh, nucleus domains, endonucleus domains here. The moment it binds, it's going to make a double strand break. Okay, so the possible diester bond of the target strand as soon as this non-target strand is going to be cleaved. Then you may ask a question, what is the genome editing here? It's only making a double strand break. Okay, so <clears throat> we have one other, uh, uh, unlike in prokaryotic uh, cells, eukaryotic cell has a capacity to repair varieties of uh, uh, what you call mutations which are occurring under the uh, DNA. So it can be a single standard break or single standard nick or it can be a double standard break. So there are varieties of ways, ways the, um, what do you call, the, uh, I will come to this. So in varieties of ways, the cell uh, can, the DNA can be uh, mutated or it can be, the, uh, it can be uh, attacked. So it can be a double standard break or single standard break or it can be a Nick. So okay. the eukaryotic cell has a capacity to repair varieties of uh, breaks in a different fashion. So the one that what we are using is based on the uh, repair bar the double standard break. So when the, there is a double standard break, eukaryotic cell usually repairs it in two different ways. The most of the 99% um, of the cases, it goes through a um, uh, repair mechanism called NHEJ, that is non-homologous enzyming. And if you are able to provide a correct copy uh, when there is a double strand break, so we can also replace it. This is called the homologous different repair. So we are talking today about only the non-homologous enzyming, wherein the double strand break is repaired. But when the double strand break is repaired, then it is not a error. Uh, what do you call that? This is an error prone repair. So, error prone, Ashok, it is an error prone repair. So, when there is an error prone repair, the original sequence will not be restored. So, there will be an addition or deletion. So, in a way, when DNA is recombined, so we get accumulation of mutations. Okay. So, this is not the original strand when it is going to be refilled. So that means we have introduced mutations in a particular locus. So the mutation can manifest itself in a different fashion, depending on which gene you have uh, edited uh, and which region you have, uh, which region you have targeted. So for example, in a gene, it can be a promoter region or it can be a ORF, that is what, uh, what you call uh, open reading frame, or it can be a five prime UTR, that is uh, untranslated uh, region or it can be a three prime UTR. So mm -hmm. in varieties of ways, 
the manifestation of the double strand break and followed by the repair, error prone repair can give a different kinds of results. So we need to study and then make, uh, we have to position our uh, break and followed by the uh, repair. So <clears throat> what happens is the repair mechanism is not under our control. This is a very random mutations. So we can have a single base pair deletion or multiple base pair insertion. Uh, so we can be plus or minus. So <clears throat> what uh, the take home message is that from this editing uh, approach is that there should be need to get a frame shift mutation. That means even if you remove a, a large chunk of uh, DNA, if it is not uh, like affecting the protein folding, that means the functionality of the protein is not going to be abolished. So if you are able to make a, even a single standard uh, uh, insertion or deletion, and if that results into the, um, what you call the frame shift, then the entire coding region is going to change and the pro so does the protein. So when the protein sequences changes, the folding is going to change. When the folding changes, the activity is going to change because the uh, it is not going to uh, get that active amino acid uh, in the right proper uh, site. So this is what, so the normal uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, using double standard break ends up uh, these mutations in a particular locus. So what we are doing, I will just explain in the following this one. So initially when you look at when I am talking about uh, the prokaryotic cells, the, there are three components, as I told you. This is the transactic DNA, uh, CRISPR RNA, uh, and also the Cas9. So the transactivating RNA and the CRISPR RNA, these are the two one, two things. So the CRISPR RNA and the transactivating act, RNA, they are two different molecules. Okay. So this has to come from this has to be transcribed from the uh, prokaryotic uh, genome. Okay, so this was a limitation in taking this genome editing into the eukaryotic cells because in eukaryotic cells we don't get this kind of nucleotide based memory. Okay, we have immune uh, immunology, like we have very advanced system based on the immunology, immune response, the T cell based or the B cell based, so there are varieties of ways the immune response happens. So this is very akin to the, uh, it's a very primitive way of uh, defense in case of uh, bacteria. But the real application of uh, uh, genome editing, what you call as a CRISPR-Cas9 based editing came to be being when the two scientists uh, known by the name, uh, Dr. Jennifer Doukna, who, who is uh, a professor at the University of uh, California. Uh, she's in uh, UC um, Berkeley and also the Charpentier, she's in, um, she is originally from France, but currently she is working in Germany. They have been awarded uh, for Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020 uh, to have uh, made this small, uh, this uh, significant contribution. What is known as they made fused this transactivating RNA and the CRISPR RNA into a single molecule. So the, it looks very simple, but the significance is that so this the initially this system was more towards the, it was prevalent only in the microbial system. But on the moment it has been fused, it has become an programmable. So that means we will be able to target any cell, the, uh, the eukaryotic cell or prokaryotic cell. So what they have made, the contribution is, they have made this defense system as a programmable edit. Okay, so that is, that uh, paved a way for uh, this, what we, what we have now as a, uh, prime editor or uh, uh, what you call a base editor. So this is the initial point which we have done, they have shown in 2012. But Feng Zhang, who was not really related to the uh, genome editing, uh, like the research initially, he was more of an optogenetist, geneticist uh, working in uh, Broad Institute again. So he quickly uh, understood the concept and then they made, he made use of their uh, contribution and then quickly edited the uh, first eukaryotic cell, the mammalian kidney cells. So um, even though they have invented, but uh, this was uh, shown, uh, the effect was shown by Feng Zhang in 2013. So from, from there on, uh, this genome editing is now poised to make a lot of uh, differences. Uh, many companies are you, uh, now putting billions of dollars to have the genetic medicine, uh, genetic medicine developed.
okay so there are different steps in the target stand uh, sir, and like cleavage like the pam binding as i told you and guide rna binding and then final cleavage so we'll not go into the individual uh, technique so <clears throat> After recognition, so the result is the double cylinder break. So the double cylinder break is repaired and the repair will be in an error prone manner. So and now this is uh, the CRISPR Cas9 uh, system has been repurposed, making use of this uh, double cylinder break as well as the DNA uh, repair mechanism, varieties of DNA repair mechanisms in the eukaryote. So from 2013 uh, onwards, it has become a repurposed genome editor. Okay. So we talk more about uh, genome editing. It looks very great and also very difficult to comprehend. It's not so. So what we do in a genome editing for an entomologist, we simply make a double standard break at a specific location of the genome, specified by the off-target minimized guide RNA and the finding a suitable plan. So if we look at the genome, eukaryotic genome, so there is a uh, every there is a high probability of finding a PAM, that is a protospicer adjustment module, that is NGG for this uh, CRISPR Cas9, at every eighth nucleotide. So every eight nucleotides will be able to find a PAM. So, but it has no say evolutionary significance. But the uh, what do you call the specific location is specified by the guide RNA. So by guide RNA and uh, selecting the suitable PAM, we'll make a double stand break, and naturally it is repaired. And this repair is in it is error prone, so we get the edit. Okay, so this is what we get the edit, so which is non functional. Unlike RNA and other mechanisms, this is the editing is permanent. Okay, so the any genetic mutations that we create that is permanent, and again, uh, so we can make a transgenic approach or we can make a non transgenic approach also. We will see how. So, initially, the CRISPR Cas9 and bacterial immunity, the bacteria used to be. Uh, subdued by uh, bacteriophages, but after inducting the bacterial defense, now the bacteria overcomes this uh, bacteria phage infection and then their progeny survives. So, uh, how, what is the difference between this um, natural uh, nucleotide based immunity in the procre prokaryotes and then coming to the uh, how we have adapted to the eukaryotic cell? So, in case of um, they are, as I told you, CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA, they are independent molecules. But Jennifer's work uh, and Char Jennifer and Charpentier's work showed that we can fuse it and then make it as a single guide RNA. So these are two, this G RNA, here we can see SG RNA. And the PAM, it notates the incoming phages, specificity of incoming phages. So it has an evolutionary significance there. But here, whatever we find every nucleotide, so this PAM does not have any evolutionary significance. And there is a, this results in that uh, double standard break. Here also it results in the double standard break. But here, when very, very few cases, very, very few cases, the double standard break is repaired in case of prokaryotes uh, with the viruses. But in case of uh, eukaryotes, this is majorly repaired by NHEJ. So um, here it kills a uh, in the invading phages, but here we have a error prone repair mechanism that we use it for our advantage. So, with uh, if you are looking at the DNA polymerase, so the faithful reproduction of the target is the required um, character for the attack polymerase. That's why we have a proofreading enzyme. But the same disadvantage of error prone repair we are making use for our advantage. So, uh, and uh, this is that uh, up to 2020 20, there are a lot of uh, efforts to classify different Cas9, Cas enzymes, not Cas9. So we can broadly group into class 1 and class 2. So some of the examples of uh, type 1 uh, Cas3, you know, now it is making uh, inroad into genome editing whereas, where we can have larger edit as compared to double standard break we attain using Cas9. Then type 2, the example is Cas9. Then type 3, we have Cas10. Then type 5 is like a CPF1, previously is known as a C2C2, which can introduce a standard, uh, what do you call a staggered cut as compared to the double standard break by the Cas9. Then type 5 is CSF1, then we have Cas13. This is mainly to for RNA, editing RNA. So other than Cas9, we have several other enzymes. As I told you, here you can see 
like a Pac-Man, it can eat uh, two large chunk of a DNA. So we can have a large delete. We can have even two KB delete also. So um, we can have uh, this large, <clears throat> uh, well, large removal using the Cas9. Whereas in the Cas13, we can target uh, mRNAs. Okay. So we'll not go into the details of each one, each one of them. And um, it has a history again, as I told you, this uh, genome editing. So it started into 1987. Up to 2012, it was more confined to the uh, microbiology world. Then 2013 onwards, so now it has become being largely used in eukaryotic cell uh, editing. So <clears throat> as I told you, uh, this mismatch repair, there are not only the levels on edit, so mismatch, there are the varieties of DNA mechanisms, repair mechanisms are being utilized for genome editing. So some they use mismatch repair or base excision repair or mismatch repair. So this is a case of a prime editor. So this is a base editor where I saw, show you, I'm showing you that normal um, glutamine is the normal amino acid. So which is mutated, a single amino acid change causes a sickle cell anemia. So we will be able to revert back to um, the mutant is a valent. So we can maybe we are able to uh, restore this uh, glutamine in place of valent. So, so this has been already shown. Now it is in the process. Of, they are in the process of product development. So they use a <clears throat> uh, property of uh, DMNSS. So I will say the common thing is a DMNSS. So we have to look into the structural features of individual nucleotides where there will be minor changes if you look at. Uh, so that is being utilized. So again, it's a prime editor. So the prime editor, as I told you, this unlike Cas9, it uses a mismatch repair system. So the latest one is the twin prime editor. We'll, there are many advantages. So let me not go into that. The other one is the programmable addition of uh, via site-specific targeting elements. So this has further enabled us to have more integration, more size integration, even in case of 5 KB to 10 KB. Then this is for RNA, so let me not. So it's not that only from the bacteria, we have the phages, let's say from the Cas9. We also have Cas9, similar, very similar Cas9, very similar to Cas9, that is called Cas-V from phages itself. So. There is uh, this is uh, the the, uh, the advantage is that it is uh, lesser size, 1.5 kb. So when you are making a uh, plasmid or the vector, so this uh, size matters. So in the nat native one is 3 kb. So we will have a 50 percent reduction. So we can accommodate more efficient uh, plasmid uh, vector construction. So this is uh, for the intra-specific uh, what you call competition. So uh, the bigger phages has the CASV. So that will uh, edit, it's going to edit the smaller ones. So it is the larger fish eating the smaller fish. So we will not go into that. So we will come to this um, genome editing application into entomology. So I am going to talk what is uh, what I am doing currently in my lab. So <clears throat> um, we can use the genome editing to impart resistance to biotic and diabetic stresses. So we are not going to talk more about uh, pollinators or uh, parasitized or predators. So it has a lot of uh, scope in improving many of these um, uh, biochemical agents and also the uh, pollinators, pollinators or to improve their ecosystem services. And we can also improve the uh, quality and quantity of, uh, of their some of the products. Then it's very, very important in the area of trust management. So now the new term called genetic biological control has been called coined by a group in UC San Diego that is by Ethan, by Ethan Bayer and uh, Omar Akbari. So, and also improving natural enemies, as I told you. So, we have been talking about a host plan, like uh, giving natural enemies to uh, like enhanced host searching, enhanced egg So, all this can be uh, improve, improved using genome editing. Uh, how and uh, um, how it can be achieved, that we can discuss in a different uh, session or a different uh, occasion. Then improving pollinators, for example, we can uh, we can impart resistance to uh, honeybees using for against the thysac brood virus as well as the varroa mite um, in honeybees. So even though they are not the 
For example, in South, the sac brood virus is a major concern. In North, it is Vararam, it is a major concern. So we are now working uh, like the towards um, resistance, imparting resistance to uh, honeybee for the tax virus, sac brood virus is using through editing the queens. So what we need to know to take uh, this uh, Cas9 based uh, editing approach for pest management. Uh, so we can target the sex determination reproductive behavior. We can target molecular, physiological, and ecological functions. Uh, in, in so we need to know their functions in their context, native context, and also the what is the man, how it is going to manifest in if there is a loss of function, or we can make it as a gain of function. So, and also we need to understand their population genetics, including natural means and pollinators, before we take a target. So, all this had to be understood. And finally, the exit uh, exit is through Nipling's expectations for the field release. So, there are, as you know, in SIT, there are six expectations uh, which Nipling, the great insect ecologist, has set out. So, this invariably, this has to be met. So, we may uh, approach or we may get some uh, SAT or any applications for the field release. So it has to comply with the Nipling's expectations. So there is no uh, other go. So <clears throat> this is only is a simple uh, way to say that we need, uh, for example, if I uh, want to um, develop a method for a SAT or uh, for every pest management for a pest, so we have to clone the gene and also the characterize the gene from the uh, target species in your localism. And then we have to take off target minimized SGRNAs and also do the in restriction analysis, in vitro restriction analysis, so that the SGRNA can <clears throat> recognize the target sequence and then restrict it or uh, clean it. Then either you go through the microinjection, also uh, you can go through the other technique called the remote wherein we can give an injection of this RNP complex into the hemonym. So there is a signature attached to the Cas9 that is known as a vitrogen in, in there is a vitrogen in protein. It's a very big protein, but it has a signature to take that vitrogen into the uh, developing uh, X. Okay, so it has to cross the plasma membrane and then your protein has to accumulate. So we what we take is we take the signature, it's around 12 amino acids in the domain one of the white love genome. So that is fused to the Cas9 so that the Cas9 gets tra 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 targeted or localized into the developing uh, X. So we'll not go into the further details or more. And then we need to validate this editor. Edits, that edit means those are mutations which are created. So another advantage is that we are not doing any academic work now because uh, this SDN1 and two categories of genome editing, which is treated as a natural mutation as we get through any other mechanism, so like through irradiation, for example. So now it has been equated to that, and the genome edited plants have been permitted for field release last week by the Minister of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change for the through IBC, institutional IBC. So that is a great news uh, that the genome edited. Uh, edited uh, organisms, including the plants, can be field released. But there is only one small hitch with the arthropod is that. So we have to read this uh, genome edited uh, SDN1 and SDN2, even though they are safer. We have to uh, also go read with arthropod management, uh, what you call arthropod management, arthropod uh, containment uh, classes. So, so this has to be. Uh, taken care before releasing, especially for their area of pest management. So other than that, we can also uh, use this for uh, other organisms, for example, improving honeybees or improving uh, silkworms or improving any of these uh, parasitic or predators. So coming to the work that currently I'm doing is, uh, you know, this uh, fruit flies are the major constraint in uh, export of our mango or many other uh, fruit trusts, more so with uh, mango to um, other countries, uh, especially Western countries. So um, there are for a particular reason that uh, infestation and also for the from the biosecurity point of view, some of the fruit flies which are in the Oriental region, 
it may not be occurring at the receipt, you know, like in the importing countries. So, so they, they have different uh, regulations to import um, the ones which are emanating from, for example, in India. So Bacteria carrier is the one which is having uh, export <coughs> concept. Okay, so uh, with, we, I will talk more about the Bacteria Dasaris now. So in managing Bacteria Salis, we know there are different approaches in managing Bacteria Salis. and Dr. Vargis has been working on pheromone traps, parapheromone traps. Um, okay, so there are, there are cultural practices. There are many other practices are in vogue uh, to manage this Bacteria Salis. So one of the approaches is through SIT, irradiation mediated SIT. So in normal SIT, what we do is we do the, we do mass produce uh, this uh, Bacteria salis or for that matter, any other test for Pecnophora gasifera, for example, in the case of Rebdopera. And uh, this male and people, female, female PPA are sorted. After the sorting, so it is subjected to irradiation, so which induces uh, mutations in the gonad uh, tissues. But by the way of uh, introducing the gonad tissues, other somatic tissues also get exposed because it's not going to be specific. So it is going to be a broad spectrum application of irradiation. So even though there we achieve uh, sterility of the males before it's released, but the fitness is affected. So there is no there is no argument on that because it has already, already been shown by different groups who are working on uh, SIT where in Australia or in uh, Thailand or in Greece. So there is a, it, it's a, the technique is good and uh, IAE also promotes uh, International Atomic Energy all, Agency also promotes this, but there is also one small um, uh, lacuna of fit, uh, affecting the fitness. So, <clears throat> in 2019, uh, the one group, as I mentioned you, uh, in uh, my previous uh, slide, is uh, Dr. Omar Akbari uh, and Ethan Beer. So, they have came up with a very revolutionary idea uh, known as PGSAT, that is a precision guided SAT. So we don't need to sort any paper and we don't need to irradiate. So irradiation mediated off target effects are removed. And the, it is not, and the major thing is the fitness is not affected. The fitness in terms of longevity, the fitness in terms of recognizing the opposite sex. Okay, so that is not compromised, which has been shown uh, by this group. So IA is also now interested in taking this forward. And also the other uh, advantage with this uh, PGSAT system is we don't need to produce large number, large infrastructure is not required. So people sorting is not there, irradiation is not there. And simply what we are going to make is we are going to make two lines as you see here. One line known as a CRISPR uh, Cas9 line, the other one line male fame, male female having a CRISPR Cas9, expressing CRISPR Cas9 and the uh, male expressing guide RNA. So when we made so we have chosen a target to have embryonic lethality of a female and the sterility of a sterility of the males. So the targets could be for uh, uh, female lethality and the targets could be any of the genes, eight genes which are involved in spermatogenesis. So what we get is a sterile male fit, but the fitness is not com com compromised, but the female is eliminated. Okay, so you can see the difference of uh, the requirement of the infrastructure and the cost involved in normal SIT as compared to the PGSIT. And this is uh, only one, uh, what you can example that I'm citing now, but we are also working on other uh, species like uh, FAW, uh, that is Fowler Mivum, and the Lucinotus arbonalis, and um, we have Plutala Zelestella, then we have uh, um, uh, to pink ballworm, Pecnophora gasipiella. So each one has requires a different approaches and different modulations of our technique. But the <coughs> basic remains same. So in case, so everyone think that uh, this genome editing is a transgenic. So it is not a going to be. It's not essentially be a transgenic because if you are using DNA as a method to drive or to send in. Here, SGRNA Cas9, it's going to be a transgenic. So, this is not we are not doing here, and also we are not doing as RNA. So, we do use a um, complex called RNP, that is RNA and protein complex. RNA is a SGRNA, Cas9 is a 
this uh, because name is, is supplied in terms of protein. So this is a non transgenic approach. And what we do is we send this uh, RNP complex into the developing egg within the G0 stage. You know what is the G0 stage? So that is before the egg, the, uh, egg, the cell division starts. Okay, so that is uh, that is in the uh, so four somatics, uh, what you call the four uh, four cells, which are going to be a kind of a stem cell. So which is found in the posterior size of the side of the egg. So it is going to simply the Cas9 as a protein is going to make a double strand of the egg, and then that gets degraded. So the site is determined by the CRISPR RNA. So as we understood, already understood that the double center break is repaired, but with a with a what do you call it, with the addition or deletion of a nucleotide that results in the mutation. This mutation is now recognized uh, recognized as a natural mutation, comparing to the other achieved by other means. Okay. So um, there is no transgenesis and no traces of any external or heterologous genes or gene fragments in the organism. So right now we are targeting um, two female lethality and masculinization genes. One is a transformer and transformer two. And uh, we also attack other four important genes like the topi, TSSK, beta tetrabin and pectin. So in case of um, bacteria cell So we, these are the sex and determination pathway in case of bacteria cell We interject intervene at this stage so <clears throat> when you do this uh, tra2 locus so tra2 locus also found in both male and female so previous experiments uh, showed in tra has resulted in embryonic lethality but here what we want to do is in addition to this uh, elimination of uh, uh, females if there are some uh, for some any reason if a female is, uh, goes unedited or if, if there is no embryonic lethality we want to convert the female into a male so that will become a pseudo male so that will but it will have a xx chromosome but it will be a pseudo male also in addition to that we have a sterile male but it is the spermatozoid will not be able to produce a viable sperm so what essentially we are doing is we are vitiating the sex ratio from one is to one to it is more kind of a male biased sex ratio so this is a transformer too. So there are different uh, ways the trans, uh, splicing takes place. So it's female specific splicing as well as um, uh, male uh, male uh, gene is interrupted and then it is uh, like it is a premature to stop codon is occurring there. So that's why it is uh, female specific. So we position our sgRNA by looking at the splice site as well as we also look do the protein modeling to know. Uh, where if we are going to place our edit, how it is going to function. Okay, so we do a lot of bioinformatics using uh, PDB or SPASI and to look at the protein level, how this is going to, how these changes are going to manifest. So these are some of the spermatogenesis. So once we isolate the gene, then we need to do from our own population. Then once the, then we use the bioinformatics. There are many software online software tools are available. Then we can uh, based on the bioinformatics criteria for may first is the off target effect, second is the mismatch in the seed region. Then we do the in vitro transcription to produce the sgRNAs. After producing this sgRNA, we have to see in vitro that whether it is uh, recognizing the target. So okay, so the target has to be. It's like a normal end um, restriction in enzyme analysis. So we do the restriction outside, like in vitro transcription, in, in vitro method to say that or to know that the SGRNA is going to work. So it's not that uh, case, it's not a very, it's only molecular thing is very important. We need to understand the population dynamics and also the binomics. Excuse me, sir, Dr. Asavan, sir, another yeah. five minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'll finish, I'll finish. So we need Thank to you, do a uh, lot of studies on the uh, like the mating behavior, like if they mate with a single male, uh, how many eggs are going to she is going to lay, and so many other things we need to standardize. And also we need to pick up the eggs. We understand that eggs are thrusted into the tissue by the female. 
but if we want to uh, retrieve those eggs from the intact uh, fruit it is going to damage our egg okay so the g0e is only one hour so we need to inject into the within one hour okay so we have devised a method to make the female to lay eggs intact eggs into water okay so we, we will be able to collect the other thing is since the g0 is one hour we have to make like we have to condition the female to lay eggs at our will so if i give that elicitor within 15 minutes the female has to lay the eggs so and also the intact eggs so we have done that kind of thing so Not moving. Okay, so this is what the micro injection we do. This uh, using this needle, you can see the blob here. Okay, so this is what we have done doing on cooker pit. Let me not explain what we are doing. So finally, what we want to convey is. Let us say we are able to achieve male bias to sex ratio. So now we are screening what are uh, true males and what are XX males and XY males. So we need to know that and uh, and also it has resulted in the modified oviposter. So if this is a normal oviposter we see in the female flies, but if there is a modification of the oviposter, so uh, so the, she is not able to mate and also lay eggs. You can see the difference here. So let me not go into the other uh, um, other test was uh, Dosafra Susuke. So this is we have I have edited uh, two genes that is Cinnabar and Sepia. You can see the eye color. So this is needed for uh, transgenic the uh, gene drive. Okay, so this we have created a uh, flies normal flies with uh, edited flies which have a brown color. So this can be used as a marker for selecting our uh, edited, edited insects. So we are also working on other tests. So and then genomating also offers a hope. So like looking at the how the insects, uh, phytophagous insects localize their host. And uh, the poor uh, volatile seminate from the four uh, basic pathways. So that is across the plant, it is true. But the insect is able to resolve because it, through a hardwired information, it is able to resolve from different uh, same basic volatiles, but they different concentration and the time of release. Okay, so um, we may be able to edit the insect. So, but it has to be driven like uh, through gene drive. But we will be able to edit the plant genes like which are going giving the volatiles. For example, plant volatiles are dominated by terpenes, terpene synthesis. So, so we have shown in uh, the yet another experiment using RNA. Uh, that uh, suppression of this uh, terpene synthesis prelude uh, the changes in the volatile emission. So that uh, through ATPSA we are able to demonstrate that the, indeed the host plant is not able to recognize by the uh, wild insect. So and let me not go into that. So we uh, so following this genome editing, we need to follow one of these uh, mechanism or method to take a gene drive. This is gene drive is nothing but a gene uh, like a field release. Okay, so the one take home point of our uh, genome editor gene drive is uh, this goes through a non mendelian segregation. So every individual will have the edit. Okay. So the genome editing, it is not only that uh, all the advantages, it also has a disadvantages. So, so we need to suitably address this uh, disadvantages uh, to our yeah, what you call advantage. So re-regulation process, now SDN and SDN2 genome edited uh, plants have been permitted for the field release. So does other organisms also will follow the suit, follow suit. Uh, but the only thing is that uh, for arthropod containment also will be co-read with uh, field release here, uh, even though they follow SDN and SDN2. Okay. So the major issue is the annotated genomes to really predict the off-target effect. So I think I'm taken much of your time because I don't know whether I have done justice. So I invite any uh, questions. So
Am I audible, uh, Dr. Madhipakhi? Am I audible? Hello? Sir? Am I audible? Uh, sir, yes, sir. I am, I invite, uh, he can shoot any questions. Sir, uh, uh, just a few minutes for the participants to ask for a few clarifications, questions, if there is. Okay, sir. Sir, thank you, sir. No questions. It's very okay. clear. So, thank you so much for being available and presenting on uh, barcoding as well as molecular entomological field or insect pest management, in particular gene editing. So, thank you so much sir, for your presentation. Thank you. Any questions? We'll move on to the next session. In case if somebody needs a break, you can just go and come. So the moderator and the, uh, for the chair for the next session will be Dr. N. Geita, Principal Scientist, ICR Sugarcane Breeding Institute, Coimbatore, India. And the co-chair for, for this session will be Dr. E. Sukumar, Emeritus Scientist, Entomology Research Institute, Loyola College. We invite you to take your seats. The presenters for this session, kindly make sure your presentations are submitted to the desk. Mr. Dinesh, Ms. S. Bar Bargavan, Bhuvaragavan, Ms. Rashish Kamal, Dr. M. Sampat Kumar, Mr. P. Satyamurthy, Ms. Divya Sundari, Ms. R. Mahalakshmi, Ms. S. Sangeeta, Ms. Jemima Moses, are all of the participants in the, in the talks present here? Kindly make sure your presentations are submitted to the desk.
Present? Okay. Jemima Moses. Okay. Sangeeta. Bhuva Raghavan. Ashish Kamal. Okay. Dr. Sampad Kumar. Satya Murthy. All right. All are present. First session for oral presentation begins now. The first presenter will be Mr. Dinesh. Presentation can last for seven minutes, with three minutes for discussion. Keep it in mind that if you exceed the time, your marks would go down. Good morning, everybody. So, my topic mosquito roll cell activity of crude extract and its isolated compound from Tylopora indica against larvae of Aedes aegypti. Mosquitoes have always been a human health threat from eons. The major health problems caused by the or malaria, dengue fever, yellow fever, and Zika, as well as several other vector bone diseases based on World Health Organization. Mosquitoes are responsible for infecting more than 700 million people every year in, the, um, in more than 80 countries. Approximately 20% of the world's population is at a risk of occurring infections of mosquitoes bone diseases, most of them live in Asia and Pacific and the Americas. One third live in India and one third in Africa. Unfortunately, specific treatment for above virus is still unknown. Therefore, the curtailment of Mosquito vectors is necessary for public health. In the current situation, only physical and chemical methods are being used to control mosquito bone diseases. Physical methods such as mosquito bed net, mosquito windows uh, nets at homes, and electrical mosquito rockets as only temporary situations. Besides that, the Chemicals used for vector control, such as tempos and pyrites, are more well known with some insecticidals residence challenges. Chemical insecticidals are uh, synthesized chemical based on uh, single bioactive compounds with a reference to 
uh, structurally related plant compounds which uh, lead to the current uh, resistance problem for all mosquitoes classes only one single uh, chemical compound can be synthesized at a time due to its high toxicity effect and the multiple plant biochemical compounds are more stable and lower lower in toxicity due to their synergistic effect and natural contents additionally plants produced uh, numerous chemicals many of will have medicinal and uh, insecticidal properties more than 200 plants species have been known to produce the chemical factors and metabolites of values in pest control uh, next please tylopora indica there are uh, over uh, 63 species that are accepted to come under the genus tylopora and there are uh, only uh, found in burma sri lanka uh, barbora uh, vietnam etc Uh, in india is uh, particularly uh, plant uh, species is found to occur in the uh, eastern and southern uh, states particularly in the hill stations forest sections and eat the uh, plants many hill sta- states in the eastern parts such as the himalaya assam west bengal orissa and uttar pradesh the field the tylopora indica field of uh, siddha and ayurveda uh, tylopora indica plant uh, has found large applications in ayurveda next please next please uh, this is uh, whole plant tylopora indica next please uh, uh, this is uh, first one uh, tylopora indica leaves second one tylopora indica uh, flowers next please Methods and methods, plant collection and extraction. Aerial pots of Tylopora indica were obtained local, locally from Kanyakumari district. The plant materials were identified and authenticated by the Endomology Research Institute, Royal College, Oxford, where deposited in the same department herbarium as specimen number ERI DD one to five. The aerial pots of Tylopora indica were dried properly in shade at room temperature for. Three weeks and powdered using electrical blender. Plant powder one kg of air treated plant materials as each plant was soaked in three liter of hexane for 48 hours with intermittent shaking. The extract was filtered through Portman number one filter paper and extracted in a rotary evaporator successfully with hexane chloroform and methanol. Each time before extracting with the next solvent, the powdered material was tried at room temperature. Each extract was concentration in a rotary evaporator and finally tried in oakum. All the crude extract were stored at four degrees Celsius in airtight glass vial in the dark unit used. Next, please. Uh, this uh, this is uh, methodology. Uh, first one uh, tylopora indica plant second one ground plant uh, powder third one uh, soaked plant uh, powder uh, fourth one uh, solvent extraction and fifth one uh, solvent uh, evaporation uh, last one crude extract uh, collected stored uh, next please uh, prelim- preliminary phytochemical analysis the <coughs> tylopora indica Uh, crude extracted like hexane chloroform and methanol tested for alkaloids tested for uh, flavonoids tested for terpenoids next please tested for steroids tested for phenol tested for uh, thionines tested for saponoids next please uh, this is a life cycle of mosquito next please mosquito uh, uh, this is uh, i'm uh, La- mosquito larval activity of tylopora indica aedes aegypti the, fir- uh, the first picture uh, live uh, larva 
the third instar larva ides aegypti the first one control the second one 6.125 ppm and the second one um, 12.5 ppm the third one 25 ppm the uh, finally 50 ppm uh, concentration different concentration i'm used please next please next uh, <clears throat> i am uh, different concentration used after um, lc50 and lc90 value by using uh, epa prop property analysis software please next okay sir. um please go to the result okay different crude extract like hexane chloroform and methanol uh, tested by uh, preliminary, preliminary phytochemical analysis uh, like alkaloid flavonoid terpenoids ste uh, steroids phenol thionines and saponides all the presented in the crude extract this next uh, this is uh, different uh, crude extract like uh, hexane chloroform and methanol a uh, different concentration i am used to third instar larva the chloroform and methanol comparison, the hexane, uh, very good activity. The LC50, 1.735. The LC90, 4.595. Next, please. Um, this is um, column chromatography packed after eluted 30 fractions. Uh, the best. Okay, sir. Thanks, sir. Please uh, go to summary. Okay. The crude extract obtained from hexane showed highest activity against the Aedes aegypti comparison with chloroform and methanol extract. In the phytochemical analysis of hexane chloroform and methanol extract of Tylopora indica, presence of alkaloids, flavonoids, terpenoids, steroids, phenol, saponoids, and thionides. Of the 30 fractions eluted in the column chromatography from the hexane extract, fraction number 6 showed highest activity in the mosquito larva cell activity to isolate the pure compound. Re uh, next, please. Reference uh, lost. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sir. It has not been worked out so far. Normally, these collectives are done for the plants. Okay, on sir. which so far, no work has been done. You have an idea what types of compounds are present. But this plant has been worked out very exhaustively for the past 50 years. Okay, sir. Okay. So, you would have given the list of names. Yes, sir. So you wasted your time there. Okay, sir. Actually, when the, uh, this plant, uh, many uh, work going, sir. But actually, uh, the larvae still work not going, sir. No, so I'm I'm not talking, talking about larvae still work. I'm talking about the characterization of the compounds. Okay, sir. You characterize the compounds, you know. First, you done the characters. Characters for steroid, pyramid. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it yes, the tannins, those oh, things. Oh, okay, okay, sir. This is a superfluous. So, okay, sir. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, in the thesis, at least be careful. Okay. You need not give all these things. Yeah, okay, sir. Thank you. What did you use for exerting control? You had different treatments based on the polarity and non-polarity. You used different organic solvents for making the plant extract. Okay, madam. And then you had run a biosay. Yes, madam. And there is a set of control. What did you use for control? Uh, madam, um, <clears throat> hexane, uh, different solvents uh, available, madam. Uh, polar... Uh, uh, low that, polar. That I get it. That I get. Okay, madam. But then you have a single control. So, what did the control have? Tempos, madam. Huh? Tempos, tempos. I don't get it. Tempos, madam. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. Comparison, madam. Control. 
control is laid only to have con uh, the comparison. But then there must be some solution in what which, is hmm, what is inside the solution? <laughs> you have kept a control, okay? I don't want to lead you into something. I just want to know what you did. See, you have exposed it to hexane at different, uh, hexane extract of the plant product at different concentration. Okay. And uh, methane, uh, methanol extract okay. and something else. Okay, and different concentration. So, the control had what? The what did you add? Control was water? No, control is What? Oh, it's a commercial standard. Okay. How do we know that the hexane is not harmful to your insects? Or methanol is not harmful to your insects? Yes, sir. A control should have that only. Yes, sir. Not uh, commercial standard. Commercial standard can be one of the treatments. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Uh, good morning, one and all. Uh, I'm Bhuvragam from University of Madras. Uh, I'm indeed delighted to share my work uh, entitled uh, A Human T cell Mitogenic and uh, Anti Inflammatory Galactin from uh, Rhinoceros Beetle, Varectus Rhinoceros, supported with uh, purification, characterization, and uh, de novo transcriptomics. Next slide, please. Uh, to brief about the lectins, uh, it is basically the carbohydrate binding proteins uh, uh, playing a predominant role in insect immune system. By recognizing the non-self mo recognizing the non-self molecules and thereby participating in the immune responses. Uh, for a lectin to be called as a galactin, uh, it should have uh, certain characteristic features. They are it should be able to bind uh, uh, beta galactoside sugars, and the activity should be independent of divalent cation. Uh, across the taxa, uh, uh, especially among the uh, insects and the mammalian systems. Uh, the functions of the lectins are highly comparable. Now, if at all I have to uh, uh, perform the functions of mammalian galactin in the mammalian system, uh, I would be facing problems like uh, uh, redundancy in the tissue cell expression and uh, target cell recognition, which is why uh, uh, a lower organism can pitch in and uh, provide a sophisticated understanding uh, that, can, that can be highly comparable to the mammalian system. Uh, in, now, insects from highly uh, challenging environment could be a better model to study, uh, uh, you know, uh, the potentiality of the lectins. Uh, now, which is why I have chosen uh, Varietes rhinoceros as a model, uh, where uh, exploring lectins from the system, uh, you know, uh, could unravel novelty, if any, in future that could be prospected in the applications. So, based on this brief uh, introduction, I have. Uh, Hypothesized that can lectin from Oracle rhinoceros be a mitogen? If yes, what are the immune cell types? Does it aid in proliferation? And how does it affect their inflammatory mechanisms? Uh, the objectives include uh, purification of galactin, elucidating its functional analysis, uh, uh, sequencing the transcriptome, and in silico modeling of transcripts and its docking to sugars. Uh, this is the life cycle. Uh, the uh, insects, the life cycle of insects includes uh, three instars of grub and uh, pupae and adult, and it belongs to Scarabidae family. Uh, the first chapter includes uh, purification and molecular characterization. 
Uh, for initially, I purified the lectin uh, using a lactose affinity column. The lectin was designated as uh, OR gal. The fractions that contain the uh, activity was uh, subjected to the electrophoresis, where uh, uh, we have achieved the purity in native page. Uh, native page and in SDS page, uh, the galactin was found to be heterotrimer with various subunit sizes. Uh, this galactin was specific to lactose as well as galactose. Uh, the specific activity was increased uh, up to 100 folds. And the purification uh, and the recovery from the crude protein uh, was about 88 uh, percentage. The molecular weight of this galactin was determined to be around 190 kDa, based, uh, determined using both uh, HPLC analysis and in ESI Q top MS. Uh, and the isoelectric points were uh, uh, 5, 7, 8 for the respective subunits in the 2D gel electrophoresis. Uh, upon profiling the amino acids, uh, it is found that glycine was higher in concentration. It is notable that glycine plays a major role in providing the anti-inflammatory effect for the protein. And we have subjected both purified uh, galactin as well as 50 kDa uh, uh, subunit of the galactin into the mass spectrometry, where which we have identified uh, various uh, mass by charge values by which we have uh, deduced the sequences, which had considerable homology to the proteins in the database, uh, like uh, beta galactoside binding lectin, mitogenic lectin, and galactins as well. So moving to the functional part, you know, if I have to uh, do the uh, mitogenic potential in the T cells and uh, monocytes, first I have to isolate the cells. So to do so, uh, first I have uh, isolated uh, uh, peripheral uh, uh, blood mononuclear cells from the healthy human blood based on the density gradient medium called lymphoprep. This whitish buffy coat was transferred to a magnetic based cell isolation kit where uh, employing a, a cocktail of antibody will remove the uh, will tag and uh, remove the uh, undesired cells towards the magnet and leaves untouched the uh, desired ones. So the surface markers for the uh, collected uh, lymphocytes uh, were confirmed using the flow cytometry using uh, uh, anti-CD4 and anti-CD19 antibodies. And the cells were uh, seemed to be viable uh, for 100 percentage in tripan under the trypan blue staining. Uh, in the mitogenic act the mitogenic acti activity was tested using MTTSA. Uh, in this, uh, the, t the tested concentrations of the galactin induced the proliferation of T cells uh, by 40 and 60 percentage in 24 hours and 48 hours of uh, uh, treatment period, whereas it didn't show any effect on B cells, as you can see. Uh, since it, it has showed uh, effect in T cells, we have competitively inhibited the uh, lactose to the galactin and check the activity. To our surprise, uh, we didn't find any activity, because, uh, which clearly explains that uh, the binding site of the lactose is highly essential uh, to uh, maintain this function. Uh, it is also highly, highly essential to monitor the levels of uh, cytokines during this mitogenic process in the T cell. So to do that, uh, we have used the flow cytometry using various anti-cytokine antibodies. The histograms were obtained. Uh, based on it, uh, the expressions were measured. Uh, here, the uh, interleukin-2 and interleukin-4, which is responsible for the T-cell growth as well as anti-inflammation, found to be upregulated. And uh, we didn't stop here. We also checked the uh, expressions levels in the monocyte, uh, human monocytic cell line, because the monocytes and uh, t lymphocytes uh, actually work hand in hand uh, in terms of inflammation. Uh, here, all the tested pro-inflammatory cytokines got reduced with, with its expression levels. So now the elevated expressions of uh, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, cytokine in the previous slide and the decreased expression here altogether conveys a message that uh, this galactin uh, impacts the uh, anti-inflammatory activity in the cells. Now, uh, upon uh, to know uh, the galactin, uh, what are the galactin transcripts that are responsible for forming the uh, you know production of galactin? Uh, I have uh, sequenced the transcriptome wherein which uh, uh, I've isolated RNA from uh, various tissues of uh, varietized rhinoceros and quantified. The integrity of RNA was checked uh, using a bioanalyzer profile where I have to load, the, uh, run, load and run the uh, you know, RNA in the chip-based uh, miniature electrophoresis. Uh, it was converted, uh, this RNA was converted into a cDNA library through various steps such as uh, post-strand cDNA synthesis, uh, end repair, uh, repair uh, mechanism, adapter ligation and polyethylene. Now, uh, I've identified many uh, transcripts around 17,000. Uh, 
uh, which were clustered and uh, removed with a redundant sequence, that numbers were around 8,000. And from that, the functional transcripts were around 4,000, which showed a matching to around 1 lakh genes in the database. Now, uh, we have scrutinized galactin alone from this uh, uh, genes, and then uh, found that PB3585 transcript and PB3817 were uh, you know, showing considerable matching to the galactin. We have modeled its structure in the uh, computationally and found uh, galactin domains in uh, uh, you know both the transcripts and uh, docked its uh, structure to the uh, uh, lactose and galactose sugars. And it, it, it is it is to surprise that we have found a good interaction with the lactose and galactose uh, as to that of experimental studies. So with that, I can confirm that galactin eight and galactin four uh, uh, is you know uh, contributes to the formation of uh, galactin. With that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. It's a beautifully crafted presentation. Thank you. But I have a very ignorant mm -hmm. question. Lectins are associated with interfering of insect digestion. And lot of those are actually plant lectins. Plant lectins. Yeah. This that is, is why we yeah. try to. Yeah. Here see, it is. Uh, uh, you have to bear with the ignorance. Mm. Let it complete itself. Hmm? Yeah. So the plant lectins are used in uh, genetic transformation studies as a method of control. Now, where are we going with this kind of study where you isolate a lectin from? Insect yeah, source. Insect source mm -hmm. and trying it on human cells. Yeah, because. Uh, uh, is it a model system? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Uh, and uh, why, why did I know that? Because, uh, no, uh, this insect particularly has to survive a long metamorphosis period. Okay. Where so it, are all the scarabids? Ma'am? All the scarabids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, uh, we have already uh, had a brief work in this. Uh, uh, you know, publishing uh, uh, reports on uh, lectins. So, with an extension, I've uh, you know uh, carried out the work. Uh, you know, uh, put I mean, projecting this model as a, a model. Uh, I mean, model organism. But there are so uh, many insects which are easily rareable. Yeah, but uh, since we have already done some work and uh, it no, is, they, you must have done that yeah. based on some logic. Yeah. The originator of this idea. Yeah. Why did they do it? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes ma'am. Uh, actually, I've explained that because uh, it lives in the highly uh, hostile environment, especially in the counting bin, constantly exposed to the microorganisms, where the immune system should have you know high potentiality to tackle the microorganisms, which is why you know uh, I've chosen uh, this model to study the immune system through this lectin. Anyway, you yeah. should uh, really bring more evidence for yeah. it. Okay. Thank you. Good presentation. Thank you. and co-chair and respected dignitaries over here. A very pleasant good morning to you all. I'm Ashish Kamal from US Bangalore. Today I have come to present about my topic, uh, effect of different dates of sowing uh, on, uh, on, the, on the incidence of pink bollworm. So the flow of presentation goes like this, introduction, material method, uh, results, discussion, and summary conclusion so the introduction so as as we know all uh, the main concept of uh, basic concepts of living comes to food cloth and shelter so uh, coming to the main point of view uh, when we take this cotton as a crop it is not only the uh, money fetching crop to the farmer but also it's a source of uh, it's it's a, it's a basic concept for the living purpose so if we take this cotton uh, we we have much more uh, scope in, in a scanty rainfall 
so where farmer could fetch more amount uh, with a good price so that uh, weather weather factors are very uh, negligible to this crop so coming to the cotton cotton is a cotton uh, scientifically called uh, called as a gossypium herbium it's an important commercial crop playing an important key role in economic aspect and uh, it is called it is also called as white gold uh, and hence it is called yes 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 next week next week yes yes so uh, the production uh, the 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 production is uh, 133 lakh bales uh, and with the 469 469.99 kilos uh, kgs of hectare uh, gujarat is the leading producer state of uh, cotton in the, in this cotton scenario next please so uh, the coming to the main aspect of pectinophora gossypiella it has acquired resistance during 2008 so why it has acquired the resistance? So because of uh, overall, uh, uh, the, because of the production, the overall uh, uh, continuous production and continuous uh, overall uh, sowing of the crop overall uh, year around. So it has fetched some uh, re resistance to the uh, to this uh, pest. And uh, this uh, this uh, the three there are we have three kinds of bollworms in uh, uh, cotton. One is American bollworm, Helicopa armigera, and uh, spotted bollworm, Irias vitella, and uh, pink bollworm, and Pectinogossipiella. Apart from these borers, we have sucking pests also, which has gained importance uh, after uh, after introduction of Bt crops. So, the next one is uh, to combat this bollworm uh, uh, boll boll uh, incidents. So, we have cry genes, which are cry, uh, cry, uh, cry genes, uh, which will affect the, the which will uh, act upon the microvilli of the insect gut. So uh, the cry cry one is delta endotoxin will act upon this microvilli of the insect gut. So the resistance to the pink bollworm uh, has uh, with the BT uh, with the introduction of uh, bollgard one and bollgard two. Uh, so coming to the next, it's not working. Next, please. Yeah, there are two major factors which have acquired resistance for this pink bollworm. So one is high selection pressure. So the, the, the other one is the availability of cotton uh, throughout the year as a result of an extended crop season. The multiplicity of var uh, variety, varieties and the sagged sowing is one of the uh, major uh, problem in this, which we are going to deal with the my result and discussion, and which provide a continuous supply of food for which has come uh, uh, supplied the food for pink bollworm. Next, please. So the pink bollworm, which is uh, which, if you could see the morphological characters. So this is an oligo uh, uh, oligophagous pest, and it, uh, the host range is around uh, uh, to the okra and hollyhock. And, and when coming to the damming stage, damaging stage, the damaging stage is the larva, and which is which will which will be looked as a pink, uh, um, creamish white the, during the early stages. And uh, coming, uh, the, when it grows on, it, it becomes somewhat pinkish in color. So that is why it is it is named as pink bollworm. So I uh, the other next please. So if you could see the morphological characters, this is the uh, late late instar larva, uh, which is pinkish in color, and the B, uh, the um, the picture B is the adult one, which 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 it has a fringed haze of hind wings. Next please. So the uh, the. Uh, Pupation site is around. Uh, uh, pupation site is in the flowers or in uh, or, or uh, in the unopened bolts at the tip uh, tip, uh, tip portion. Next, please. So damage symptoms are uh, larva enters the uh, uh, developing bowl uh, through the through the tip portion and feeds on the seeds uh, and move to adjacent locules by making holes in the uh, septum. Double uh, and we could see the major major aspect is double seed formation. We all we all can get the doubt that how how this double seed formation is happened. So the the larva makes the the larva gets two seeds to the, the together and uh, feeds uh, interlocularly and joins it to form a double seed formation. Next please. So this is the locule damage. We could see the locule hole in the locule uh, locule damage and the next next please. And this is the bowl open damage. And uh, if you could see the larva there. 
uh, it is somewhat creamish in color, which is the early instar larva. Next, please. So this is the early instar. Next. So coming to the main, uh, material and methods, uh, this research has been taken in uh, Chamras Nagar, KVK, Hardanahalli form, uh, around uh, uh, in Karib 2021. Next, please. The incidence of pink bollworm was studied by using popular cultivar pulley, uh, which is BT. And the seeds of the selected genotype was sown in a RBD method with a 12 treatments and three replications. Next, please. So these are the treatment details starting from the second fortnight of March, ending to the first fortnight of September. So there are overall 12 treatments which which was sown the in staggered form. Next, please. So this is the main uh, board of the treatment. Next, please. Uh, Next. So coming to the ANOVA, very, uh, ANOVA analysis. So uh, I have got the treatment significance uh, in uh, with using the VASP uh, 2.0 uh, software. Next, please. So coming to the main result and discussion, T4, uh, T4, which is the first uh, May, May 1st fortnight, uh, has been, has uh, fetched uh, highest yield of uh, 1600, uh, 1600 kgs with the lowest pink bollworm uh, count and uh, lowest locule damage and lowest uh, open bowl damage. So, if uh, the, this graph depicts that in the T4 uh, treatment, uh, lo lowest pink bowl, uh, lowest uh, uh, larval count with the highest yield around uh, 1638 kgs per hectare. Next. So, coming to the discussion part. So, this pest uh, uh, attacks the reproductive parts. So, it causes support around 80% of damage. Early cotton planting uh, has made uh, this uh, less low larval count. And uh, next, next please. Thank you. Conclusion. So conclusion. Um, as the, the dates of sowing has uh, gone uh, from a tip of. T4 variety, uh, T4 uh, treatment has uh, T4. This is the first fortnight of May, uh, which is uh, uh, around the first fortnight of May, has uh, got the lowest uh, pink ball worm count, pink ball worm count, and highest yield with the lowest uh, open ball damage and lowest uh, local damage. As the as the time advances from uh, first fortnight of May. It has increased uh, uh, larval count, ball damage, opal locule damage, and uh, less yield. So from T5, that is from T, uh, second fortnight of May to the first fortnight of September, it has increased. So the reason behind it is, so the uh, the reason behind it is because as the by the as the time advanced, uh, like from uh, from first fortnight, the bowls which uh, which uh, the pest resurgence, the, the pest development, uh, and the and this one now the dates of date of the sowing has uh, co collided so that the larva has development in the bowls oh ma'am uh, that means it has uh, sta sta uh, similar uh, the time which the, the sown the sowing time the uh, Bowls, uh, developed bowls. Hello. Ah, thank you. Uh, all, all people like you who do date of sowing experiment in different crops face a unique sort of disadvantage that whatever dates of sowing we try to judge on and when there is a natural dispersal of insects to and from our plots always there will be an influence of a particular date of planting being in a large area in the vicinity can dilute your uh, attack in your plots. So I'm just mentioning this as a caution. It has nothing to do with your methodology, but interpretation-wise, take that clue that 
it is not like what you have done is going to be repetitively same. It may not be. So just take that clue. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, respect uh, chairman, co chairman, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, one and all. So, I am going to present an important milestone work that we did in managing of the recently introduced invasive phase that is cassava millibug. So, the topic of my presentation is uh, cassava, uh, classical biological control of cassava millibug in India with introduction of the host specific parasitoid anagrase lopacy uh, from the way forward. Uh, next slide, please. So, because of the globalization and the free trade, India became victimized for many new invasives. So, next slide, please. Uh, if you just look into that one, we have every year we are just encountering new new invasives. The recent one is the cassava millibug. So, the cassava milli, uh, uh, millibug, the Pinococcus menahiti, is the recent introduction. So, which was first identified by uh, NBER from the samples which he received from the Kerala Agriculture University. Uh, the identity is established both morphologically as well as molecular. You just look at the images, how uh, the damages it has caused. Um, so, with regard to the uh, life stages, there are three stages, starting from egg, the larval instar, and also the adult stage. But however, the whatever I am just putting in the aromorph, which is indicated that is the highly mobile stage, but otherwise, the carry of this pest from field to flea is mainly be, uh, by the cuttings. So, that usually far more than for uh, planting. So, this is how the damage it has causes. So, this uh, sucking pest will try to accumulate in the terminal shoot. You can just see that. Uh, uh, then it will be just related into uh, sucking of the sap. It is making the uh, crop become a bunchy top. So, that's how you, the, the, you can just see the how much drastic havoc it was caused by the cassava millibug. So, this is how you just see if havoc really caused by these farmers because in Namakal and Salem district, the farmers mainly grows cassava cultivation mainly for the sago industry purpose. So, we are getting a lot of revenue out of this, which is totally hampered because of this invasive pest. Uh, this is how the damage is. So, this is how actually we have undertaken the surveillance program in the two important districts of Tamil Nadu, where is Salem and uh, the Namakal, where uh, this uh, uh, cassava is grown predominantly uh, as a cash crop for the uh, production of sago and other export related things. So, and we are also undertaking the survey till now also because it is an, uh, uh, we need an impact assessment studies for any classical biological control that we have been doing. So, this is how the surveillance program we do. Um, the damage assessment is mainly based on these aspects like percent infestation, uh, the uh, scale based on the bunchy top and the ba scale based on the number of millibucks present in the terminal shoot. So, um, um, this slide you can clearly explain. So, uh, for example, if this rate uh, score of 5, it indicates that it's highly uh, damaged. Similarly, in the case of uh, millibug of crossing 1000, it falls in that scale of 4. So, that's how we have just come across. This is the data which, uh, which was uh, done in the 2020. You just see the damage level, it was crossing about 80% in most of the Namakal areas. Uh, similarly, this is the um, uh, month, month basis, how the infestation is there. During the summer period, actually, the hot humid climate favors multiplication of the billy bug. So, you can just see the same thing from March, from May on to June onwards, the population buildup is more and uh, the infestation is built up is high. So, similarly, if you just look into all of the properly, um, I mean, the, the cultivatable varieties by the farmers, everything was affected. You just see the harvest index, it was drastically reduced from uh, well-known variety to the local varieties, you just see the uh, condition of a farmer. There is no tuber formation. So, otherwise, India is the number one in productivity of 23 tons. But because of this uh, pestid incidence, the farmers is getting now 3 tons only. So, that much drastic yield reducer of this millibuck. So, we have uh, certain active predators, but it is not taking that level. So, why? Because I am explaining these are the uh, thing you can just feed, uh, see the pre pre predominantly the predators presence we have occurred. So, one particular pest is that uh, uh, predator is the Hyprosmus mandroni, which is an important coccinid predator. Though we had found that important predator, but the level was um, uh, high. But even then, there was one particular problem. We just come across that uh, one important uh, 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 hyperparasitite. So, this hyperparasitite um, mainly as a hindrance, you can just see the person parasitation of hyperparasitite. 
So this demands actually we need to look for a classical biological control. So in this thing, so we had imported the uh, classical biological agent from Benin. So uh, whatever this is for the house information that uh, whatever you are seeing in the left, this is an import permit. So getting an import permit is not an easy job. We have to apply to DPPQS. So it has its road uh, set of procedures after that we have got and uh, luckily we have done everything in a systematic way. So we have uh, we have uh, granted with the import permit from two countries, Benin and Thailand. But however, we just received the samples of uh, insects from Benin only. Uh, this is uh, the, this slide explains you how that uh, in the first lot we were failed. Actually, due to long transit hours and of the COVID, we couldn't establish. But however, in the second lot, what we received, so we built up the culture and it was uh, very much very well established. So this is a state of art facilities in the country. Nowhere you will found. This is a quarantine for insects. Again, this is for the information of the house. Nowhere you will find the house. So nowhere find in the country because this is an important uh, work to be done by a bureau. This is a bureau mandate. So the purpose of this quarantine is whenever we are just importing any biocontrol agents, it has to be evaluated in the quarantine. For example, if imported biocontrol agent, if it is not doing the well, it is causing any deterioration. So it will be uh, completely, uh, I mean, uh, incinerated in the quarantine itself. The insect won't come out. So um, we have this is a part of a quarantine procedure mandatory protocol. So we need to undertake the biology. So biology studies also we have undertaken, and you just see that this is the longevity of the parasitoid is good. So it is a very ideal, very good parasitoid for uh, for uh, um, the control of the cassava mealybug because it is a host specific parasitoid, which is an important criteria for any biocontrol uh, program. Uh, this is how the male and female of the parasitoids can be distinguished. So just you can just see this is the female parasitoid how it is nicely parasitizing the cassava mealybug. So this is also an important study host specificities. For example, any biocontrol agents we are introducing that introduced biocontrol agents should not harm any other uh, thing. So we have undertaken this host specificity studies with other mealybugs other than cassava mealybugs. We found that it is very safe. It is not doing any parasitization on the other mealybugs other than the target host. So this is how uh, the, we have undertaken the test in our laboratory in the different uh, mealybug against its host and um, safety of uh, biocontrol uh, imported biocontrol agents again non-target is also important. For example, whatever I am taking an, uh, an biocontrol agent, it should not become a pest in the future. So it has to undergo this, this, uh, this mandatory set of protocols and we just done with the uh, highly useful insects starting from honeybees, lack insects and also the commonly occurring parasitoids and predators like um, all the commonly available predators also we have undertaken. So in this test, we should found and ascertain that whatever the parasitize, it should not create any harmful to the existing. Then only it will pass this test. So apart from that, we also received the um, uh, consignments which we have to go for a microbial examination because sometimes there, there may be a chances we may be intercepted with the micro hubs, microorganism that may be a harmful in future. So that and also we have taken care and everything it was passed. So then um, we also standardize the next step simultaneously. We need to standardize the protection protocol in our country. So we did both uh, field as well as uh, large scale setup. And also we have undergone a pro-trade technique. This is very easy for the farmers to um, uh, adapt and do it. So we have standardized this protocol also. Next important procedure is to get the field release permit. So whatever the documents, dossiers, we have the safety test. We have to again submit to the government of India and we have to obtain this permit release, then only it goes for the field risk. So for example, if any host specificity fails, so it will be uh, buried in the incinerator itself. So uh, this is the first field freeze program which we undertaken, uh, which was undertaken during the last month. So top officials from bureau, different directors, the government officials, state department officials have participated in this program. Um, and uh, so the way forward actually. So now the parasitide is released. So we were trying to establish uh, the link with the KVK so that the parasites will be produced in the block level and will be supplied to the farmers on gratis basis. And similarly, we are also encouraging the farmers to go uh, like uh, in-situ multiplication of this parasitite. And the other important problem, uh, what we forward is actually there is a complex of mealybug. So in the cassava itself, we are just coming across papaya mealybug and cassava mealybug because of the host specificity and the thing, so it is not taking a major problem. For example, in the same field, you just see Anagoras lopus is parasitizing cassava mealybug and similarly, um, Acerophagus papaya and papaya mealybug. 
So uh, we are also sensitizing uh, the farmers with various uh, uh, brochures. So uh, I hope uh, we are uh, we are going to witness a one more classical biological control agent. This is a milestone in a classical biological control of India. So we will be seeing this condition present to the future with a good bumper yield by using the uh, classical biological control program. Just click, 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 please. No, no, click that one. Play, play. So this is how it is parasitizing. Just a few seconds video only. This is. So this is the parasitite. It actually searches its host. That is nothing but the cassava miliba. So it is actively searching to lay its egg. You just see how it is parasitizing. So that way it is um, killing the pest. So this is a mummified. So instead of uh, again becoming into a mealybug, you will get in the 18 days this kind of parasite. That way we were eradicating the mealybug population. Thank you. Big effort. Good work. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to know what was the consistent parasitization efficacy? With the field, madam, you have mean to say? No. Okay. In the laboratory, in the insect tree, or in the pot culture studies? No, madam. In, in the, the laboratory, uh, we had uh, given different host density of cassava millibug, and we have just released our uh, parasitide, and we could envisage uh, parasitization up to uh, the range of fall from uh, 25 to even 50%. 25 to 50%. 50 it is again uh, depend cake. upon the host density. For example, we have given like uh, that and I have not given here. For no, example, maximum provide percent efficacy maximum was percentage is 50, 50, 50 above. Inside the cage. Yes, madam. In the laboratory condition. In the laboratory. In pot culture? Uh, that's what. Uh, uh, we did that only. I mean to say the pot culture, I'm telling. What we will do, actually, we have uh, no, no, taken. No, no. In the grown of plants under caged conditions, have you done this or in test tubes you have done this? No, madam. We have done in the um, insect breeding dish wherein we have utilized one water leaf plant is there. So that is an um, uh, that uh, that is an host plant, but it is not affecting uh, any uh, cassava mealybug as such in the field condition. Okay. In, the, in, the in that water leaf, because it was too turgid maintain, what we have to we have to cut the leaf and we have just released mealybug one day before for settling. So in that, we have released the parasitate and we have worked out the person parasitization. It's a spoon feeding. Method. Yes, madam. Yes. Okay. But you have not conducted any pot culture. Study. No, no. Pot culture, uh, with as such in the plant, we have not done. So we have uh, used the leaf detachment method and we have done that. Way. So the preliminary trials in the farmer's field also. Yes, you, madam. You have not done. No, don't. Because we have just released. So we will be taking the data in the coming week, actually. Because last month only we have done. So already uh, we will be just taking that type of experiments in the decos. Thank you. Good afternoon. Sati Murthy, Government Arts College, Nandanam. My property comes uh, economic importance of parasitic and organic free business and their efficient utilization. Introduction Network. The pest control is uh, one of the most significant crop uh, roadblocks increasing agriculture copy, uh, crop yields. Each year, India loses roughly 30 30 percent of its uh, crop. Biopesticides, the the efficient of the bio biotic compound uh, serve the role of pesticide is called bio biopesticides. Next slide. Uh, for the following reasons, biopesticides are recommended over chemical pesticides. Uh, no worries, no hazardous residues, precious beneficial. It, yes. 
Ah, no next message. This one. Precious beneficial creatures. Growth of natural enemies. Environment friendly. Cost effective. Uh, first and second uh, line of defense of IPM. Next slide. They are still better at alternative or parasitic. They are a group of organisms host, host life and close association with the host at the host experience expenses evolutionary decline the population. Endoparasitism, ectoparasitism, hyperparasitism. Presoperlock RNA, uh, stored grain paste, adult, adult nectar pollen, and uh, aphid, uh, whereas larval eat aphids. Uh, control larval pest in pulses, vegetables, and fruits. Next. Trichogramma, it's uh, the parasite. It's used for control of sugar can. Yearly short, short borer, bollworms cut of cartons, sperm stone borer. Next slide. Cryptolemus montrosedi, ladybird, ladybird beetle. Important predator, mellybug, dismicocus, neopri vibes. Next. Study area and outcomes. Cryptolemus montrosiri is not the origin of India, but it, but it has high high economic value when applied on the large scale. This insect don't fly for far distance, which which is a major advantage as minimize extra expenses expenses. But the adult uh, adult and you grabs at all stages feed on millibugs. In India, late September to March is a feasible time to release them in the field, as it is two main significance, which is included reason for fruit trees, brinjal, tomato, ladyfinger, citrus varieties, and especially hibiscus. We are trying to we are trying to bring out possible methods to culture and maintain these bugs for bugs for practical application in the field biopesticide. Next slide. Essential character of air. effective biocontrol agents, speed, speed mortality, longevity, environmental tolerance, mode of action. As per reported by Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, bioagent efficacy of pest control. Trico, trichogamma 60 to 90%, Cryptomas 100%. Next slide. Conclusion. Uh, this pesticide are more compatible with the other bi biological control agents and serve an important role in reducing the number of pests that serve in the next generation. This is a predator. Parasites are effective host searching finding host even when pest population are low and therefore identify contributing to economic uh, upliftment by playing and on the spot and vital role in agriculture productivities. Thank you. Sir, I'm, I'm recently starting my work. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. After covering everything, I would at least take one minute to say the critical knowledge gaps which require to be addressed. Maybe next time when you do, you can attempt it. Because the review is possible by anyone sitting on the desk. But what is useful to the audience is, okay, I have reviewed. I think these are the gaps. Somebody can pick it up. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Good afternoon to one and all present here, respected dignitaries and participants from various institutes. I'm Divya Sundari from Gurnana College. Uh, my presentation is on the topic Ficus bengalensis, prop roots against mosquito larvae. So Ficus bengalensis belongs to the family Moraceae. The common name for this tree is banyan tree and it's called alamaram in Tamil. Uh, all the parts of the trees, like leaves, fruits, and barks, are used in various traditional pra medicinal practices like Yunani, Ayurveda, and Siddha. Uh, the significant feature of this tree is that it has prop roots. So, what are prop roots? Prop roots are nothing but adventitious, modified adventitious roots. Uh, they grow downwards from the aerial branches towards the soil. Uh, they provide with mechanical support to the tree. Due to the presence of these roots, the tree can survive for more than 100 years. I collected the plant material from my college campus, Gurana College, Chennai. The plant material was shade dried and coarsely powdered in a shredder. Extract preparation. About 10 gram of the prop, prop root powder was added to 100 ml of solvents. The solvents I, we used were chlorophyll is to methanol, ethanol and hexane. Uh, it was allowed to soak for 48 hours and then filtered and used for further study. Uh, the mosquito larvae we used were of two types, Aedes aegypti and uh, Culex cuncufasciatus. The first type is Aedes aegypti. These mosquitoes usually spread yellow fever virus, yellow fever and uh, dengue. Uh, we can easily identify these mosquitoes from other mosquitoes by their dark colored body and white patches present on their thorax region. The female mosquitoes are usually longer than the male mosquitoes. The second one is Culex cuncufasciatus. These mosquitoes spread dengue, uh, sorry, malaria. Uh, these are usually grayish or yellowish in color. Uh, we can easily identify these mosquitoes by their resting position. These mosquitoes sit on a surface parallel, parallel to the surface. So we uh, maintain the larvae according to WHO protocol. Uh, we use both instar larval stage. We fed the larvae, larvae by uh, using uh, yeast and dog biscuit in 1 is to 1 ratio. These are the fourth instar larvae stages of the larvae. Larvicidal bioassay. Uh, the plant extract were added dissolved in 10 microliters of DMSO, dimethyl sulfur oxide. The larvicidal activity were then observed for 24 and 48 hours. Then the mortality rate was uh, calculated using the formula. LC50 or the lethal concentration is the plant extract that showed 50% mortality rate. The observation were recorded in a tabular column after 24 and 48 hours. These are the observations we've made. Uh, we got the results that mortality rate of Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti was high in uh, extract with solvent chlorophyll is to methanol, that is 91.18 percentage. And the mortality rate of Culex cuncufasciatus was 95.11 percentage in the hexane extract. It was concluded that uh, prop root extracts were promising candidate for against uh, mosquito larvicide, uh, in addition to its other medicinal properties. Thank you. Sorry, sir. What are the plant compounds, types of compounds isolated from this plant TRD that you should have given a list? 
So we haven't uh, done a, that study. So this is a very pre preliminary level of study. We haven't extracted. No, no, I'm telling literature survey. When you do literature survey, you know, sir. Uh, on plant this one, ficus bengal and says, yes, sir. Uh, from this top to down, what are the what are the compounds isolated previously? You would have given a Sorry. list. Uh, so that you know you can narrow it down. Yes, sir. From here itself, you would have narrowed down. Probably this one of these compounds might have been active. Yes, sir. Okay, because you pinpointed particular uh, fraction. Yes, sir. Is it not? Floor form methanol one uh, nine one is one. Yes, sir. 91.1% hmm? you have shown. Yes, sir. So you do narrow down that one. Yes. Sir. Okay. I'll work on it. Sir. Okay. Thank you. Could you go to the last slide for a minute? The one which you distinguished. Uh, the two species of mosquitoes for different sources of uh, solvents. Yes, sir. Oh. Okay. You found a big difference between the two genera of mosquitoes. Yes, sir. The solvent system, which was most effective for the same ficus, was yes. not appropriate at all for the other genus. Yes, sir. What is your explanation? Uh, to me, both are mosquitoes. Yes, sir. Right? Maybe it's because of yeah. their di different... Dexane versus chloroform methanol, at least as uh, the chairman, uh, co-chair was leading you to, yes, sir. at least you could have checked chloroform methanol as a solvent for the same ficus, what sort of group of compounds it might have been more efficient, at least inference, if not proof, yes, sir. compared with hexane. So the, such a hypothesis, at least you could evolve yes, before sir. moving further. Yes, sir. I'll Thank work you. on it, sir. Thank, Thank you. you sir. Sorry, sir. Why you are using chloroform methanol in your company, sir? Uh, when we used Rather it separately, we didn't get any uh, clear-cut results, sir. So we used it in a uh, formal. That is the actual question. Oh, sir. So we, we are still doing research on this, whether we can be in, it can be implemented in uh, daily uses. Mm. I, I think it's uh, applicable, sir, because it's bio, we can use it as a biopesticide because ficus bengalensis is uh, available, available in every part of India. We can easily extract and this can be used in uh, paddy fields also where Culex is, uh, Culex uh, mosquitoes breed. So it can be used, sir. So from the angle of biopesticide only you are working on, or from because it is a very promising one, yes, as sir. you are rightly telling. So can it extend it for human trials or something? Not possible. I'm not sure, sir. Sorry, sir. No, just actually ask. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Like yes. Are you sure? It's one basic thing, no? You made one mistake here. See, everyone knows the vector for uh, the malaria is anophilus, yes. but here it's given Culex. Yes. So why? This, this mosquito also causes uh, malaria. Uh, there are but, three types of malaria. Yes. Uh, this mosquito causes particular type of malaria. Yes, but you didn't mention that in the slide. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, A very good afternoon to one and all present here. I'm Mahalakshmi from Etiraj College for Women. I'm here to present my paper entitled 
in silico studies on bioactive compounds derived from melia species against helicovespa armigera insect pest coming to the introduction Meliaceous nematodes have been gained much more importance in agricultural application as it possesses a strong pe pesticidal and antifeedant activity against a wide range of insect pests. Melia, which belongs to the family Meliaceae, which includes 51 genera and 575 species, and it is a native to South of Asia. Later, it has been introduced to South Africa, Australia, and South of Europe. The principal phytochemical group present in Melia it is limonoid. It is known to induce a uh, self carcinogenesis in insect pests, and also it known to inhibit the Glutathione S yes, transferase activity against a broad range of insect pests, and uh, in silico molecular docking studies have been carried out to check the pesticidal efficacy of the ligand obtained from Melia species to bound to an active site of the protein molecule to form a stable structure. Helicoverpa armigera is a polyphagous pest which is left of Lepidoptera noctidae pest. It can feed on wide range of agricultural and cultivated crops, and it has recently developed resistance against wide range of chemical synthetic pests. These are the different species of Melia. Coming to the objectives of the study, to study the bioactive compounds efficacy obtained from the fruit samples of Melia species can be collected from the selected geographic location and to check the efficacy of the pesticide property of the ligand obtained from Melia species through GCMS analysis using in silico molecular studies. Coming to the significance of the study, in silico molecular docking studies have been carried out using uh, version 4.2.6 water dock version to check the pesticide efficacy of the ligand obtained from Melia species which are docked against the target insect protein to check the pesticide efficacy which does not cause any adverse effect on both biotic and abiotic environment whereas in chemical pesticide it, it may be the chemical remnants may be present in the soil which gives a deleterious effect to both biotic and as well as abiotic environment. Hence, the biopesticidal property of the Melia, which has been used in cultivated as well as a wild species, which, uh, which we can get a healthy, disease free crops, and we can also, by this, we can also increase the fertility of the soil. And from the results obtained from molecular docking studies, we can, it has to be further carried out to field study and wet lab studies. Coming to the materials and methods. The phytochemical analysis of fruit samples of Melia was done using qualitative and quantitative analysis and it was followed by the characterization of studies GCMS analysis. These are the steps involved in GCMS analysis. Then coming to the in silico molecular docking studies. Here the target protein which I have selected was 1GQG which is taken from protein data bank which is a target protein of obtained from Helicoverba or Mijera GFS and the bioactive compound uh, Melia tenin, which was taken from family of Meliaceae species, and uh, that is Aldigar, which is a chemical pesticide which was docked against the same protein. Coming to the results and discussion, the qualitative analysis of the fruit samples of Melia species had revealed various kinds of primary and secondary metabolites. We have chosen five different solvents. The solvents were chosen based upon the polarity and the concentration used were 1 is to 10 ratio. And the compounds uh, among the different compounds obtained, terpenoids was found to possess a strong pesticidal and antifeedant activity against a wide range of insect pests. Coming to the uh, estimation analysis, among the five different solvents used, methanol and aquas have given a very good results, hence that alone have taken for the quantification studies. From the five different uh, secondary metabolites quantified, terpenoids, as I told, terpenoids was found to be maximum among the fruit samples of Melia species. Hence, terpenoids, uh, it has clearly seen that it uh, exhibits a strong antifeedant activity against a wide range of insects with as the acid of helicoverpa armigera as a polyphagous pest. It can feed some wide range of cultivated as well as a wild color species. Coming to the results of spectrum of the GCMS analysis, these are the major bioactive limonoids which are taken from, which was found from Melia species, which include Melia tenin, Melia non, Melia non, Melia sin, Melia carbine, and Melia tren, according to the literature Sharma and Paul 2013. These are the tabular representation of the GCMS analysis. Among the different bioactive compounds obtained from GCMS analysis, Melia tenin was found to be show more peak area percent, so that alone have taken for the in silico molecular adapting studies. Here, the protein uh, molecule, three dimensional protein molecule, was taken from. PDB, 
the pdp id was 1g qg 1j qg available structure can be processed and it, it must be biologically active and stable this is the whole protein structure in pyrimole and this is the ligand from melia species and this is the ligand from the chemical biosynthetic pesticide coming to the ligand preparation ligand uh, it was taken from pubchem or if you are okay, if you are okay with drawing you can also draw using a tool like chem sketch and ligand uh, selected for the study from biomolecule was melatonin and synthetic was aldigar this is the interacted image of both same protein against melatonin and uh, aldigar coming to the results of uh, in silico molecular docking studies here the bioactive compound which was docked against uh, target protein which is 1jqg was showed a prominent uh, binding score scoring so hence it can uh, possess a strong pesticidal activity against a target pest insect coming to the adverse effects of chemical synthetic pesticide aldigar contaminated vegetables as well as fruits was found to uh, react with uh, many other diseases like bradycardia hypotension nausea vomiting loss of coordination etc <laughs> which comes under the group of carbamate uh, type of pesticides it's highly deleterious when it is compared with other uh, chemical pesticides hence it may also give uh, hazardous uh, problems to both biotic as well as abiotic environment when it is mixed with water it will become a big problem for the birds as well as the aquatic organisms and when it is mixed with uh, soil it will get oxidized by the soil and organism hence it can be turned as sulfoxide and sulfone it is otherwise called as neurotoxin which impairs the normal brain development in the young children significance of the natural biopesticide natural biopesticide that which does not cause any adverse coming to the conclusion the present study has revealed that the melia species is a promising organic potential biopesticide which was taken from which exposes a various kinds of different secondary metabolites can be effectively used against various kinds of insect pests hence uh, there is an extensive cultivation using melia species can be the ex potential source and it can be also used as a efficient raw material for the various formulations of biopesticide industries hence it is of clear evidence that melia species can be recommended as a efficient source and it can be utilized again wide range of insect pests thank you good So, have you isolated the compound? No, Take no. Extract. You are not taking no, the no, extract. No, 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 sir. But you have shown that table. These are the, the solvents we used to isolate the compound. I have done qualitative and quantitative analysis, and I have characterized using GCMS analysis. Okay, straight away going to new GCMS yes, analysis. Yes, yes. Okay, what are the? I uh, wish you have shown four plants. You know, four species. Yeah, four species. All the four species you have taken? No. Huh? I have taken only Melia azidrac. that you are not shown you have shown only two species of melia you should have mentioned which anatomical part you have taken leaf huh? or flower or root fruit fruit samples of melia all species. fruits only no you sir only uh. from azidrac what only from melia azidrac oh okay another one what is another melia species you have taken no i did not work with that species sir no no for gcms for gcms i have taken fruit samples sir fruit sample from the same melia azidrac species melia azidrac mm. and there another one only one species only yes, you take yes yes but you mentioned two in the slide you slight arrangements are not in order huh? you are showing the effect of adverse effect of uh, synthetic uh, pesticides at the end you should have shown in the beginning hmm? to justify your work right okay sir huh? and you should be very clear these are the lab work you have done these are the in silico work you have done you are combining both hmm? just go through uh, go home and then go through again okay sir huh? the person should be very clear to others huh? okay. a lot of hard, hard work has gone into the preparation when you presenting the text i appreciate it there was never a moment of pause or uh, suspicion of your clarity is aldigar available ma'am actually aldigar is highly deleterious chemical pesticide ma'am since it is banned in few countries few yes uh, ma'am it has been partially banned in many partially 
Yes, ma'am, many countries. It isn't available anymore. And it is a miraculous pesticide. Okay, you need to know the history before dumping something, right? That time, that methodology, that cure. As times evolve, when we get more advantageous solutions, we leave the original ones, but we do not decry them or demean them. The only reason that you have brought the aldicarb into the picture is it has got lesser binding ability than your supposed miraculous another new invention. Yet another person will come to say how it is interfering with the metabolism of human beings. That is another uh, another story, another day. Okay. Okay. And you simply cannot bring in and to compare a so-called harmful chemical to glorify your invention. If you want, you can compare another uh, phyto product to say how this is better and how easily it can be isolated or produced. The quantum of uh, the chemical that is needed for effective control may need millions of trees. Yes, ma'am. You know, another synthetic uh, uh, laboratory mimic only is going to rescue the situation. So, play the drums a little slowly. Okay. okay. Thank you. There are two points. One is, why did you take up uh, molecular docking studies for uh, insecticide activity? What is the reason? Sir, it has to be taken for uh, wet lab studies and field studies in coming years, sir. No. I have just started like as a preliminary study, so I want to check the efficacy of the paraphyto compound obtained from milia species. No, no, how it, is, so, how it is going to be more, more effective than the normal studies, molecular docking studies, because you were focused on, and of course, as, uh, you didn't isolate any compound from this? Terpenoids, you didn't isolate any compound? No, no, sir, not uh, yet. So you, you did a terpenoid about the compound may be a mixture. So molecular docking study, how will you say a mixture is different from a pure compound? Because normally molecular docking studies are done for pure compounds. So if you do it for a mixture, how are you going to report yes, it? need to isolate, yes, sir. No, I'm talking about molecular docking studies for mixtures. How are you going to interrupt it over a pure compound? See. Sir, molecular docking studies have done to check the efficacy of the compound only, sir. I need to take it for the further studies. I am not a confer like I could not come uh, able to conclude with the molecular docking studies itself. Is there any compound reported from this? Any uh, already reported? Already, no, no. I'm talking about already reported terpenoid from this uh, species. I mean, from this compound, uh, from this plant material. Yes, sir. Against what? What is activity? what is the what is the terpenoid has been reported already? Any idea you know? I mean, did you do any literature survey? That's yes, sir. Million one was already rep reported, sir, against pesticide activity. You guess or it is? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'm just studying because uh, because what is the reason? I have done, sir. I have seen a million one and milia sin, sir, already in literature. Not milia ten. Thank you. Good afternoon all. I am Sangeeta S., a PhD scholar from Etraj College for Women. I am going to present my research work entitled Bioactive Potential of Secondary Metabolites from Superior Germplasm of Azadiracta Indica against Polyphagous Pest, Podophyra Litura. Okay. Uh, we all know that pests and disease are the two important threats for human civilization. Most of the developing countries have reported that the food grain loss is due to pest infestation. Podophyra litura is a polyphagous pest causing multiple loss to even food and cash crops. And in order to control, so many works have been done so far in order to control the use of, uh, control the pests. And synthetic pesticides have been applied in large amounts. Due to the fatal effects of synthetic pesticides, botanical pesticides are in great demand in recent days due to its target specific nature and biodegradability. 
it was reported that over 2400 plants possess insecticidal properties okay but neem holds a strong place in offering highly effective biopesticides okay why neem as a biopesticide since antiquity um, azadiracta has been uh, declared as one of the most promising uh, tree of 21st century for its therapeutic value pest management and environmental production and the seeds of azadiracta can indica contain rich source of limonoids and azadiractin is a principal compound of neem which has been uh, deeply studied for its uh, therapeutic value as well as antifeedant activities and the origin of research problem is that due to overpopulation we need to feed uh, feed food and uh, to meet the economic needs we used to apply a lot of synthetic pesticides to environment but on the other side it leads to a lot of health issues and uh, it supply toxic food so to uh, apply toxic free food biopesticides or botanical pesticides came into use and neem holds a strong place in offering non toxic easily available less expensive and safeguards the beneficial microorganism which also reduces the resistance in pests and controls environmental pollution and the objective of the study is to identify the plus trees for collection of fruits from various geographical locations of tamil nadu and to quantify its terpenoid content and next is to evaluate and check the potency of the phytocompounds from the azadiracta indica seed against the target pest by inhibiting the alpha amylase enzyme of the insect using in silico studies insects rely on in alpha amylase enzyme for its development and survival Inhibition of this enzyme regulates various physiological process in insects, which is chosen as a target for the uh, control of pests. And the materials and methods: survey of natural populations of neem were carried out for the selection of plus tree for collection of neem fruits from various geographical locations of Tamil Nadu. The quantitative phytochemical analysis was carried out using standard procedures for methanol and aqueous uh, seed extracts in the ratio one is to ten. And the quantitative estimation of terpenoid was carried out using Ferguson's method for all the samples collected from various locations. And next, to check its terpenoid efficacy, the potency of the individual limonoids were assessed using in silico studies. And this is the protocol for uh, docking studies. First is the preparation of ligands. The ligands were uh, retrieved from PubChem database, and similarly, the existing chemical pesticides were also retrieved. And the sequence of target protein was retrieved from NCBI, and it was submitted to Swiss model for generation of its 3D structure. After these preparations, docking studies were carried out using uh, standard parameters, and the outpath was set. set and to uh, view its uh, best docking force and the docking energy and its binding interaction, BioVia Discovery Studio was used. And these are the structures of ligands from neem seeds, that is, the zadiractin, selenin, and nimbin. And next is the target protein. Uh, these compounds targeted against the alpha amylase protein of Sporoptera litura. And these are the structures of uh, synthetic pesticides. That is indozecap, flubendiamide, and pyrethroid. And results and discussion: uh, 52 plus trees were identified uh, based on the morphometric parameters, and the fruits were collected during the month of June to August 21. And the seeds were processed immediately from the collected fruits for phytochemical screening and further uh, characterization studies. Uh, the qualitative phytochemical analysis of both the extracts revealed the presence of various phytocompounds such as alkaloids, phenolic compounds, flavonoids, terpenoids, and steroids, saponins, proteins, etc. But the terpenoid showed strong presence, and terpenoid uh, neem is known for its terpenoid content, and it possesses a lot of biological activities such as antimicrobial, antifeedant, antioxidant, etc. And these are the estimation of terpenoids, and quantitative estimation was carried out for all the samples, which revealed significant variation in the terpenoid content between the samples collected. And irrespective of the extract, uh, almost all the samples falls in the category of 80 to 90 percent, but only few samples falls in the category of 90 to 100 percent. So the screening and selection of such potential seeds, which contain 90 to 100 percent terpenoid content, should be used for further isolation of azadiractin, which is one of the uh, need of the chemical in a uh, biopesticide industry. So, in such a case, this estimation of terpenoid content uh, will be helpful in selecting the potential germplasm. And the limonoids, the docked images, that is azadiractin, selenin, and nimbin, has docked against the target alpha amylase, and the docking scores reveal that. Zadiractin was higher than all the standards against the target, whereas selenin was uh, against was higher against all the standards except Indozeca. And nimbin showed lower docking score against the target than the other two limonoids because nimbin plays a major role in pharmaceutical industries. And these are the docking scores of all the phytocompounds and the synthetic pesticides against the target. Uh, from the results and the docking scores and the docking energy, it was evident that zadiractin and selenin were in good fit with the target. In three dimensional space to inhibit the activity of protein, which is responsible for uh, insect survival and development, that is alpha amylase. And these are the docked images of uh, uh, phytocompounds against the target protein. 
uh, in the individual docked images and and these are the docked images of synthetic pesticide against the target alpha amylase is a major digestive enzyme of sporoptera litura amylase is secreted in the midgut which is partly recovered from the residual of undigested food through endoectoperitrophic circulation and it's also be, already been reported that secondary metabolites has the potential to play as a amylase alpha amylase inhibitors which can be used as an alternative strategy for insect control the reduction of this enzyme activity is due to cytotoxic effect of phytocompounds on epithelial cells of midgut which synthesizes the alpha amylase enzyme and uh, the previous study strongly says that neem seed possesses strong antifeedant action against the insect pests due to the presence of azadiractin uh, here i want to stress out that azadiractin is the most active limonoid in neem other limonoid also plays an important role in insect pests the inclusion of non azar constituents of neem may lead to utilization in integrated pest management and it's also been evident in some of the that is potato aphid develop resistance to pure azadiractin but not to a neem seed extract which contain additional limonoids and uh, selenin and azadiractin possess strong antifeedant activity by blocking sugar receptor cells affects growth molting and reproduction and it also delays molting therefore uh, uh, already uh, enough literature ha has been given in azadiractin and selenin and its antifeedant potential individually so the appropriate combination of azadiractin and selenin in the insect diet can provide insect growth regulation activity with increased efficacy against sporoptera litura okay to conclude my work by uh, to conclude my work by saying that the limonoids has the potential to inhibit the alpha amylase enzyme of sporoptera litura which is essential for insect survival and the synergistic activity will play a major role that is azadiractin and selenin could act as a potential amylase inhibitors and uh, one minute finally i'll conclude sir and we all know that uh, various neem products have been used uh, uh, in all the and we, in, in neem possess various end products so the use of neem has been uh, from past we are using various neem products as well in uh, pesticide industry and agricultural industry so the selection of potential germplasm for the end products is very important in recent days because neem resources are uh, completely exploiting and we don't and so far uh, i didn't find any uh, commercial cultivation of neem so such commercial cultivation of neem using the potential germplasm will benefit the pesticide industry as well as the pharmaceutical industries and this study would, and uh, the commercial cultivation can be done using government and non governmental organization which have social impact in environmental monitoring and this study would lay the groundwork for the development of formulations using phytocompounds from superior germplasm of neem in integrated pest management system for sustainable utilization which will positively reflect on agriculture human health ecosystem management and to minimize environmental problems caused by synthetic pesticides thank you yes, only lemonoids reported so far from neem yes, because sir. you made a little survey are you just uh, azadi rectin uh, selenin and nimbin you are done yes, so how many are there Roughly. majorly uh, the limnoids there are so far uh, the major uh, limnoids which are present in neem are about 5 uh, to 7 azadiractin nimbin selenin gadinin and so far and mostly uh, the neem is also important for uh, uh, flavonoid class of phytocompounds so no, the, no, i'm asking only limnoids uh, limnoids uh, the major uh, well studied and well characterized limnoids are about 5 to 6 uh, no no more than that yes you have to so do the thorough literature more than 25 30 limnoids okay. are reported from it. from different anatomical parts okay i'm okay. just talking about just check the literature hmm. huh? we since you are doing the work in eliminates you know you should be thorough with that part okay okay why did you conclude that there is a synergism among the limonoids ma'am you had uh, given in conclusion that due to the synergistic uh, activity of limonoids they will act as amylase inhibitors how do you know It is just no, no, I mean, uh, actually, uh, uh, literature has been given. Azadiractin and selenin uh, individually uh, gives um, activity uh, based on the docking score. The when compared to standards, uh, that is the control, azadiractin and selenin gave good docking score and good binding effect. So, in future, the isolation of those phytocompounds uh, can no, be. No, 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 that does not have to lead to synergistic activity. Okay. See, these are all highly technical terms. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, sir. Plus three is that uh, the potential jump lag also. Okay, okay, I'll check it. 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 That's why I collected the samples from various geographical And in how many different Okay. In, uh, that we are not showing the variation. Actually, it is that way. Some of the kinds of the English stories, which are not there. Then uh, concentrated on other things, only in a certain part we concentrate. Yes. Yes. Variation is not very. Yes, the variation is there. Variation is not there. Seeds from June, July, August from the same tree, you will find big variations due to the climate, rainfall, etc. So don't jump to conclusions because we are dealing with germplasm versus interaction with the environment. Right? So do it very carefully. No, we have about leave. I think if you are going through the literature, more than 80 compounds, phyto compounds have been isolated. You know about it? It's a large number of Nimbin, compounds. nimbidin, so many compounds. So among these, you have selected only these two. What is the reason? Uh, because uh, already in uh, most of the, the, back to the literature, azadiractin and selenin show strong antifidin activity. That's why I selected. Because even I mean, in azadiractin, large number of phyto derivatives you have know, been present. You know, there is a compound called nimbin, nimbidin. Yes, you heard about nimbicin. it? Have you... Mm -hmm. Do you ah. know that uh, activity has been analyzed on this? Yes, sir. In what way it is different from that? Because uh, it is present in large amount when compared to those compounds, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the organizing committee, I thank the chair and the co-chair of this session, Dr. N. Geeta and Dr. E. Sukumar for evaluating the scientific deliberations in this session. We will now disperse for lunch to the Loyola Mess. Same place, yes. This is for all the participants. Kindly note, kindly sign the attendance sheet at the registration table before or after lunch. Kindly sign the attendance sheet. And we will have to assemble back in the same place by 1.45. There will be a talk starting by 2 o'clock. So kindly assemble in the same place by 1.45.
Kanna ungal da.
Ambe, Ambe, Chief is told that one person, boy, chill, mood. Ah, one father, father, that our colleague put it there, guy. Yes, you put it. Yes, you put it. Yes, you put it. Yes,
the session will be starting in another five minutes.
I'm going to begin uh, with another two minutes. Are people are ready? I hope you can check your slide. You can view your slide. Yes, yes, it's very visible. Okay, and uh, so voices coming through, slides move. So, Dr. John, I'm going to introduce, yeah. introduce okay. to the audience on behalf of the Entomology Research Institute, Loyola College, the Jesuit Management in Chennai and the director of Sun Agro Biotech, Dr. S. Siddhanandam, and Dr. S. Janathanan, the professor and the head of the Zoology Department, University of Madras. We are all organizers of this today's international conference on the emerging trends in insect science. And we are happy to welcome you for this session. And we are much grateful to you for accepting our invitation and to share your topic on a best risk quarantine. So, uh, Dr. John Mufford is an ecologist, agricultural economist, and risk analyst on issues of plant health, biosecurity, and veterinary fisheries and forest management. Research has covered many aspects of economic interest related to pests, food, and biosecurity fisheries and environmental risk management and international development with a strong emphasis on work in developing countries. The work currently falls into three general categories, risk and economic analysis of exotic organisms, including agricultural quarantine, invasive species, and international release or bioterrorism. Secondly, uncertainty affecting fisheries management. Our risk analysis and economic analysis for novel technologies in pest control, such, such as sterile insect techniques and technically modified insects. And Dr. John Mufford, who works in Center for Environmental Policy in London, is teaching includes topics on demographic fisheries and risk in the MSc Environmental Technology core course on biosecurity and project design in some of the environmental technology option courses. He also taught an undergraduate course in resource management in the life science department. Dear participants, we have an eminent scientist, Dr. John Muffer. And Loyola College Chennai is proud of having your presence, sir. Hearty welcome to present now. Dr. John, it is your turn. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh... A very generous introduction, and let me say I am very pleased to be back in India, even if it is virtual. So uh, my congratulations to you in running this conference, and uh, as I say, very, very pleased to be with you. Let me move to my slides. Okay, here we are. So what I'm going to talk about today is a bit different, I think, from the talks that you've had earlier in the morning that I was listening to, which were very much focused on the results of specific research. What I want to talk to you about is the process by which we decide what pests pose a sufficient risk to require some form of management. So that's my, my topic, to talk about risk and management of pests and how we make those decisions. And I want to give you some examples. So here's an outline of what I want to talk about this afternoon. Uh, first of all, the concept of pest risk and how we can approach that from different perspectives. I want to talk then about uh, the objectives that we have in risk assessment and risk management, which is to consider the equivalence of risk, have a consistency 
in our assessment of risk and then to manage proportionately so we don't spend money on low risks uh, and not spend money on high risks, for example. I want to talk about how we coordinate risk approaches between different countries and between different organisms. I'm going to talk about uh, the standard for pest risk analysis and how that is organized and used. And then I want to end with the idea of how we make lists of pests that are of concern to us. So the first thing then is to talk about the, the concept of how risk occurs. And there are three, three components that make up the, the potential for risk. There's the agent or the organism itself, so the pest that uh, we are concerned about. Uh, there's the pathway and there's the receptor environment, so where the pest ends up. And all three of these are, are common features in many forms of risk analysis. Now, traditionally, uh, pest risk in Europe has focused on agents or the organisms or the individual species, whereas in the United States and in Australia, it's focused on pathways and many countries around the world use one or other of these approaches. There's less attention paid to the receptor environment. And we're seeing in the last few years a significant change in Europe moving towards doing risks on pathways. Now let's look at these three potential parts of risk and just think about the properties of them. So for agents, there are many, many organisms, but the organisms do not change very much. In the sense of pathways, well, a pathway is made up of a source, a route, a destination, and a use. So there are many, many combinations of pathways, and pathways are very different from agents, which are also many, in that pathways are very dynamic. They can change very quickly. So you know, in Europe, we could be buying mangoes one week from India, the next week they are mostly coming from Kenya, the next week they could come from Brazil. So the pathway changes overnight, whereas the organism does not. The receptors, there are relatively few and they change relatively slowly. So I put here broad classes of receptors under crops. We could think of wheat or tomatoes or any particular crop. But as you look down that list, it's actually a very stable list and a very short list compared to the agent and pathway list. So the challenge when we're looking particularly at agents and pathways is that there are so many of them to organize. And the next thing we'll talk about just as an introduction to this is this issue of proportionate responses and to think about whether we're really achieving that. And what I'm showing on the screen now is the result of a study by the National Audit Office in the United Kingdom in 2019. Uh, Dr. John, at... excuse me, John. Yes. Dr. Yes. John, your slide is not in a view, in a slide view show mode. Kindly keep it in a, a view show, slide view show because it stands in the first slide, it's not moving. Oh, I see, okay. Um, hmm. Kindly. Slide view show, let me just uh, go back out and go back in again. It is open, yes, your PPT is open. Kindly go for a slide show. Yep. Yes, right. yes, it's visible now, yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes, it's visible now, thank you. Okay, but where do I do that? This one? This one? Okay. So let me just go back then quickly to uh, the previous slides. Um, I'll figure out how to do that now. OK. 
Okay, what I'm having trouble now doing is moving the presentation. I'm going to stop again. Okay, are you seeing now? Yes, slide yes, John, your slide is visible. Okay. Agents, pathways, and receptors. Yes. Okay, and is that going forward it's and backward? Visible. Yes, yes, okay. it's moving forward and backward. Please. Proceed. Okay, so Thank I you. have been talking about agents, pathways, and receptors, and I was now moving on to proportionate responses, and I was going to speak about the a study done by the National Audit Office in the United Kingdom on spending by the different biosecurity regimes. Yes, yes, yeah, is, 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 is it moved to the next one? Yes, uh, It is there, the proportionate response. Good, okay, so that, that's what I'm talking that's about it? now. Okay, looks like it's moving along yeah. fine then. Great. Okay, so what we see here is the amount of money spent on each of these, the proportion of spend and the number of species that we're targeting and the establishment in the last 20 years. If you look at animal health, aquatic animal health and bee health, so three different forms of animal health, the spending is 93% on animal health and the result is zero introductions and establishments in the last 20 years. If, if we look at plant health, what we see is only 6% spend and nine establishments. And for invasive species, that's the INNS, invasive species, the spending is only about half a percent. And we have 25 establishments in the last 20 years. So I would say that this is an example where the, res the, pr the response has not really been proportionate. And it illustrates that if you spend 93% of the, the effort in an area, you get very good success. If you spend half a percent, you don't get such good success. So what we want to do is to try and make the response more proportionate. Okay, can I just check that it's moved on now to Eurofight? Can you just confirm that the slide has moved on? Okay, well, what I want to illustrate here is that uh, the, the sources of pests along pathways change in many cases. Uh, what this slide is showing is the, the number of interceptions of harmful organisms in Europe for five years uh, up to 2018. And you can see that, as you might expect, most of the interceptions are from large trading partners like China, the US and Russia. India is here at number eight. Uh, and so that illustrates the importance of volume. Uh, it also highlights the fact that for some countries, we're getting very variable interceptions from year to year. So from China, from Russia, from Taiwan, whereas from other countries like India, the, the number of interceptions is relatively stable and stability is, is quite important. You know, we know what to expect. Uh, it's not so good from a country like Taiwan, where it goes very low for several years and then very high all of a sudden. But this, this, so this illustrating variability in many cases. Now for individual agents, we're seeing big changes. So this is the annual change in 2018. Uh, that uh, fall armyworm interceptions went up over 50%, citrus black spot up 50%, mango pests down 10%. And we had big differences from some African and Asian countries with reductions in interceptions, whereas from South America, we had some significant increases. So for agents and for pathways, we had big changes, uh, both up and down. So how do we organize then a system that is, is consistent and deals with these large numbers and with the, uh, the, the likely changes within them? 
So there are three international organizations that are part of the uh, World Trade Organization system that deal with animal health, plant health, and food quality. And they're very different organizations. The, the animal health and food quality ones deal in a hundred of specific problems. Whereas with plant health, there are tens of thousands of different combinations of agents and pathways that we would need to have standards for. So in plant health, we tend to have uh, general standards and fewer of them, so only 44 international standards on things like risk analysis and certification and so on. So the particular thing I want to talk about there is this uh, International Standard for Phytosanitary Measures number 11, ISPM 11, which is the pest risk analysis standard. And it sets out a mechanism for looking at pest risk in terms of likelihood and magnitude, and it identifies four components, uh, entry, establishment, spread, and impact under those two categories of likelihood and magnitude. A little bit of doubt about whether spread goes under likelihood or magnitude, and I'll come to that in a moment. I'm going to talk about now these four components in, in, in order. So the first one is about volume, and volume is certainly the, the key to entry, as we saw in the, the number of interceptions that were coming into the Europe Union from China, the US, and Russia, high volume means high pest entry. So risk is proportional to volume. And in terms of assessing pest risk, it's very easy to know the historical volume of trade. It's not helpful, though, when you're trying to assess a new trade and what the risk of pests on a new trade would be. And in fact, my experience is that there are many applications for new trade that don't actually result in any trade happening. So it's very difficult to know what that future volume of trade will be. The other thing that's very difficult to deal with in terms of entry is the transfer. So having the pest enter with a commodity, how does it transfer into the susceptible environment? And that is highly variable, it's very, very difficult to assess that because it's management dependent and even worse, it may be affected by the behavior of consumers in the case of fruits and vegetables where they're receiving a fresh product to the individual household. So in terms of management, what we should do is to manage in accordance with the, the proportion of volume. And I want to give an illustration of that. It's relatively straightforward. The problem is it's very expensive because if you make your management proportional to volume, then high volume is going to lead generally to high cost. So an example of that is based on this uh, ISPM standard number 15, which gives guidance on wooden pallets. So these, these pallets that uh, trade travels on. So for control of Asian longhorn beetle, the ISPM 15 requires in international trade that each pallet is treated so that it doesn't transmit beetles. But it costs about $1 to treat each pallet. And the issue then comes that there are about 2 billion pallets that enter international trade every year. So it's proportional to volume, but because it's proportional, it's very, very expensive, but effective. Now, the next component of risk is establishment. And we find for the risk assessors that establishment is one of the uh, the highest uh, areas of confidence in their assessment. And that is um, because they are looking at climate and host suitability and availability. And the natural history of the pest is generally well known. So we know about the climate and hosts. What's becoming more complicated is this issue of uh, climate change. And there, the, the question is which model we choose and over what time frame. And a further problem in relation to establishment is that it's very difficult to manage establishment. 
because we cannot change the climate, we can't change the host. So there's very little that we can actually do about establishment. Now I would say spread is one of the most difficult concepts to deal with in pest risk because it can mean different things. So in one sense, you might argue that spread is relatively insignificant in pest risk because once a pest is established, it is almost sure to spread. The question then is how does it spread? So does it go in all directions? Does it go in one direction? Does it jump from one place to another? And we can define spread in terms of the area uh, to the frontier of spread, or we could think about it in terms of the density of occupation within the area uh, that it's occupying. Or ultimately, at some time in the future, we could think about spread as being a proportion of the total resource that is being affected. Now, and in terms of management, it depends on how we've defined it, whether we want to talk about containment or suppression. So containment relates to thinking about spread in terms of a frontier of occupation. So we're trying to limit the, how big the frontier is, whereas suppression is about considering the intensity. We're trying to reduce the intensity within that frontier. So we're looking at different objectives in those two cases. And in terms of impact, well, we have a time, a time frame, and over time, the pest spreads, it expands, so the intensity of impact becomes greater. The nature of the impact changes as we move from eradication, possibly to long-term management. And so the question in terms of impact is about time. When do we measure the impact? Do we consider the impact at the equilibrium, so sometime out here well into the future when it's stabilized, or do we think about it in terms of some fixed time uh, at some point in the future? So the problem about choosing the equilibrium time, which is what normally happens, is that it takes different amounts of time to reach that, so you don't get consistency. So I now want to move on to looking at pest lists. So it's very helpful to have pest lists. Um, and there are several different kinds of them. So just some examples of them. Uh, the European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization has a quarantine list. Dr. John, excuse me. Yes. Dr. John, it's yep. uh, have you opened uh, Open this Google Meet link to devices. We hear extra sound. There is another sound. Have you opened okay. in, uh, in the devices? If it, because there is a sound is coming, uh, which means that it must be open. Yeah, now it's no sound. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me try and reduce the sound uh, here. Yes. Maybe error, maybe from outside, the sound continues to be existing. Kindly continue. Sorry for the inconvenience. Okay, are you there? Yeah, yes. yeah, I'm here fully. I'm here. Now it's very clear. That was another sound was coming out. Now it's okay, very clear. Kindly that. continue. Yes. Okay, let me go on now to back to the slideshow. Correct one. Back. Okay, so we talk about lists. Okay, so um, we have lists from various sources. So there's uh, the European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization list, uh, there's a regional list from the EU, there are national lists. And within the national lists, one of the problems of consistency then is that we have, for instance, plant health and invasive species lists that are. Uh, made separately. So the, the criteria that are used to make these two lists are not consistent. Uh, we try to make them as near as possible, but they're, they're not the same. Another issue around 
lists of pests is that there's a distinction between legal lists and risk registers. So in the United Kingdom, for instance, we have both a legal list of pests, which means that the government must take some actions. And we have uh, a risk register, which is a much larger list. So the legal list is about 400 species. The risk register for plant health is over 1,000 species. Uh, uh, but the risk register list, there is no obligation for control. And one of the values of this risk register then is it, it may stimulate individual industries that are stakeholders to take some action uh, whereas uh, the government would be the responsible party for the legal lists. So when we make the lists, you know, there's this question of what goes into it. And we could, for instance, have the ISPM 11 components equally weighted, uh, or as in the case with the UK Plant Health Risk Register, it could just have some of the components. So for instance, they don't include spread. Uh, spread is assumed to happen anyway. Uh, and another thing to consider is whether it's with or without management. And this is one of the, the last things I want to talk about is how uh, management affects the list. I'll come back to that in just a second. So what we're aiming at is to create risk profiles. And I'll just give you three examples here. So the first is an invasive wasp. We've uh, assessed entry, establishment, spread, and impact. We have some confidence levels in those assessments. We can then consider simulated scores overall of risk in terms of likelihood on this horizontal axis and magnitude on the vertical axis. And that gives us a cumulative risk profile like this. So you see there's a lot of uncertainty in the assessment because we had only medium confidence in three of the factors, but it's all around the relatively low end of the profile. So we'd say this is a, a low risk, this paper wasp. Here's an invasive bee, the giant resin bee. You can see in this case, more confidence in the score and a slightly higher, but still fairly low risk. And then we can move to the Asian hornet, the third species, even more confidence in this one and a higher risk so this would move into a more of a medium risk category because of this cumulative risk distribution. So our aim here is to have a consistent form of risk assessment that allows us to rank species within our lists and that's very important this consistency and the ability to rank so that we can go to policymakers and suggest that a proportionate response might be to the greater risk. But another way to look at this would be to think about management and to consider the risk with and without management. So that's what I'm showing here in this figure from the UK Plant Health Risk Register. So what this risk register does is, is puts species into uh, rank categories. And the first column here is the unmitigated risk score. So in this particular scheme, 125 is the highest level of risk. So there are four species in that highest level of risk that has a score of 125. There are 16 species here in the next category, which has a score of 100. So one might argue that we should be focusing on these particularly high risk species uh, and you know, this, these two top layers. Another way to look at it would be to say, well, what's the return on management? And what is shown here in this last column is how much difference it would make if we managed these species. So for Clavibacter and Ips, uh, we could get a 85 point change on this unmitigated risk value by taking practical management. That's not the case for Agrillus and Phytophthora. So as we look down this top list here uh, of um, uh, 20 species roughly, there's only four of them that give a high return in terms of management and the others uh, give quite low returns on management. So one might argue that it would be better to focus attention on the species that give a good return for management. 
rather than on just risk. And we can illustrate this again here with some weed management analysis, where there are four lists of ranking here for these species based on different criteria. So the cost efficiency is the way that an economist might look at them and rank them. Uh, the risk is maybe how a stakeholder in uh, the agricultural industries would rank them. Uh, success in management is how a politician might man uh, rank them. And the cost might be how an investor or lender might rank them. And as you can see, the lists are very different depending on which perspective you take. And um, what might happen is that you're lucky and you see something like limonium here comes out very high in all three ranks. Uh, whereas um, for other species uh, like sedum, for instance, it's relatively high in two of the lists, but not so high in some of the other ones. So it just illustrates that uh, you, you may have dominance across the different categories, or you may have still a dispute at the end. So let me just finish off talking about uh, how lists affect control in regions. And I'm just going to ask these questions really. I don't uh, intend to go into the answers, but just to illustrate why there's quite a lot more to do in this area. So first question is whether if you have a list of regional concerns, should it have a limited number of species? So for instance, with the invasive uh, alien species in Europe, initially there was a suggestion that the list should be capped at 50 species. Uh, an argument for that is that there's only so much resource. If you put a species on a list, then you're really required to do something about it. If you don't cap the list, then it's like a blank check. Uh, the, the obligation goes up. Uh, Another issue then is, should individual countries in a region be able to deviate from the concern? And that's one of the issues that's happening now in Britain uh, with invasive species. We are saying we're going to reduce the list from the rest of Europe because there are some species that do not concern us. Uh, should there be a common risk assessment within a region? I think the answer to me is yes, but practically how do you make that happen? Uh, how do you remove species from a list? Because otherwise a list just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and the obligation is impossible. Uh, should there be regional management responses? It's not very helpful if one country manages a risk and its neighbor does not. And then finally, should risk assessment and risk management be combined in an integrated scheme? And Again, I would be a proponent of that, but how we would actually do it remains to be seen. So those are challenges for the future. So just to, to summarize then, I've talked about the assessment process, uh, this, the objectives of equivalence and proportionality, talked about some of the, the ways that different components of risk assessment affect the decisions, the, the fact that we produce lists, but then a list means there's an obligation and it's difficult to fulfill those obligations. And I've raised this issue of how we include management. So at that point, let me stop uh, and let me say, uh, sorry for the confusion of sound as we started out this talk. Uh, so, and um, back to the audience for any questions if there's time. Yes, John? Yes. Yes. So, uh, any question sessions, John? I have asked the participants. Dear participants, in case if you have any, uh, if you need any questions, you are most welcome.
So, Dr. John, it's very clear. People know for okay, this thank you. audience. So, thank you so much uh, for your sharing and to be available for our invitation. So, on behalf of Loyola College, Chennai, and the uh, University of Madras, Department of Zoology and Sun Agrobiotech, I express my sincere thanks to you for your wonderful sharing and available for sharing your thoughts and as well as your experience in the field of agricultural technology science. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So we would like to meet you in some other occasion in person. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Goodbye to all. or Jamima Moses followed by Shruti, followed by Niveta, followed by Marishwari and finally so I request the presenters to be ready uh, so once uh, I call upon so the important um, instruction given to us is we have to stick to the time so exactly you are left followed by three minutes as a grace so I request the uh, students to be very crisp in their introduction and more time would be for uh, methodology or results and discussion so I request uh, Jemima Moses to present her paper. Good afternoon. My topic is on to study the effect of entomopathogenic fungi Aspergillus niger, OM514698, isolated from insect cadaver against housefly larva and adult. Coming to the introduction, coming to the introduction, housefly is one of the mechanical victor that can transmit disease to livestock and human health. It can transmit around 60 to 70 diseases and in uh, livestock uh, predominantly eye infection and in humans diarrhea is caused. Poultry farm are the most preferred habitat for those. And permethrin is currently the most common insecticide, among which uh, and another bait based insecticide such as quick bite and golden melon can also be used. Pyrethroid based insecticides can suppress housefly, but their continuous use can cause uh, resistant development. Therefore, an alternative development method can also be used in order to minimize the ill effect derived from synthetic pesticide. One among them is entomopathogenic fungi, which can be obtained from natural habitats such as soil and insect cadaver that can aid in pest management. Next. Coming to the objective, the, my objective is to study the efficacy of entomopathogen isolated from soil and insect cadavers and to study the THC and DHC, total hemocyte count and uh, differential hemocyte count of secondary metabolites obtained from the potential fungi on the treated larvae and to estimate the phenol oxidase activity. Next slide. This is the uh, housefly systematic position and the sexual dimorphism is seen where the there is no space is seen between the eyes in case of female. Next slide. Insect rearing for larva, coconut cake and rices is used and for adult 
Vitamin syrup is provided as feed. Next slide. This is flow chart of the fungal uh, flow chart of the process. The source of the fungal pathogen is obtained from uh, agriculture soil where 10 agriculture soil and 5 insect cadavers were obtained. Preliminary screening at highest concentration was done against lava and adult and the potential fungus is chosen for varied concentration uh, activity against larva and the adult. The observation of the inf uh, infection is made as histopathological and development of mycosis. Next slide. Uh, the, potential uh, the potential fungus is identified uh, morphologically by LCB staining and molecular identification is done and uh, submitted to NCBI. The potential uh, fungus, uh, from the methanol extract obtained from the potential fungus is tested in three parameters for their immune response such as total hemocyte, differential hemocyte and phenol oxidase activity. Next slide. This is the brief, uh, brief uh, uh, note of the methodology. This is the collection of the soil and the cadaver is done where the cadaver is surface sterilized and then uh, placed in filter paper and then cultured. The fungus is isolated and the 7 day old culture is then uh, identified and uh, prepared for stock solution for activity. The secondary metabolites is obtained from the fungal mycelium and uh, the larval biosy is carried out using two methods bait and immersion. In case of bait 10 gram of feed is mixed with 1 ml desired concentration. In uh, adult biose, bait equal ratio of vitamin syrup and desired spore concentration is provided as feed uh, for adults and 5 replicates were made. Next slide. Uh, for the study of immune response, hemolymph is collected after 24 hours treated with LC50 value. Total hemocyte count and differential hemocyte count were obtained from the hemolymph as sample and phenol oxidase activity uh, is done where the hemolymph is suspended in phosphate buffer saline and uh, uh, L-dopa is used as substrate. Next slide. Coming to the result, the source of the fungal collection is obtained from 10 agriculture soil uh, around Villacheri, Kuduvanjeri, Coimbatore and Kerala and 5 insect cadavers among which the potential fungus is obtained from dragonfly belonging to family name Anisoptera. Next slide. The preliminary screening of 10 fungus were obtained and among which the potential fungus that is dragonfly, uh, fungus obtained from dragonfly is uh, aspergillus, uh, which uh, which gave positive result against larva and adult of house fly. Next slide. Uh, among the two methods tested, bait and Im immersion method is tested against uh, larva of uh, house fly, and the observation is made from uh, day four and on day five. At highest concentration, uh, the activity on day five is about 80 to 90 percent. Uh, for the uh, bait method, in case of immersion method, the activity is very less, about 40 to 50 percent at highest concentration on day five. Next slide. This is the adulticidal activity. Adulticidal activity is carried out at 3 uh, concentration, 3 into 10 past 6, 3 into 10 past 7 and 3 into 10 past 8 where the observation is made on day 4, 5 and 6. At highest concentration, the mortality is about 60 to 70 percent uh, at um, uh, on day 6 when compared to Boveria basiana. Next slide. This is the histopathological observation. In comparison to the control, uh, in the treated, there is a body wall, uh, uh, the body wall is disintegrated due to the penetration of spore. In the gut region, the spore accumulation can be seen in the proventriculus. Next slide. Uh, the LC50 treated larva were placed in the moisture chamber where the spore uh, breaches from the cuticle can be observed uh, after placing it in the moisture chamber at 20x magnification for both larva and adult. Next slide. The potential fungal isolate is subjected to uh, preliminary um, genus identification using LCB mount that is lactophenol cotton blue mount and followed by uh, uh, genetic identification uh, where the uh, DNA sequence is submitted to NCBI. Next slide. The percent mortality of methanol extract that is the secondary metabolites from the Aspergillus niger is tested at 5 concentrations against house larva from 24 hours to 74, 72 hours the observation is made but at the highest concentration only 62 percent mortality is observed on the third day with LC50 value of 1.5 percent. Next slide. Differential hemocyte count is based after identifying 5 types of hemocytes from the housefly which is pro-hemocyte, plasmodocytes, granulocytes, fildocytes and oenocytoids and uh, these are the morphological variation that can be observed in the hemocyte where the nodule formation can, uh, has occurred due to the plasmodocytes and uh, rapid mitotic division of the granulocytes can also be seen at 40x magnification. Next slide. This is the hemocytic count activity of the secondary metabolites. Uh, the total hemocyte count, uh, the compared to the control, the secondary metabolites obtained from Aspergillus nigus has reduced the number of cells per mm square with 947.3 when compared to control. 
Mm, uh, this may be due to the arrest in the cell division. In case of differential hemocyte count, uh, the cell mediated response is mainly done by granulocytes and plasmatocytes, where there is an increase in granulocytes, uh, which can be witnessed by the mitotic division uh, that is in the previous slide. And pro um, is the, there is an increase in pro hemocyte, so there is a uh, block in the uh, differentiation of pro hemocyte into other cell type uh, due to the stress induced by the uh, methanol extract. Next slide. This is phenol oxidase activity. Uh, the oenocytoid cells which is present in the uh, aspergillus niger is responsible for the phenol oxidase activity. So the phenol oxidase uh, is uh, mainly involved in melanization though, uh, that plays a major role in preventing the loss of hemolymph. Next slide. This is the overall summary of the process. Uh, over, uh, the, the soil is collected from natural, so, uh, natural sources, soil and insect cadaver, fungal culture is made. Spore and secondary metabolites were treated on larva and adult. The larval observation is made on spore penetration and mycosis. And the immune response is studied as uh, THC, DHC and phenol oxidase activity. Next slide. Coming to the conclusion, entomopelogenic fungi identified and isolated showed a marked effect against housefly larval and adult stages. The impact of fungal toxin on the immune response were also analyzed. So this uh, study helps in understanding the mechanism of action of fungal toxin on larva. Further, the identification of potential compound and the synergistic activity of spore and the fungal toxin on houseley larva, houseley larva and adult are necessary for development of formulation. Thank you. Yeah, very good presentation. Uh, excellent piece of work. Uh, due to come time constraint, I request the audience if you have any questions, it can be clarified with her in the tea time. So we'll just move on to the next speaker. May I invite uh, K. Shruti to deliver her talk on the detection and physiochemical characterization of serum hemagglutin activity from a black soldier fly. Please. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. First of all, I would like to thank the uh, committee as well as the chairperson for giving us this opportunity. I am K. Shruti, a uh, research scholar. Under the guide, I am doing my PhD under the guidance of Dr. S. Janathanan. My uh, work is Direction and Physicochemical Analysis of Serum Hemagglutinin Activity from the Black Soldier Fly Larvae, Hermitia Eleusins. Black Soldier Fly is a harmless diphtherian fly, which, uh, which is commonly found in tropical and subtropical regions. They mostly feed on the waste that is biodegradable organic matter, the larvae is a voracious feeder, while the other consumes the fat that has been accumulated during the larval stage. They are one of the promising source in the feed industry, as well as uh, they are very environmental friendly and cost efficient to rear. Next slide. The life cycle is very short within one and a half months, and we have six instars. Five, uh, the sixth instar is the pre-pupae, and one to five instars are the oracious feeder. We have taken the fifth instar larvae for our experiment. Uh, the, as, we, as you can see, the nutrition comp composition, the protein concentration is high compared to any other organism. And this we have particular, particularly taken because uh, the soy meal, which is being given as a feed, has lesser composition. So this could, uh, this could be given as an animal feed. The um, remnants can be used as organic compost, and the larvae is also used in biogas and biofuel. So this is one of the potential model in various uh, fields. The hypothesis, does the hemolymph of Hermesia leucens possess lectin? Lectins are uh, carbohydrate binding molecules, which is of non-immune origin. They are mostly uh, used in uh, self and non-self recognition. They are recognized by platin receptor molecules, which is present in microbes. The lectins, the, uh, the interaction between lectins and carbohydrates has been shown in various activities such as uh, phagocytosis, cell adhesion, uh, migration, and cell activation and differentiation. These studies have also suggested that they play a major role in antimicrobial activity, uh, mitogenic activity, immunomodulatory activity, and insecticidal activity as well. So uh, in our particular particular study, we are focused on C-type lectin as our lectin was uh, observed to be calcium dependent. The objective, detection of lectin from hemolymphopharmacia leucens and physicochemical characterization. 
these are the methodology as we have followed results the hemagglutination activity is one of the important uh, experiment to detect the lectin present in any uh, hemolymph for extract or whatever uh, in this uh, activity we we have seen that highest titer value was seen in mouse and uh, rabbit rbcs and the second highest was rat the cross absorption assays reveal that there is no multiple lectin and there is only a single type of lectin the divalent cation and uh, cation and edta sensitivity test proved that the particular lectin uh, has an enhanced function with the uh, cation buffer uh, sorry calcium buffer and uh, the lectin is also uh, sensitive to edta carbohydrate inhibition uh, assay revealed that the lectin is particularly uh, has highest affinity to d glucosamine this particular assay is very important when it comes to the purification the ph optima uh, of this particular lectin uh, showed that uh, the lectin was stable between the ph range of uh, 7 to 11 and the and the thermal stability was also tested which showed that the lectin was uh, stable between the temperature of 10 to 50 after which the um, activity of the lectin was uh, negligible the summary the hemagglutination activity had the highest titer values for mice and rat rbcs the cross absorption test revealed that there is uh, no multiple lectin the serum ha activity was dependent on cation especially on calcium the serum agglutinin was observed to be uh, uh, has the highest activity between the ph of 7 to 11 and the temperature between 10 to 50 degrees after which the uh, activity was very negligible impending objectives include batch assay and purification characterization of purified lectin and functional characterization of purified lectin this slide particularly brings us to this uh, our uh, topic that is emerging trends once we have done the characterization and functional characterization we will know uh, we will know where we could take this particular lectin either it could be taken uh, to pest management as uh, insecticidal or uh, antimicrobial activity or uh, in uh, which uh, the microbes which um, infest the crops like uh, any fungi or something or to to the biomedical applications where we can take it as uh, mitogenic lectin or immunomodulatory lectin and so on so that is where uh, our study comes under emerging trends of insect science my acknowledgments to our uh, especially to my guide who has given us the freedom to do our work with uh, no with a no time frame we had the we had so much freedom to do in our own pace and also our uh, staff members our senior faculty my lab colleagues uh, my friends and msc destination students and also the envis center who provided the uh, a uh, compost who provide access to the compost to uh, take out the particular insects thank you uh, it was a excellent presentation uh, you, the sir. slide arrangement everything was good thank well within so the time too so this is a very good basic work yeah, so i wish you to continue for the leaves in so this much. okay thank, thank you. you may now invite the third speaker uh, deepa lakshmi she will be presenting her paper on influence of solvents on the germination of the selected seed treated with neem extracts good afternoon sir uh, so bio pesticide as we know is a major thing uh, as a part of ipm so uh, during a bio pest as a course of bio pesticide usage we use a n number of solvents that are used to prepare extracts from plants so i just wanted to check what the role do they have in germination of the seed so the experiment involved in pre soaking the seed in organic solvent and one type was coated with oil before germination Uh, so germination is just the reactivation of metabolic machinery of the seed resulting in the emergence of ra radical and pumule so the major uh, conditions that are required for a proper germination includes temperature moisture air light 
and they should also have an optimum temperature and pH range. Um, so studies from the previous literature has said, uh, reported that vitamins, uh, gamma, amino butyric acid, and polyphenols accumulate uh, are the various bioactive components that are accumulated in germinated seeds. So this can be novo synthesized or transformed during the germination process. So my study included uh, mung bean, white chickpea, and cow peas. And for the other variety, just to make a check, I just coated the uh, seeds with neem oil before germination. Yeah, these are the sprouted seeds. So the rate uh, of checking them before five uh, after five days are so mung bean had a very great uh, sprouted rate compared to chickpea and uh, cow peas. So the germination difference I could find was the seed coated with oil when compared to the organic solvent was minimum. So this is because the organic solvents remove the waxy layer of the pericarp and therefore uh, facilitated the water imbibition and phenol extuation. The rapid germination further resulted in a significant increase in seedling vigor, while oil prevented the water imbibition by forming a hydrophobic surface around the seed. So further, uh, in order to test for GABA from the germinated seed, I followed the method uh, suggested by Fadwa and Boris et al. 2019. So why did I choose GABA? It's because GABA is GABA plays a major role uh, in human by relaxing the body after stress induction, fights depression, insomnia, anxiety, and mood disorders, and an excellent relaxant of brain. But the uh, but the same time, GABA has uh, important role to play as uh, inhibitor of neuron transmitter. That's why, therefore, reducing the excitability of neurons. So what is the outcome I wanted to uh, implement in entomology is that producing plants with uh, genetically mo transgenetically modified plants enhanced with quantities of GABA, which might reduce pest attack. That's because it can inhibit the reproductive uh, cycle of the plant by reducing the neural uh, activity. Thank you. Yeah, very good presentation. A good uh, piece of work. So, for any clarifications, we will just um, ask you at the end of all the yeah. presenters. Let present. Thank okay. So, may now we invite uh, our Niveta to present her paper: an exploratory investigation of propensity and status quo of insect cellulosis for pro prospected applications. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. I'm Niveta, Research Scholar, Department of Zoology, University of Madras. My topic for today's presentation is an exploratory investigation of propensity and status quo of insect cell laser for prospective application. As you all know, this green world is cell, I mean, dominated by cellulose, and cellulose is contemplated to be the most abandoned organic polymer on Earth, comprising of glucose unit, which is linked by beta-1 for glycosidic bonds. So interestingly, cellulose consummates the dietary requirements of many animals, including bacteria, protists, ruminants, and many other insects. As a result, these insects possess what is called as an exog. This, uh, these animals possess cellulases such as endogluconases, exogluconases, as well as beta glucosidases that act sequentially in a synergistic system to convert the cellulose into a more utilizable form of energy, which is called as a glucose. So, this as said, the cellulose is being uh, acted upon by endogluconases as well as exogluconases, uh, and they produce what is called as a cellulobios. The cellulobios is again being acted upon by beta glucosidases to produce what is called as a glucose unit. And this glucose is considered to be the most utilizable form of energy. So insects have evolved various strategies to use the cellulose as a source of energy. And they actually forms an optimal resource to prospect for novel cellulitic enzymes. So insects uh, present an efficient uh, candidate to per, as for potent natural bioreactor from which novel cellulitic enzymes are being sought. 
So initially, insects were thought to be completely dependent upon symbiont cellulose production. And after that, it was found that many groups with uh, uh, midgut as well as salivary gl gland cellulose activity was started reporting, which means that insects have an endogenous method of cellulose, cellulose production. So because of the increasing demand to overcome shortage, energy shortage, as well as to achieve a stable economic development, we can use lignocellulose-based biofuels that have become a major focus of industrial and ac academic communities worldwide. So with this, uh, we have attempted to study and compare the interaction of endobeta one for gluconase and beta glucose base from different insects belonging to six different orders reported so far with different substrate using homology modeling as well as molecular docking approaches. So exploration of these in, uh, interactions could uh, actually provide us some uh, of the benefits and to fully fetch the benefits of the second generation biofilms. Now, this is the objective to study and compare the interaction of endobeta uh, beta 1 for gluconase and beta glucose base from different insects to six uh, reported from six uh, different orders with different substrate using homology modeling and molecular docking studies. So, these are the methods which include the retrieval of target sequences, selection of template, and comparative modeling, preparation of receptors, preparation of ligands, active site prediction, molecular docking, and binding site analysis. So these are the methodology which is actually uh, as an homology modeling method. So we have retrieved the sequences of endo beta 1 for gluconases as well as beta glucosidases reported so far from insect sources and that forms our target sequence. Now the target sequence does not have a structure in order to go for uh, docking. So prior to the docking we have modeled structures using uh, homology modeling method using the modular software. Now our target sequence is that for both the beta 1 4 gluconases as well as for the beta glucosidases we have got a structure. Now the next uh, is the uh, next is the docking. Next. Uh, so we have dockered the endo beta 1 4 gluconases with six different substrate which is CMC, cell, uh, cellulose which is microcrystalline cellulose, then cellotriose, tetrose, pentose as well as cellulose. Uh, next. So these are the uh, results of the binding affinity of endobeta 1 for gluconases from various insect sources with different substrate. It is surprising to note that almost all the beta uh, endobeta 1 for gluconases from insect sources have a very good af binding affinity towards all the six substrate tested. These are the results of the binding of binding affinity of beta glucose bases from various insect sources with cellobios. So it is very interesting to note that the change in the Gibbs free energy accompanying these docking was very negative, which means that these are energetically of feasible reactions, which we have predicted using our in silico studies. There are about 35 uh, different sources for beta glucosidases from different insect uh, sources. Now, we have also uh, experimentally investigated the symbiotic as well as independent mode of cellulosis in insects in the three different insect models. They are the Rhyporus longicollis, which is called the banana stem weevil. The next is Oryctus rhinoceros, which we all know it's a pest, it's a rhinoceros beetle, as well as Sopovos morio, which is the called as a darkling beetle. So, we have also, we are all also investigated the symbiont dependent as well as independent mode of cellulosis in these insects. To our surprise, it was noted that Odoiporus, in the case of Odoiporus longicollis, we have used a method of CMC method uh, to, uh, to find out whether the cellular lysis is independent or not. To our surprise, it was found that the major cellulitic activities was from the midgut as well as the salivary glands, which means that they have an endogenous cellular lysis than the exogenous. Exogenous was there provided the contribution of the exogenous or the microbiota that is present in the gut uh, contributed only very little towards the cellular lysis, but the contribution of the midgut as salivary glands activity was much higher. In case of Oryctus rhinoceros, there was a uh, contribution of microbial as well as their own contribution were also there. In case of Sophobus morio also, the microbial con contribution for the cellulitic activity was very minimal when compared to the uh, endogenous activity. So, uh, to our surprise, like in the three insects itself, Odoiporus as well as Sophobus morio were having an endogenous activity than the exogenous one, which actually which actually says that this exploration actually so, uh, uh, says that these insects processes an endogenous method of activity than the exogenous one. So this could be used to improve its efficiency and in consequence fully fetch the benefits of second generation biofilms. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Yeah, very good uh, presentation. The slides were in format. Uh, uh, like a very good uh, review of the important um, of that.
hospital which of suitable protocol for studying serum phenol oxidase activity from the grub of rhinoceros beetle oryctus rhinoceros moving on to the introduction insects are the first successful air breathing land animal that makes earth adaptable to the survival, to the successful establishment of animals of higher order uh, the extinction of uh, humans nevertheless affects the uh, survival of insects while the extension or any threat to insects have a huge impact on the successful or the or even the survival of the humans they are ubiquitous in nature uh, this makes them susceptible to innumerable number of pathogens this they overcome by having a sufficient uh, innate immune system that comprises physical barriers humoral and cellular uh, responses one such extensive cascade is the phenol oxidase system uh, an enzyme phenol oxidase is a physiologically important a molecular and humoral defense me mechanism of invertebrates it is a copper containing enzyme that usually present in a cymosin form it gets act it gets activated by self and non self interaction that is uh, pa when pathogen associated mo molecular patterns get recognized by the pattern recognition receptors of present in the insect immune system they activate series of serine cascades which in turn, in turn activates pro phenol activating enzymes that convert the zymogen pro phenol oxidase to phenol oxidase this uh, activated phenol oxidase then oxidizes phenol to uh, quinone and quinone to melanin melanin the end product melanin are further involved in several function uh, immune process like uh, encapsulation melanization sclerotization wound healing opsonization and nodulation next slide uh, so having uh, this much importance we interested in we interested in studying phenol oxidase in, in depth so the potential orga model organism chosen to evaluate phenol oxidase is oryctus rhinoceros and here comes the question why oryctus rhinoceros this is because information pertaining to circulatory phenol oxidase in oryctus is absolutely null and needs a serious ascertainment and it is and it is a potential model because sufficient amount of hemolymph can be collected from the oryctus Uh, and that could be used for uh, uh, spectroscopic assays of phenol oxidase uh, then also the major importance is uh, time taken for auto oxidation of the collected hemolymph is uh, is quite long uh, above all deciphering phenol oxidase in oryctus could facilitate framing the gene knockout protocol for phenol oxidase thus eventually helps in uh, controlling uh, the oryctus controlling oryctus rhinoceros which is a major pest of uh, palm vegetation throughout the subtropics and subtropics of the world mm, next slide uh, the picture on the right side indicates the characteristic triangular cuts in which which indicates the infestation of uh, beetle and coconut uh, why standardization of suitable protocol requires this is because spontaneous melanization uh, of hemolymph is a major hindrance for studying pu activity because pu is an oxidizing enzyme and here in hemolymph this pu is the simul and here in pu studies hemolymph is collected devoid of ptu which is an uh, inhibitor of uh, phenol oxidase mm. and then uh, standardizing uh, standardization requires because uh, most of the substrates of this enzyme tends to auto oxidase and this need to be addressed uh, because they we tend to give false od value uh, and uh, and also as as i previously said most of the substrate tend to auto oxidase we need to standardize appropriate blank to carry out even the spectroscopic assays next slide uh, so therefore i uh, subjected uh, i subjected uh, um, uh, the, the spontaneous melanization reaction of the collected hemolymph crude serum Uh, and uh, diluted serum uh, uh, to visual observation for about uh, for by maintaining the above samples in uh, 24 degrees celsius uh, next slide next slide uh, so these are the uh, these are the findings i have noted the color intensity shows melanization uh, occurs in all the four test samples and the spontaneous reaction uh, and the spontaneous melanization reaction observed in hemolymph within 15 minutes of incub incubation uh, uh, while in case of serum and uh, diluted serum uh, no melanization reaction 
occurs uh, even for one hour. So I have chosen serum as a, a test sample to carry out uh, phenoloxidase assays further. Next slide. Hmm. So as I already said, PO substrate tend to auto oxidize and provide false uh, optical density value. So we need to we need to use a, a blank that is devoid of uh, PO substrates unless we are uh, unless we characterize a specific substrate that is specific for this P serum phenoloxidase in this particular instance. We should not use any substrates in the blank. So I uh, went on with uh, using a normal trist buffer saline as a blank. Uh, then I characterized specific substrate of serum phenoloxidase uh, present in Oryctus rhinoceros. For this, I for this I selected eight substrates that broadly classified among three groups like uh, under monophenol. I have chosen uh, tyramine and tyrosine under diphenols. I chosen five substrate like dopamine, L-dopa, DL-dopa, protocatechoic acid, catechol. And under uh, polyphenol, I have chosen a uh, pyrogalol substrate. So having chosen all the eight substrates, then I then I went on to even eventuate the absorption maxima that is uh, specific for each and every substrate. For this, I have incubated substrate with the serum and uh, uh, and I incubated the test sample for 15 minutes. Then I have diluted it further. Then I scanned. Uh, then I scanned. Uh, then I scanned for a, a spectrum range between 380 nanometer to 800 nanometer. These are the OD. Uh, these are the absorption maxima that I got for all the eight substrates. Once I devised the absorption maxima of uh, all the eight, sub eight substrates, I went on to evaluate time cause of oxidation of each substrate by serum uh, PO. For this, I incubated uh, equal volume of serum with the substrate and I uh, and, uh, and the reaction mixture is further incubated for uh, various time intervals from 5 minutes to say about 1 hour. Uh, every time uh, after every time interval, I just, uh, I just measured the respective uh, optical density value. Next slide. Uh, so, uh, uh, simultaneously, I also ca characterized the auto oxidation of the substrate because in PO assays, the auto oxidation of the substrate and the melanization reaction provide, uh, that is occurring due to auto oxidation of the substrate is the major endurance. Uh, so, the, the original PO activity by the serum is uh, eventuated using the formula oxidation of substrate by serum PO uh, is equal to oxidation value OD value of substrate plus serum minus OD value of substrate plus uh, TBS buffer. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So inferences, uh, among all the substrates tested, the reaction velocity is maximum for, uh, uh, max the reaction velocity is, is maximum when it is incubated for 5 minutes. And in particular, the reaction velocity is maximum for two substrates. Uh, the first is pyrogalol and the next uh, uh, substrate that is very close with pyrogalol is DL-DOPA. However, I choose DL-DOPA as the substrate of uh, serum PO. This is because uh, pyrogalol, the auto oxidation is very high and also uh, unlike other substrates, uh, upon incubation, pyrogalol shows reduced uh, activity. That, that, that is, it, it is not, it indicates it is not uh, suitable for uh, serum PO present in this particular uh, hemolymph of this insect. Hence, I have chosen DL dopa. Next slide. Next slide. So, these are, uh, having characterized the substrates, these are the future works need to be, need to be done, which includes characterization of serum phenoloxidase using the standardized uh, substrate that I have done. Uh, then purification of serum phenoloxidase, molecular characterization of the purified PO, amplification of the gene and uh, validating its structure and later on functional characterization of the purified enzyme. Thank you. One second. So there is a oxidation is there while collecting uh, the serum. Yes, sir. So you sound uh, some kind of a different uh, period. Uh, of oxidation. What could be the better uh, time without adding any kind of substrate? Uh, you can maintain the serum without adding any kind of substrate. Uh, without uh, that's what sir, that is the first thing I've uh, actually uh, standardized. Uh, without uh, adding any of the substrate or without the serum PO getting activated by itself and uh, activating with the and reacting with the endogenous substrate that is present in the serum, the time. Required is like say around one hour for serum. 
serum alone that is crude serum and even for diluted serum it is 1 hour so uh, you are telling that 1 hour uh, there will not ah, be yeah, any kind of oxidation yes, will not be there yeah, yeah. okay so after 1 hour suppose if you want to continue the serum for any further studies what could be the better options uh, uh, adding uh, after 1 hour yeah after 1 hour what is the bet- better option to yeah. so th- that to that prevent the oxidation or any kind of special kind of buffers you are using uh, uh, to carry out research so phenol oxidase is an enzyme so okay. that needs to be acti- somewhat uh, one or the other way it, it will activate so the this is one insect where the activation period is very less that is uh, say for one hour it is not uh, it is not uh, naturally oxidizing that is uh, one of the major advantage of this insect the the emolymph palatase on this insect okay there will not be any kind of oxidation in, so there is uh, no general. need to yeah. uh, there is no need for any compared to other uh, insects yeah yes, so yes. there will be a very less uh, oxidation will be there in ah, the okay. in your okay thank you is there any other question from audience okay thank you thank you thank you all so let me invite the last speaker for the session uh, ms m meena kumari she will be presenting her paper detection and preliminary characterization of arsenine from fasciolus lunatus very good evening one and all present here i am meena kumari research scholar department of zoology university of madras my topic uh, for presentation de- detection and preliminary characterization of arsenine from fasciolus lunatus plants are the major source of uh, food and they provide nutrition to all forms of life productivity of crops grown for human consumption is at risk due to the incidence of pests especially weeds pathogens and uh, animal pests crop losses uh, due to these harmful organisms can be substantial and may be uh, prevented uh, by crop protection measure annual crop losses due to insect pest and uh, disease in india was um, estimated to be 33 percentage of agricultural output uh, control of these insects by chemical insecticides has a serious drawback these drawbacks in insect control uh, necessitate a, a great urge to find some insecticidal factor in plant legumes also have uh, non nutritional compounds uh, that may provide uh, produce a toxic compounds these non nutritional compounds also have different bio activities uh, legume seeds extracts also serve as a source of uh, proteinase inhibitors lectins and arsenines arsenine arsenine is one of the insecticidal legume protein uh, present in the wild seeds encoded by two linked uh, genes generally referred to as the phyto uh, hemagglutinin family this glycoprotein from wild seeds of fasciolus pro- uh, protects seeds from uh, predation by the larvae of various stored product insect pests pathogenic bacteria and fungi arsenine belong to the uh, bean like lectin family um, it has many similarities with lectin but differ from lectin in absence of one sugar binding group arsenine or weak lectin and shows hemagglutination activity only on enzyme treated rbcs uh, they are a potent in- insecticidal protein uh, when compared to lectin arsenine is well studied in fasciolus uh, vulgaris and uh, arsenine like sequence is also uh, obtained in fasciolus actifolius um considering this fasciolus lunatus is chosen for the present study based upon the background information based on the background information uh, to review of literature pertaining uh, to arsenine molecule against various insect pests is uh, summarized in review table uh, this table focused on uh, method of exposures of arsenine protein and its effects of uh, target pests next next this literature of a f- physico chemical properties of a fractionated arsenine molecule from different uh, pulse varieties uh, other physico chemical properties uh, such as ph stability thermo tolerance and uh, cation dependency and edta sensitivity were not reported in any of the above literature um, so that um, based on background information and review of literature i framed my objective a deduction and preliminary characterization of arsenine 
in the crude protein extract of fasciolus lineatus next these are the materials and methods of the present work next this is fasciolus lineatus uh, see chosen for the uh, study uh, commonly known as lima bean coming to the result the quantity of total protein was estimated by the method of lowry in general protein concentration was uh, relatively high in wild seeds uh, when compared to cultivated um, varieties the highest protein concentration was observed in seeds of fasciolus lunatus that is uh, 12.25 mg per ml next a profile of hemagglutination activity of uh, chosen crude seed kernel uh, extract a uh, 10 percentage against various native erythrocytes uh, we tested uh, 12 native erythrocyte types um, among which highest titer value of 5 and 12 against uh, human a erythrocytes and uh, similarly uh, lowest uh, value of uh, observed against buffalo rbcs one key features of acylene protein was uh, its ability to bind with enzyme treated erythrocytes uh, since it possessed weak agglutinating capacity um, with native erythrocytes a crude protein extract of fasciolus lunatus was uh, tested with uh, erythrocyte treated uh, with uh, enzymes such as uh, trypsin uh, chymotrypsin and uh, pronase in which highest uh, hemagglutination activity um, was observed in human a erythrocytes next also an interesting observation was obtained among two rhesus group of uh, human a erythrocytes a negative rh group showed higher hemagglutination activity when compared to por, um, positive rh group uh, but uh, the native erythrocytes failed to show such a discrimination crude protein uh, fraction fractionation uh, was carried out uh, separate uh, protein and carbohydrate uh, fractions the albumin fraction uh, failed to agglutinate native erythrocytes uh, while its agglutinate agglutination titer increased to several folds when treated against uh, trypsinized uh, erythrocytes all the is fractions and crude were analyzed electrophoretically uh, by 8% uh, native and 12% uh, sts page the sts page analysis evidently uh, confirms that arsenine related subunits uh, were significant high in albumin fractions and was almost reduced in globulin fractions uh, based on the result and ha activity uh, and sts page profile albumin fraction c kernel extract was suspected uh, to possess acylene protein uh, hence um, this fractions was further used for experiments to assess uh, the nature of acylene protein next the carbohydrate uh, binding specificity of albumin fractions of fasciolus lunatus was examined using uh, 28 carbohydrate tested uh, none were found to inhibit uh, the hemagglutinating activity again uh, 0.5% trypsinized uh, human a erythrocytes uh, at concentration up to uh, 200 millimolar these results conclude that uh, there was no inhibition by simple sugars and sugar derivatives and oligosaccharides next uh, when two glycoproteins such as bsm and fetuin from fetal bovine serum were uh, tested for its inhibitory effects uh, bsm type Uh, showed a complete inhibition of uh, hemagglutination activity at a concentration of uh, 0.01953 uh, mg per ml uh, similarly fetuin from fetal bovine serum um, showed uh, in inhibition H, uh, at a concentration of 0.25625 next the effect of uh, divalent cations uh, and edta sensitivity overall uh, the ha activity was completely independent of uh, divalent cations and uh, and also insensitive to edta treatment next the hemagglutination activity in the crude seed extract um, and the albumin fractions of a fasciolus lunatus was um, uh, not affected when the ph range was between 4 and uh, 9 
and the activity activity was low at the ph below uh, 4 and above 10 next also the ha activity remained stable between 10 degrees celsius and uh, 60 degrees celsius against uh, native and uh, 0.5 percent uh, trypsinized the human a erythrocyte types uh, the activity was uh, above uh, 60 degrees celsius and uh, completely abolished at uh, 100 degrees celsius next meena kumari kindly conclude yeah uh, so coming to the summary the crude extraction of uh, seeds of fasciolus linearis uh, showed uh, the highest protein concentration of uh, 12.25 uh, the sts page analyze reveals the high accumulations of uh, arsenine polypeptide subunit uh, that is 27 to 42 kda uh, the crude seed extract uh, fasciolus lunatus uh, showed agglutination titer against uh, buffalo and uh, human a erythrocytes um, the ha titer uh, value increased to several fold upon enzymes uh, treatment uh, maximum ha activity of uh, was achieved in uh, human A erythrocytes. Next. The crude seed extract was fraction, fractionated into albumin and globulin fractions. All the fractions were analyzed uh, electrophoretically. The SDS page analysis concludes. Yes. Overall, uh, detection and preliminary characterization present uh, study revealed the presence of insecticidal protein acetylene in the uh, chosen pulse variety. Uh, the pre preliminary studies on anti-metabolic uh, insecticidal protein uh, from the uh, plant source in the recent time serve as an important component of uh, integrated pest management. Thank you. Thank you, Meena Kumari. It was a good presentation and good piece of work. But you have to just look at the time. That is also very important. So with this, uh, we are completing the technical session. So I must congratulate all the students. Uh, they have given their 100% effort in presenting the respective papers. So um, one specialty in this technical session was all the presenters were women. <laughs> um, so they have presented very well. So once again, congratulations. Um, if uh, from my side, um, I request co-chairman to give his concluding remarks. Okay, so at the outset, I wish to express my sincere thanks uh, to the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to co-chair this session. As uh, our uh, chairperson has been mentioned, this is the one of the most interesting uh, session. As in the case of you can see that uh, marathon race, initially it was uh, very slow, but when you come to the last lap, there was a very fast and uh, there will be a very fight, a tough fight is uh, there. So, such a kind of a tough fight, uh, again we are facing. Uh, so, we are, uh, this, this is our part, a uh, little bit confusing to choose the best one. So, with that uh, we try to uh, give the best one based upon the all kind of criteria. So, and also, uh, at the outset, I used to congratulate all the candidate, uh, those who presented in, the, in this uh, session in a very well, so that I congratulate by giving it big hand. Thank you, Ananda. So on behalf of the organizing committee, I thank the chair and the co-chair of the session, Dr. Sampat Kumar and Dr. Jay Kumar for taking over the session, scientific deliberations of the session. Thank you both of you, sirs. This marks the end of the fourth oral presentation for this day. And we'll wait for a few more minutes to start the valedictory section. Kindly occupy these chairs so those who are on the sides, kindly occupy these chairs. Even people on the other side, you can occupy these chairs in the center. Hello.
May all request to stand up as the dignitaries arrive. A very good afternoon to all of you present here. Welcome to the validity session for the two-day international conference on Emerging Trends in Insect Science 2022. May I all request you to stand up for the prayer song by the ERA Choir. Lord, I come before you today. And there's just one thing that I want to say. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For all you've given to me. For all the blessings that I cannot see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart. With a song of praise, with, with an ostrich arm, I'll bless your name. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I all request you to keep standing for the Tamil Thai work. seated. May I now invite Reverend Dr. S. Maria Bakim SJ, Convener and Organizing Secretary, ISTIS 2022, ERI Loyola College, Chennai, to deliver the welcome address. Respected and dear Dr. Sultan Ahmed Ismail, the Chief Chief guest of this valedictory function of a two-day international conference on emerging trends in insect science, our Reverend Dr. D. Selvan Ayagam, the Secretary and Correspondent of Loyola College, and Reverend Dr. A. Thomas, the Principal, 
Reverend Father Rector and Dr. S. Sitanandam, the Director, Sun Acro Biotech, and Dr. S. Janathanan, Head and Professor, Zoology Department at University of Madras, and dear scientists, professors, scholars, and my dear friends and participants, good evening to all of you. On behalf of the management of Loyola College, the staff and research scholars at the Entomology Research Institute and Entomology Academy of India, Department of Zoology, University of Madras, Sun Agro Biotech, I welcome you all. And I welcome especially to this valedictory function, Dr. Sultan Ahmad Ismail, the member State Planning Commission, Tamil Nadu, India. In particular, here is a person who is very much worked for the farmers and he was recently appointed as a one of the committee members to evaluate the Delta places and he has given a report in favor of the environment, the Mother Earth, which is a common home and for the farmers. Let's give a thunder of applause for his mighty works. And Dr. Sultan was a former uh, professor in New College, Chennai, and a HOD and vice principal, and currently he is the member of State Planning Commission. He is also recently appointed as a member of uh, Tamil Nadu New Education Policy, and we hope you bring a lot of changes that promotes a human life and the environment. Hearty welcome, sir. And my warm welcome to our dear guests who are present here, especially Dr. S. Sitanandam, the director, as well as the convener and organizing secretary, and Dr. S. Janathanan, the convener and organizing secretary of this international conference. I welcome you, sir. I welcome all the participants, especially all the invited speakers, scientists, the emeritus scientists, and the participants, those who are coming from different parts of uh, India, as well as those who are present in the online virtual mode. So hearty welcome to one and all. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. We will now honor the guests. May I now invite Dr. S. Janathanan to honor the chief guest, Dr. Sultan Ahmed Ismail with a shawl. May I now invite Dr. Sitanandan, Director SABRC, to honor the chief guest, Dr. Sultan Ahmed Ismail, with a tree sapling. May I now invite Reverend Dr. Maria Bakim SJ, Convener, Organizing Secretary, ISTIS 2022, to do, to the Chief Guest to the Mam, Tree Sapling. May I now request the Chief Guest, Dr. Sultan Ahmed Ismail, to honor Dr. Sultan Adam with the Tree Sapling. May I now invite the Chief Guest, Dr. Sultan Ahmed Ismail, to honor Dr. Janathanan with the tree sapling. May I now invite Dr. Sultan Ahmed Ismail to honor Dr. S. Maria Bakim SJ with the tree sapling. We will now have the handover of MOUs. The first MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, Entomology Research Institute, Loyola College, and SABRC. Now, may I request Dr. Sitanandam to hand over the MOU to Reverend Dr. S. Maria Bhakti MSJ.
may now invite Reverend Dr. S. Maria Bakimeshte to hand over the second MOU, ERI Loyola College to Lakshita to Dr. Sitanandam. Now we will have a feedback from three participants. A very good afternoon to one and all present here, the respected dignitaries, invited members, uh, all the, the other participants. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude for. Uh, <laughs> I'm K. Shruti, sir, from University of Madras. I'm currently pursuing my uh, doctoral studies under the guidance of Dr. S. Janathanan. Uh, I'm here to give my feedback as in to express my gratitude to allowing us uh, and giving us an excellent opportunity to present our work. And this is, to be honest, this is the first time I'm uh, attending a conference that is purely based on insect science. So uh, I'd like to uh, express my deep gratitude for that. Since we are working in ethnology, we know how much this particular conference is important for us in exploring various, uh, various fields of this study. And uh, the other thing is that uh, one thing that was astonishing to me is uh, to see how much Field work is being done. I mean, when we used to think about field work, okay, they'll go to field and they'll just research and they'll be back. We are doing the same thing in the lab, but it's not like that. It, it takes a lot of time, a lot of patience, and a lot of hard work is being done. And I would like to personally congratulate and uh, express my uh, gratitude to all the people who have done the field work as well. And also, the wet work, uh, people also, individuals also, since I am uh, working on uh, in the laboratory as well. So please uh, keep on going. Uh, all the very best to everyone and congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, respected dignitaries on the dais, uh, distinguished delegates, um, Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, one and all. So I am Dr. M. Sampath Kumar, working as a senior scientist in ICR National Bureau of Agriculture and Insect Resources from Bengaluru. Uh, actually, I uh, must congratulate and compliment the organizers. So they have uh, taken the uh, lot of hard work in just bringing this conference. So the three um, um, organizers, like uh, Maria Pakiam, Reverend Father Maria Pakiam, uh, Janardhanan sir, and um, um, Siddhanandam sir, they have put their uh, hard work into it for successful completion of this uh, conference to a great success. So also I, I must um, um, just acknowledge or maybe like uh, the students workforce and the scientist uh, team of ERI. I am just seeing the past two days they were working so hard. So they have given like uh, not 100%, I think that 200%. So everything, uh, the planning, uh, till now, um, the execution was very meticulous. So uh, really, uh, that hard work has been reflected in this uh, seminar. So other um, important thing I would like to say is like the selection of uh, invited talks. So that is excellent. Really, the name indicates it is of international standards, though there are no international uh, uh, delegation, but however, uh, that conference tried to adjust, I mean, um, various speakers, they have come virtually and they have given their, uh, uh, the need of the topic for this uh, conference, I would say, and most importantly, time. So the time has been uh, well maintained in this conference. Uh, so um, uh, that way also this conference is very good. Um, the one thing uh, from NAS setup, as you know that I am from NAS setup, right? So in agricultural based thing. So in NAS setup, uh, um, we have not seen this kind of audio visual background. For example, if I am inviting any um, uh, speaker or something like that, uh, his audio visual images like welcome, uh, that kind of thing I never come across. So this is like a take home message for me. 
so probably like we who have not followed it and uh, it is good so the person who is sitting uh, suddenly welcome comes means the welcome slide will come so now we have to um, just um, invite the special speaker that his photos that i'm just seeing um, apart from that i have two suggestions uh, one is like whenever we are announcing a best presenters both maybe like oral or poster i request because i am um, just seeing in all the oral presentations there is a competition between a scientist and a students so how like uh, students can compete with the scientific staff so that should be like special class so the student should be awarded separately and similarly the scientific staff also should be um, uh, awarded separately yes sir that way that way also <laughs> Then um, the second suggestion would be like uh, that when we are just looking for the time, so it has to be like uh, um, uh, given the importance to the oral presenters. But what I felt from my side is like the time was given more to the invited talks, but ultimately the person who have presented, so they were asked to rush up. And uh, the other thing, we may not have a time for interactions. So that way also, I think the organizer has, has to take care. But otherwise, I thoroughly enjoyed. I wish you, uh, um, the society, and uh, with Janardhan and these three uh, people, combination should uh, continue many more uh, conferences in the future. Thank you. Dear distinguished dignitaries, emeritus scientists, and uh, scientists from various organizations and institutions, and all the research scholars from different institutions, and my dear participants in online and virtual mode, a very good evening to one and all. I am Vedavati from Madras Christian College, research scholar under the guidance of Dr. Joyce Priyakumari. We all know that gratitude is the attitude of noble souls. And ingratitude is the attitude of peace. Having attended two days conference in this campus, I don't want to go back as a thief. But then rather I would like to express my sincere thanks to the directors of ERI, EAI and SABRC, their team, the organizing committee members, collaborators, co-organizers, renowned scientists, presentators, both online and offline mode. I'm sure most of your minds and hearts too are throbbing with joy, happiness, gratitude and applause. We know what it goes into planning and executing an event of this magnitude and it's not that easy. I am extremely appreciative of you, dear father, Maria Pakim, the director of ERI, and your committee for such informative conference that I could attend, bringing together the famous eminent scientists, research scholars, students from various parts of the world in online and offline mode. I admire and treasure very much your excellent management of what has turned out to be a successful and highly stimulating, energizing, invigorating conference. I am sure this has involved enormous amount of time and energy. You might have been working so hard for everything to fall into place as it has. Your meticulous planning, organizing, directing, and executing, and thus bringing it to a fruitful, successful completion. Let's give the directors of ERI, EAI, and SABRC and their committee a loud thunder claps in our appreciation and gratitude. A brilliant conference and academically very profitable and I wish and await there will be many more conferences of this time in the future too. 
I must commend and congratulate Reverend Dear Father Maria Pakiam for conducting an excellent conference. I would like to highlight the tremendous efforts and interest of ERA, EAI and SABRC directors and their committee, the invited guests, presenters of paper and poster, all the participants in online and offline mode. Inspiring and thought-provoking talks, the speakers too did a very great job and I am sure you will all agree with me when I say it was a tremendous learning experience which stimulated the budding scientists and research scholars too. From Indian welcoming to the send-off, from food to the shuttle and stay, every minute details were well taken care and I am sure along with me you too might have felt at home. I enjoyed it thoroughly and it was superb, fantastic, stupendous, fabulous and phenomenal conference indeed. Kudos and thanks to one and all and as always I am more fascinated about insects because they are the most successful organisms on this earth. Let's all be successful in our field. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for the feedback. May I now invite the chief guest, Dr. Sultan Ahmed Ismail, to deliver the chief guest address. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, dignities on the dais and off the dais. Uh, very happy to be back over here and nice to see. Uh, Father Maria Pagdas and uh, Janardhan from Madras University, Mr. Siddharamaya Jayakumar Pugarendi, uh, Rev. Professor, and my own younger brother, Sukumar, seated silently over there, the most mischievous man. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm very happy to be here back over here. I do not know how many of you are aware that I, I did my PhD through Loyola College. In fact, my PhD registration was with the MCC when Professor Fanwell was there. And unfortunately, he passed away in the middle, and I continued my PhD through Loyola under Dr. V. M. Murthy. He was my supervisor. Uh, I once said that I will not step again into this hall, because whenever I used to come, Professor Murthy would sit in the first row, and after my talks, he would come and give me a hug. And after he passed away, I said, I'm not going to come to this college if you invite me again. But unfortunately, because for Entomology Research Institute, I thought it was at ERI. <laughs> so I said yes to him. Yeah, I said yes to him. Uh, that, that was the type of bondage we had, we shared. In fact, uh, you know, like if you had read the book Tuesdays with Maury by uh, Mitch Albam, that they, it was almost a similar relationship that we shared, Professor Murthy and I. Uh, a wonderful gentleman whom uh, I would never forget in my life and uh, always remember. Children, I'm very happy to be here today to declare the valid address. And uh, children, if you have studied zoology, be proud that you have studied zoology. Uh, I, I strongly believe, uh, you know, like uh, when I completed my pre-university in those days and I wanted to join a degree course, they wanted me, I said, uh, zoology, zoology, I said, zoology. <laughs> they wanted that I should study chemistry. Yeah, I said, uh, in, at least you children, you have a voice at home. We had no voice in those days. So I told home that if I study chemistry, I will pass BSc in six years. But if I study zoology, I will pass in three years. So they said, Padichi Tola. So that's how I started studying zoology. But uh, zoology gave me everything. Children, one particular thing, a few things which I would like to share with you with, in, through my own personal life. I basically did my zoology, BSc zoology, then my master's was in fishery biology. I did my YMPhil in Madras University, uh, from where Janadan comes. Dr. Azariah was my supervisor, Jaipal Azariah. And I worked on marine biology. Understood now? Fishery biology, then marine biology. Then I come back to my college. That was 1979. 1978-79, I did my YMPhil. 74, I completed my master's. I started teaching in 1974. So when I came back to my department, uh, one of my students came and said, sir, I did not get a seat in MPhil. Can you please uh, guide me 
and I do some research work in the department. Luckily for me, there was Professor Moidin who was head of the department of my college. So I went and asked him. He was also the head of the department as also the principal. I said, sir, can I start research? These are all inputs I'm giving to all your teachers and also to you people who would become teachers in future. I went and asked him, sir, your student who, whom you guided for masters, he has come, he wants to do some research, can I help him? And you know what he said? That was my dream, Ismail, that somebody should start research. Please start. Unfortunately, today we get heads of departments, HODs, whom I refer not as heads of departments, but headache of departments. So he gave me the permission to work. So when I came out, there was a paper lying on the floor. You won't believe, children, there was a paper, a circular lying on the floor. I just picked it up. It was Ethological Society of India, behavior science, animal behavior, ethology. And it asked for papers to be presented in 1980, January. So I came back to the room. I told this boy, professor is permitted. But would you like to do something on animal behavior? He said, sir, anything is OK for me. I want to do research. Just then, my lab assistant was crossing my room. And I wanted live specimens. It was the holiday season. So I called him in. I said, uh, Anna, how do you call your uh, lab assistants? And he was my lab assistant when I was a student. So when I became a teacher, that continues, right? So I called him, Anna, uh, what uh, live specimen do you have in the department? He said, sir, Manpur earthworm That is how my research in earthworm started. Today, the whole world knows my work. So children, when something comes to you, you right? I was the one who coined the term Vermitech for the world. Now, what I mean to tell you children is, when something comes to you, don't say that this is not my subject. It's, that's always something which operates in nature. Right? And that's how we come close to people. That's how Sukuma came close to me. And uh, we started working on several things. That's how we started interacting. That's how I traveled the whole world. Now, this earthworm and garbage has taken me across the world from the western end to the eastern end of the world. And uh, don't think that your marks will get you anything. In the Vaidhya Rangal Solana, number your number. Number your number. Mark help children. Right? Minimum mark is required. Right? I am a second class graduate and a second class postgraduate. And I was the one who designed your entire curriculum committee, one of the ten members who designed your entire syllabus for the state from class one to class twelve. You don't require good marks for it. If your work will take you. So children, if anybody feels if anybody feels that in the branch like weak character, in the branch like weak character, and the weak and the warthiya, please ignore it. Let these seminars where you interact with people give you a lesson that how best can I develop my scope? How best can I evolve myself? Today I'm a member of the planning commission because they wanted it, right? And suddenly day before, that was really the the biggest thing which I dreamt always was to change the stupid system of education in my state, in my country. And I was sitting in the meeting of the planning commission, and there was going on messages coming in my phone. Naturally, you get tempted, right? It's lying over there in front of you. Right? <laughs> and I opened it. There were only congratulations, Vartikal, congratulations, Vartikal. I said, congratulations for what? One friend also said, congratulations. I said, for what? He said, you have been appointed as member of the state education policy. So we are going to write a new policy for the state because we are, don't believe in the national education policy. We, we don't believe on all the aspects of the national education policy. We in Tamil Nadu would like to have a separate education policy for ourselves. And hopefully, they have given us one year. I'm yet to receive the GO. It has come in the papers, and uh, today's newspapers carry it. Yeah. And uh, that's something wonderful which uh, we would like to. Like, because what happens is in institutes like ICAR and other things, ICR and other things, we get so narrowly, you, you are Train to follow your supervisor. One, one difference I have seen in doing research in a university and doing uh, and in colleges is in colleges, I think we get more broad-mindedness because university professors have to build up their papers and publications to grow and grow and grow. In colleges, we don't care. And uh, if you go through my own review, you will find that at least 70% of my papers, of, of, I have published about 80, 85 papers. But almost 70% of the papers, 75%, my student will be the first author of the paper. So, you know, like, we, we must encourage, we must motivate. 
and i honestly sincerely request entomology research institute to stop giving awards to scientists and give all the awards to the students because we want the next generation to come up four of thank you all of you we have got enough awards what we require is only rewards now we don't require awards what i expect is rewards and that's what god is bestowing on me as rewards children sometimes please be very very broad minded one one interesting feature when he sent me the program sheet is a lot of work on non chemical intervention there were lots of papers on it please raja pannunga pannunga because uh, if you had gone through the government of tamil nadu's uh, agriculture budget almost 50 55% of the budget was uh, drafted by me as a agriculture policy so we are focusing towards non chemical agriculture and our focus is vision 2040 for tamil nadu so uh, sri lanka made a mistake of overnight change and they could not they had to withdraw so we have a vision of 2040 by 2040 we would like to change towards non chemical agriculture so you children who have already attended this magnificent lectures and you children who already have in you that i would like to do something contribute something look at your stops I, mean, i don't know because many of us like to go to the birds and watch birds binoculars so basically yes right but there are so many thousands of organisms beneath your feet and we forget about them and uh, children that's where i started working with soils and i started writing about soils i i i call soil is a living organism i defined it also as soil is a living organism other i i don't want to define the whole thing tamil book there manmakkal masul eduthu padini but one thing is uh, one important thing i asked was whether uh, soil has a brain because you know like my teacher in school sir enak kanak chemistry and maths did not enter my head at all you are from phytochemistry i'm sorry right ama in the chemistry because chemistry teacher in my college he would come and start his classes last class we saw and then after the bell rings he will say next class we continue this too i understood in between what is it never entered my head <laughs> unfortunately right so i, I uh, and uh, my maths teacher in my school always used to tell me wo mandala kalimann irukundu it is this chikkimitti in my head so i was a bit worried about it as to what is there and i wanted to know whether soil has a brain mularuga onukilla mannuku right and uh, you know like my research what it told me was if you dig a pit and you put any biomass into it you dig a pit and put any biomass into it what will happen decomposes but dig a pit and put a seed into it it germinates soil knows what it has to decompose and what it has to germinate so this beautiful soil requires non chemical intervention that's what you children are going to do and for you if you want to take any plant on which you would like to work for pest repellent properties with due apologies to all the industries i work with farmers so i don't work with industries unfortunately right uh, the best professor i would recommend don't trust these professors i would recommend one excellent professor every village has this professor have you met him professor goat professor goat take professor goat for a walk whatever plant a goat eats leave it whatever plant goat does not eat has pest repellent properties that's all you don't need anybody's advice for it you don't need anybody's advice for it. that that that's the reason why we call this plant as aada thoda tamil la thama and peru vachanga aadu thoda that's how you get the name aada thoda so take a goat for a walk identify five varieties of plants and you have a patent ready with you okay va ana ore or vendukal after you take a patent give it to the farmers i patented my vermitech but i gave it to the farmers right so what we do is knowledge bestowed by a superior power you call by any name you want but that knowledge under shared is useless and you children when you are going to do your research like uh, she said she is doing her phd with uh, janardhan i do not know what your topics are but uh, my students one chapter should be on social relevance if you have no contribution to social relevance in your research work your life is a waste now for example for example i'm asking you you are paying fees for your uh, research and some of you may be lucky to get a grant some of you may not be lucky to get a grant you may be paying it from your pocket 
you are going to work for three years minimum and uh, nowadays supervisors love to take four to five years examiners add on to it right so let us take it as five years as an average from the date of registration to the date of getting your phd as a as a postgraduate if you go and work somewhere how much salary do you expect in per month minimum 20000 vechikalama per year 2 and 1/2 lakhs vechu maximum 2 and 1/2 lakhs five years ago evlo paache 12.5 lakhs you are investing 12.5 lakhs in your thesis remember that so your thesis should be something which you should be proud of and not just a degree book which goes into the library and lies over there in the shelf is that clear to you children you are youth five years your work of five years your contribution of five years you should be proud of to tell this is my thesis and this is my first paper i'm still proud of it that is what is important raja so whatever you plan to do in your research concentrate on it and research is an addiction that's why good or bad we continue to survive with it so please see to it that you do it make it very well do wonderfully well and here some people said about the time presentation this is happens because of uh, i would say irresponsible speakers not because of the organizers now i am here i am one of the my rank is equal to the secretary's rank of the government and i am today also going to design your education policy even if i talk for 30 minutes father maria pandit may not get up and come and tell me to stop is that clear he <laughs> won't do it he won't do it naliki lai lakal vandu galada galada pantar nandal so it's my responsibility that's why i asked him how long can i talk he said 15 minutes with him pesla sir right that's that's where i'm supposed to stop so unless we as speakers don't understand our own responsibilities students will suffer so next time what you do it sir is my 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 humble request to you is one session means morning forenoon finish off with all these invited speakers afternoon follow the time properly and give it to the children because i enjoy to listen to children because they come out with fascinating ideas they make lots of mistakes that is where we also learn what are the new things which can be derived from it so children sometimes these mistakes happen so you don't worry about it next time when you come but don't say that icr doesn't make the same mistake you also do the same <laughs> but but we can we will rectify it and uh, good luck to you all and uh, good luck to you for uh, making a presentation because i'm glad that you could go on stage because talking in a presentation is different but going on stage and talking is different for youngsters and sister thanks for talking about mcc and reminding me of those MC, beautiful mcc days you your professor was very biased with us yeah you know like we would, he would give us a break from sanjeev raj very strict gentleman very strict gentleman he would give us a, we used to have a beautiful system of intercollegiate classes in those days you know like only four colleges offered uh, zoology loyola had no zoology msc then they had bsc and phd but no msc we had uh, msc one in pacha pass presidency new and uh, mcc only four for uh, cell biology all students of all these four colleges 60 students will meet at mcc for genetics they would come to new for uh, embryology they will go to pacha pass and for evolution they used to go to presidency so that used to be a beautiful system when we knew about others and uh, we were lucky because the new college is the boys college so we could get a opportunity to, to see some beautiful girls so we used to always look forward for those intercollege classes also illa pa tappu irukke ningala pannala naanga panna koodadha ama so you know like we used to have that fun anyway and uh, that used to be a great time and uh, they would give a tea break and we would go to that canteen in mcc and that fellow will not serve us tea but serve tea only for you people by the time we finish our tea and go sanjeev raj will shout at us so we had to stop taking tea because of your uh, professor right so beautiful days i'm just trying to be on the lighter side but it used to be a wonderful time for us i don't know why he invited me because as a planning commission member no i i'm not interested to come here as a planning commission member i'm basically a zoologist i have been a teacher this is my 47th year of teaching and i'm proud of it and i'm proud of it i'm basically a zoologist and then i found that i have worked only on earthworms and why this entomology insect why did this insect call me 
And then I was trying to, because Professor Sanjeev Raj once posed me the question, what is the relationship between you and entomology? Because he was an entomologist. There's only one fly called as the cluster fly, Polenia rudis, which actually lays its eggs in the soil. And the maggots, they go and become parasites on earthworms and they eat the earthworms. That's the only relationship between you and I. But if you were to say that insects are the most beautiful, then you've got to change your view, because according to Darwin, man is nothing but a worm. Good luck to you all, children, and all the best to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That is one of the best talks I've heard. Now we'll have the uh, declaration of awards by Dr. M. Jayakumar, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, Madras University. Respected uh, Chairperson, present uh, in the dais and of the dais, um, distinguished uh, scientists, research scholars, my dear friends. So I'm happy to announce the best uh, presentation awards. So there were about uh, four different uh, sessions yesterday too, and uh, today, the day two also, there was uh, two session. And each session, we are going to give one of the best uh, presentation award based upon the criteria given by the organizers. So that is the one. The second one is actually yesterday, simultaneously uh, at uh, Entomology Research Institute, they had the virtual uh, presentation. That also there was about uh, two different type of uh, uh, presentation award has been uh, declared. And in the third category, the poster presentation. Yesterday evening, we had uh, the interaction between the post and the contribution given by the uh, research scholars and the students. So based upon the given pro forma, all the chairperson and co-chairperson has been uh, carefully taken out the measurement and uh, they have given the list. So I'm calling uh, one by one. The day one, the first session, Mr. Harshad Parkar, Tomeya, PhD scholar, Tomeya College of Science, Thomas, uh, from Mumbai. In the afternoon, there was a second session, and that second session, Dr. M. Raghuraman, Professor Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. Okay. And uh, simultaneously, there was a uh, oral presentation also had at Entomology Research Institute. The first presentation goes to uh, Ms. R. Subhasini, PhD scholar, Christ University, Bangalore. Actually, we will send the certificate uh, through post. So, actually, the live relay is going on there so that uh, the candidate may be have the list. And uh, the second uh, session, uh, Ms. V. Kavya, PhD scholar, Nirmala College of uh, uh, Nirmala College for Women, Kwaimutur. She will also get the prize and we will send the certificate and the memento to the scholar. And uh, in the evening, there were uh, the poster presentation. There were about three percent, three award. The third place, third place. So the third place goes to M. Nisa, MSc, second year student, Apollo Arts and Science College. Yeah, BSc, second year. Second place, Rajalu, PhD scholar. Government Arts College for Men, Nandanam, Chennai. If anybody is there, you can call him. First place goes to Vedavadi, PhD scholar, MCC, Chennai.
So the day two, there was about uh, two different sessions. The first session, uh, Dr. M. Sambath Kumar, senior scientist, ICR, Bangalore. The second session, actually it is a very toughest one for the, uh, the chairperson and the co-chairperson to decide, uh, to elect the best person. So based upon the mark and everything, all the criteria and uh, the chairperson and co-chairperson co has been elected uh, Ms. B. Mariswari from University of Madras. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for declaring the awards. Now we have the word of thanks by Dr. S. Sitanandam, Director, SABRC, Chennai. Uh, just of honor, uh, Dr. Sultan Ahmed Ismail, the management of Lila College represented by the rector, principal, and the senior management, Dr. Uh, Maria Pakyam, Dr. Janardhanan, and other distinguished participants. I would like to just take only one minute before doing the formal vote of thanks just to explain in a minute a casual comment made by the distinguished speaker about i am fine with academics but with biotech companies or something like that you mentioned in passing i wanted to assure you sir that Sitanantam, who is the head of those institutions, has been working with farmers for 35 years. Honestly, sincerely, 20 years in Africa with farmers. So this is only a lost phase of the life transition into entrepreneurship. So I just wanted to explain that, Seth, otherwise, farming when we started working, Namar Bhav and then start. Uh, our idea is to withdraw the farmer from the technical opportunity. Yeah. So all our approach was to teach them rather than to ask them to That was our idea. And the uh, Sun Agro Biotech, yeah. from its origin in 2000 till today, 100% only non-chemical pest control, not even 1% about synthetic. So we also follow your track and we respect you, sir, for your leadership. So now I pass on to the conventional duty. What of thanks. Before I really start, I should thank in passing Sister Vedavalli. She had almost finished most of the what of thanks. So if any, I am only repeating much of it. So thanks for that. First, our gratitude is to go to Lila College Management, Reverend Father Francis Xavier, Rector, Vice Principal, Reverend Dr. D. Selvan Ayagam, Secretary and Correspondent, Reverend Dr. Thomas, Principal, as the major facilitators and people who made things happen from A to Z. Second, Entomology Research Institute, 
can I use the word magician? Is it appropriate? At least on the positive side. Here is Dr. Maria Parkia, who simply smiles, sits, and things start happening. And I was really, really uh, greatly impressed the type of influence a person can make in a very, very positive way to make the whole team vibrant and run around in all fashion. So with your leadership, along with the emeritus scientist, Seshadri, Dr. Sukumar, Dr. Balakrishna, and it is not last but not least, the most important among the ERA team are the scientists and research scholars, ERA admin staff, Ludu, Kotum, Selvan, and Victor. Can we give a big hand to them? They really, really deserve it. But for which it would have been virtually impossible to have such a very smooth running function. Department of Viscom, led by Reverend Dr. Irde Raj, Head Visual Communication Department, Reverend Father Justin Prabhu, Director, Office of Media Relations, who also extended very valuable and vital support to back up all the documentation and audiovisuals, which made this more like a unique sort of uh, effort, which I haven't seen in many places earlier at all. So salutations to them. Professor Noster Jaykumar, Assistant Professor, Department of Computer Science, and Mr. Adekalasamy, Senior Technical Instructor, and his team, again, need very, very special mention for all they could do. Now, only for a minute to talk about money. Money support came from several donors. And uh, the main uh, support came from uh, governmental and non-governmental sources both, not to mention about individual amounts. It is uh, Nash uh, State Council for Science and Technology, NCST, plus the Entomology Academy of India, Sanagro Biotech Research Center, Nali Sills, GRT, plus co-hosts through advertisement. I wouldn't need to list them. It is all there in the book. And from Department of Zoology, again, we have a very, very valuable and important team led by Dr. Janardhanan, followed closely by two senior faculty members, Dr. Jay Kumar and Dr. Pugalendi. They, I wouldn't say the team, they with the army of the students, virtual army. You really made things different for us. So we are extremely grateful for your efforts to make this a full-fledged program. So last but not the least, as someone alluded to, we may need more conferences of this and more with these three guys coming around, doing it again. I only wish, I only want to thank God for making all of us meet here for this genuinely academic and scientific exercise. And let's wish and hope we move, we make repeats in future, God willing. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Siddhanandam. He's another mighty person. He looks mighty. He speaks very mighty. Elderly man, but I never experienced young at heart. And we must appreciate, and on behalf of Loyola College management, 
I thank him and appreciate because in front, in front of him I am like a, his own grandson. But the way he comes and consulted each and everything, he obtains a permission from me. <laughs> he obtains a permission from me and consults me and uh, everything was well discussed and planned. And even for financial support, always Dr. S. Janathanan and Dr. S. Siddhanandam, they say, Father, we are with you. You conduct, go ahead. And we'll support you. That is a source of strength I received. So thank you so much for your collaboration. For Jesuit, collaboration is the heart of the mission. Collaboration is the heart of the mission. Everywhere we collaborate, from root to shoot, everything being connected. From sunlight, from earthworm, all the pan and flora being interrelated. In life, through life, we get only a relationship. All lives are living on earth because of interrelatedness. And I enjoy the relationship with the company, with the university, with the institute and the department. So thank you so much for your collaborative work and most welcome to join us anytime for collaborative research. Thank you. May I request you all to stand for the national anthem. Thank you all for your presence. On your way out, our